The Snake Without Eyes. William Ospina. Colombian writer, novelist, and critic born in Hervio, a municipality in the department of Tolima. The Snake Without Eyes. Our sleeping heads, thousands of years ago. Mouths open, by the rock. Gerardo Rivera. They were born to feed the birds of another world. No one traveled this far to find their own grave. Searching for the gold of the alchemists, they found the kingdoms of the sun on their way. From emerald caves they saw ritual beetles fly, iguanas stopped in the trees and beat tails like whips before them, green swamps of slime suddenly opened rows of fangs. They had to find new words to name the sea, the river, and the desert, because another sea whale showed them his whales, another dirty snake of disasters took them under endless days of rain, and other sandbanks dried them until finally they were not more than skeletons with eyes, praying in Latin to stony skies. Searching for their fabled fears, they only knew how to find in the jungle the beasts that they carried in their entrails. They recognized their own inclemency in the jaguars, their hunger in the sweet breath of the guyos, their envy in the startled rivalry of the birds. And the Babylonian towers of termites were like inventions of his fever, the armies of muleteers wearing green flags that devour a tree in hours, the bestial goddesses that suckle their young among the roots of the mangrove. They did not know that the most powerful weapons that their god had given them were not the obedient horses nor the strong and bloodthirsty dogs nor the cannons that spit thunder, but their own sneezes spreading the flu and their sick hugs that made people wake up with sores. The Naked Bodies Long before their arrival in the villages, the pneumonia they brought had devastated entire provinces, and black pox turned the bodies of the Indians into living rot. That is why his arrival was seen with terror before his intentions were known, before the evil of souls confirmed the pestilence of bodies. They came looking for life from hungry villages, humiliated by war and plague, but they deposited the eggs of hell in the pagan flowers of paradise. They thought they were looking for the future, but they brought souls full of witches and goblins, they searched these seas for their fat old sirens, beneath the ash-colored yarumos, rugged hills of satires, they looked for grim goblins and deadly amazons, and in everything they saw the slimy old devil who had made their life sick in their stone villages, who coiled his tail around the bell towers, who scratched the walls at night with mud nails, who rode at midnight in the wombs of virgins and infesting the incense-saturated churches with disgusting farts. They thought badly and saw badly and smelled worse, they lost a world for the world and gained a world for their king and their god, but among them very few had been made to work. Behind the arrogant and disgraceful chiefs, who lined themselves with gold, came a reckless and brutal troop who lost body and soul in these seas. On the crest of the wave were the viceroys and the governors, the officials, and the encomenderos, but below it stirred a wave of discontent and resentful who would never be owners of the great treasures, tougher and bolder men even than their bosses, authorized to do anything by the blindness of the clerics, by the arbitrariness of the officers and by the negligence of the crown. Those who macerated the meat of the natives like mud to feed dogs and dreams, those who equally received the arrows of the Indians and the contempt of the rich, the kiss of the jaws of the alligator and the caress of the cold of the dungeons, the harsh music of incessant commands and the trail of worms on ulcerated skin. Without ever understanding these kingdoms, they came to engender in their clay a perplexed humanity that cannot believe in God but needs it, that cannot believe in the law but cannot live without invoking it, that cannot love the world in which it was born because the inheritance came profaned and slandered, because the treasure was saturated with curses. I invoke you, blood that the jungle drank, so that some time in time we can tame these demons, the arrogant tongue of the victors, the law proclaimed to mask the rapine, the strange religion that feels hatred and fear for the earth, and that power studded with symbols, the mirror that does not reflect us. Who will tell us if we will one day manage to make this proud language of proconsuls, these platforms of ironic scales, this impalpable god from another world and this secret spring of force look a little like us? One behind closed jungles. Behind the closed jungles was a kingdom of water. The captain's dog sniffed him first, he barked with delight through the lichen-covered trees, followed his master to the last ridge, and then ran around him down the slope, his solid gold collar glinting in the sun. 
It was a strong Alano with golden fur, the muzzle was black, it had dark spots around the eyes. The blonde Blasta Atenza and Sebastián Moyano and Pizarro the swineherd were visible behind because they still wore their plumed Morian caps, while the other soldiers in rags and hundreds of naked Indians moved more slowly, carrying the mules with bundles and the long banners of the Emperor and of Santa Maria la Antigua already hoisted on their flagpoles. They had fought a battle two days ago for the lands of Cayapes, sleep had not closed their eyes since then, and they came overwhelmed by the heat and humidity in their steel breastplates. Looking down over the shimmering plain, three groups set out to find a way to the water, and now they were coming. It was true what the Indian had told them, behind the closed jungles another sea was hidden. Balboa told himself in the mountains that an ant can hide, that a poisonous frog can crouch in large leaves, that a stream can hide running between the stained stones, but it was unheard of that an entire ocean had always remained hidden, water of the deluge impounded in a pitcher nourished by lightning and storms. An Indian with the face of a black moon told him that the sea had sprung from a giant gourd, another, which had fallen in streams from the leaves of the sky, and the wounded warriors of Cayapi saw the eyes of dark crabs in the stars. It was like a miracle over the black forests to see the swirl of gannets in the luminous sky. Bloss would always remember those hours, when the sea was not visible but its smell was already felt in the wind. And the striding descent, and the amazing beach run, because he was the second to enter the foamy water. He saw Balboa singing the Te Deum Laudamus, shouting his proclamation and his prayers, nailing the flag again and again to the bed of sand and foam, and looking, still unable to believe it, at the grey sea, the boundless sea, the wild sea that stretched before them and that no man of their land had ever seen. Then he saw the soldiers who showed the sea as a prayer and conjured the banner with the two angels, the virgin and the child, the rose and the goldfinch. He saw how they quartered the foam with their right hands, raised pyramids of stones on the beach and hit the trunks of the trees with Latin phrases. He was a blonde and greedy boy, with large grey eyes and rapacious hands, born 23 years before in Villa de Atenza, and he had arrived in the Indies in one of Ojeda's four caravels. In his navigation from the port of Cadiz he never ceased to be surprised for a single day, because he had spent his childhood in dusty villages and the excess of water filled his lungs with a happy fear. Living the solitude of the unknown was already an exhausting experience, but there were also the winds, gloomy wails that grew worse at night, the sleepwalking cry of some sailor in the hollow of the holds, the slow horizon that ascends and descends relentlessly. And the seasickness of the first days, the smell of vomit on the rail, the moods of the soldiers sleeping in a heap in the belly of the ship, a vague fear that is almost certain that we will never return. Bodies also get used to the unexpected, and Blas de Atenza never asked himself whether he liked adventure or not, because after the vertigo and the storm, of will-o'-the-wisps raining on the creaking masts, of the phosphorescence of the spears in the night of great stars, of the red arch of the fish that splinter the water and of the nightmare hair of the sargassum that makes one think that the ship is sailing over vegetable plains, the arrival at the port had been like entering a tavern full of scuffles and shouts, and the news of an unknown sea filled all the space of his mind. With the news of the barely discovered sea, the crown was encouraged to finally charter an expedition of conquest, bishops preached in Spain that a world full of riches was waiting in the Indies and that the royal treasury would pay the expenses of the trip, and hidalgos and peasants came from all over the peninsula, as well as artisans of various trades. After hastily selling off land and estates, inheritances, rents, 2,200 men embarked on 50 ships loaded also with surly horses and placid cows, with offensive dogs to the ear and pigs bred for the knife, with raucous geese and sleepwalking hens. Many young men of warrior lineage came, such as the noisy Miguel Diaz de Auxiliary, the memer Ias Bernal Diaz del Castillo, the last one left alive of those who saw Emperor Moctezuma, and the court page Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo, who saw everything and he named everything, adventurers who would grow old later in the New World and they all sailed under the command of a huge man, Pedro Arias de Avila, a head taller than the tallest of his men, who knew that it would be very difficult to find a coffin of his size on the roads and always travelled with his own coffin. 
luxury, in which he slept every night to get used to death. This Pedrarius was well aware of his mission in the Indies, charging Balboa with interest for all the good and bad things that were said about him at court, those rumors that week after week altered the mood of the Catholic King Ferdinand of Aragon. Not twenty years had passed since Columbus's adventure, and the ships that defied the vertigo had barely touched the shores of Tierra Firme, but scandalous stories were already being told of wars between the Spaniards themselves, looting on the islands, stories of abandoned men in impious gulfs, of jungle vines that had become Christian gallows, and of Nacius's destitute ship abandoned by his own subordinates to the inclemency of the water. But it was one thing to bring stories to Spain and another thing to experience the confusing episodes of the conquest. Sometimes the subordinates, like Balboa, turned out to be more responsible than the bosses, unnamed peons revealed themselves to be more skillful and brave than the princes, mere stowaways became the true discoverers, they showed themselves to be just and irreproachable captains where the bosses were only capable of greed and hate. And Pedrarius earned a reputation for being cruel and infamous, because in a single afternoon he had the heads of Balboa and three of his men cut off. When, seeing that night was coming, the crowd asked him to pardon the fifth condemned man, he himself took the axe and made nightfall on Fernando Arguello. A legend says that five flaming heads illuminate him in hell. Spain was a horseman governing an unknown creature without knowing if it was a colt or a bird, a golden fish emerging from the sea or an octopus with countless tentacles. It would have been necessary to have angels on the ships to know from a distance everything that the adventurers were doing, that of the crown was not divine justice and it was easy for the authorities, listening to rumors, to reward betrayal and punish loyalty. Others would doubt it later, but Bloss never forgot that he had been the second to enter the South Sea. He told it to his daughter, and it was she who told it to me, in the happy days of the jungle, before the bloody morning. He told me that, after Balboa was arrested by the perfidy of his friend Pizarro and condemned by the greed of his friend Espinosa and decapitated by the axe of his father-in-law Pedrarias, after those mediocre and brutal men united to get out of the way after Balboa, Blas de Atenza remained convinced that his destiny awaited him in this new sea, and he lived for a long time on the isthmus, preparing his time. Balboa had defeated with arms or convinced with arguments the Indians of twenty kingdoms. He had argued and negotiated with small and great kings of the jungle, Kerda, Panca, Chape, Bonaniema, Kukwara, Tekra, Pocorosa, Comagra, Chuirica, Otok, Pakra, Puchirabuka, Tubanama, Tamau, Tenoka, and Tamaka and Juanaga and Karaka and Korida, among the most mentioned, Kachi Kays with gold headbands and wicker headbands, chiefs who had emerged from the sea or who had been born from marbled eggs inside dark nests, princes and magicians whose lives were told in vibrant colored fabrics. Chibcha language powers that they ruled over legions of potters and hunters, in jungles of nameless beetles and colored dragonflies, in lands bewildered by enormous lizards. Those knowledgeable Indians who had reached firm agreements with Balboa did not later endure the brutalities of Pedrarias, the eminent executioner, they fought their recently landed army as they had never fought the scarce troops of Santa Maria La Antigua del Darien, and they persisted in the effort to kill that enormous dead man with darts or with prayers. Blas never knew if it was true that Balboa's dog died of hunger in Acla on his master's grave, with the gold necklace still around his neck because none of those traitors had dared to take it off. The tawny dog had been made wild and made to devour many Indians, but he was so brave and efficient that Balboa paid him a monthly salary like any other lieutenant of his troops, and one day he insolently put on him that gold necklace that without doubt only lost after death. Because just as this conquest changed the fate and condition of many soldiers, he saw dogs better treated than the Indians and more illustrious than other dogs, than other men. The salty voice say with your black moon face that the sea sprouted from a giant pumpkin. Say with your lips of jaguar, of night seeds, that this grey sea was trapped in the leaves, that this sea fell in streams from the large leaves of the sky. Say with wounded lips that those lights above are the eyes of the black crabs. Like the grey mother who is never silent, she says again that only what is said is worth forever, what can be heard again and again and again, tirelessly, like that salty voice of the returning wave. 
too. They abandoned the city on the beach of dead logs from the Darien and populated Panama. They abandoned the city on the beach of dead wood in the Darien and populated Panama, on coastlines as radiant as those of the Gulf of San Miguel, but muddier and calmer. Blas dedicated several years there to business and small navigations, and to console himself for the hardships of the present by remembering the triumphs of the future. Because a man would not endure the inclemency of the Indies if it were not for the future he imagines, for the stubborn certainty that somewhere a treasure is waiting for him that will be his alone, that has been destined for him by the gods of fortune. Since the beginning of the world. Sometimes he thought of his peaceful village, of his Roman ancestors who invented codes and aqueducts, oratory, and bureaucracy. He saw himself repeating in a different world the deeds of those tribunes and lictors, but time passed and the adventure seemed to have stalled in the closed jungles and on the shore of the sea that the first day seemed bright with promise. Finally Bloss became, not a friend, because he was a solitary man, but an ally of Pizarro and Almagro. He lived through the noisy preparations for the trip to the country of the Incas, the growing news of that kingdom in the south that Balboa had already foreseen, the alliances of the chiefs, the trips to explore unknown coastlines, the loans of ducats and ships, the first attempts and the first monstrous islands, but he was also fortunate to be on the deck off the coast of Peru on the big day when they sighted the Tums fortress in the mist, sure evidence of the foreshadowed kingdom of the mountains. Blas was already thirty years old and was from the lineage of the discoverers. He was looking for gold, yes, but he was able to see the firmness of the constructions, the plumes of feathers, the rich fabrics, the low flight of the condors, the smoothness of the stones in the temples of the Inca, the large and oblique eyes of the girls of the royal family. And apparently he was better made for love than for war, because the day they entered the king's refuge in the mountains with Hernando de Soto, while the other soldiers scanned the long lines of archers and Inca spearmen with suspicious eyes, he stood looking from his horse at the circle of women that enveloped like a flower the strange king whom it was forbidden to look at. And among all of them they say he saw only one. I don't know how they met, but I am glad to know that in the midst of so many scenes of blood and horror that abounded in those days, there was also, more hidden from the eyes of the world, a picture that was not of rape or infamy, but the secret conquest of that girl by the soldier who loved her just by seeing her, and who understood in the embrace that his long delay on the isthmus had not been a wait for lands and crimes but for the love that the stars had kept for him. People from the Viceroyalty affirmed that Ines's mother had been a Chimu princess, from the solemn clay citadel of Shanchen, who looks with thirsty eyes at the sea, and that Bloss had found her when he travelled along the parched coasts, during the days when that Atahualpa was a prisoner and long lines of his subjects, each ant with a gold stone, climbed the mountains of Cajamarca to carry the ransom. But Ines herself assured me that her mother was actually one of the Inca sisters, a refugee in the citadel after the massacre. The truth is that months later, the same night that Atahualpa was killed, when they strangled him by tightening a steel band tied to a trunk around his neck, the daughter of Blas de Atenza's love affair with the imperial sister was born nearby. And unlike Pizarro, who only thought about power and politics, and like Almagro, who knew how to take the son of his loves by his side, Blas loved that girl, in whom the waters of two rivers met so different, as he would have loved a daughter born there in his old dusty villa in Spain. Ines was powerful since she was little, and she saw herself reflected in the eyes of that man who had discovered a sea to beget her. That is why they said in Shanchen that the night Atahualpa died, a new race was born, and on those mountains stained with blood and hatred, where the cities were profaned and the kipus were undone and the stories were erased, love also lit fires again, even more valuable because the sun had died. Pizarro's wars against the Inca generals brought much wealth to the early captains. Men who came from hunger and bad weather, from rocky villages and miserable cradles, suddenly found themselves masters of entire provinces, abundant in wealth and serfs. The Marquis Pizarro benefited Blas, like my father, with mines and encomiendas, but he was mistrustful and spiteful, and he never forgot that Blas de Atenza was one of the eleven Spaniards who opposed the execution of Atahualpa. Blas accompanied him in the distribution of parcels in San Miguel de Pira. 
there, in the shadow of the cross and watered with blood, the provinces of Catechaos and Cairo with their thousands of Indians corresponded to Gonzalo Farfan de los Godos, that of Pochos to Andres Duran and Juan de Coto, Jayanxa, with its stone tombs, to Francisco Lobo, that of Tangarera, crossed by flames, to Francisco Lucina, that of the Copais Valley, with its calm green waters, to Francisco Quiraz and Quintanilla, those of Motup and Huancabamba, with colorful towns and vertiginous terraces. Of corn, to Diego Palomino, the rocks of Mescala to Diego de Fonseca, the abysses from Pavar to Juan Trujillo, the dark forests of Ayabaca to Bartolome Aguilar, the ends of Punta Aguja to Miguel Ruiz, the lame one, the Sierra de Amotape with its overlapping rainbows to Juan Barrientos, the land surrounding the fortress of Cocala to Pedro Gutierrez de los Rios, and the black groves of Colanec to Baltasar Carvajal. Blas was among them named the first mayor of Pyra, but he continued along the coast and was the founder of Trujillo, near Juan Chaco, by the sea that he himself had discovered. With Martín de Estet, also arrived with Pedrarias and the first conqueror who brought his wife on the trip, with Gómez de Alvarado, who still had the flower boats of Tenochtitlan and dark staggered temples of human blood fixed on his eyes, with Vicente de Bajar and Juan de Osimo, high in Comandero of the Tucum Valley, who would later bequeath lands and legions of Indians to his son Melcher, with Francisco Luis de Alcantara, mother's brother of Francisco Pizarro, with Anton de Perro Mato, Miguel de la Cima and Miguel Pérez de Villafranca, with Andres Vero and Diego Verdejo and Anton Cuadrado and Melcher Verdugo, he tried to give the newly founded city the style or at least the flavor of his Castilian villa, solid walls, large temples, exquisite balconies, railings with flowers, and he was concerned about the repetitions of his destiny, because luck would have it that he touched a region similar to that of his hometown, where the scarcest thing was water. Water had to be found in the mountains and brought down to the coast. To this end, he once again recalled the engineering of his Roman ancestors and the delight felt by the moors of their land tracing canals in the patios of the palaces, and built the first aqueduct of Trujillo, which made water lotuses bloom in the vicinity of the desert. But he also learned from the Chimu, who hundreds of years ago dug large rectangular ponds under the protection of their mud walls adorned with fish, ponds where deep waters flow and where the viringos, the dark sacred dogs, quench their fever at noon. This is how Blas de Atenza made the water of Trujillo flow, and while he woke up the gods of the water he saw his mestizo daughter grow up, more beautiful every day, with large oblique eyes of an Indian, with black hair full of stars, with white princess teeth. From the mountains, with the pearl-gray pupils of a Castilian woman, with the red lips of a gypsy, with a cinnamon-colored skin that no one would have rejected as Andalusian, but with the high-arched cheekbones of the Daughters of the Sun. What happened to Atahualpa's sister has always been an enigma for me. Everyone said that the mother of Ines, the princess, died with her empire, but no one could tell me, in the dispersion that followed the great looting, if it was one of the diseases that came with the invaders, or the mourning for the death of the sun, or some evil influence of the indignant moon which led the Koya to meet with the mothers in the lunar valleys. The truth is that the beautiful Indian woman left this daughter of her youth in the hands of Blas, and the old Encomendero became so infatuated with the girl that he made her live like a queen on his coastal estates, as if trying to correct her the atrocities that the Spaniards did to the Incas. For Ines the Indian wet nurses toiled, for Ines the weavers wove, for Ines the llamas brought the jugs of cow's milk and the bundles of corn and wheat, and before Ines bowed the rows of Indians bound in parcels. They saw in it the power of the new masters who were now subduing the mountain range, but also the dignity and image of the powers that had collapsed with the thunder of Cajamarca. And Blas knew how to exploit that double condition of his daughter, no one like her seemed engendered to reign over the coasts. Such was the overwhelming evidence of that fate that, when the girl was thirteen years old, old Blas fell seriously ill, apparently as a result of a trip through the moors, he searched in vain for air, his lungs filled with water, and with nothing. The riches did not serve, nor blisters and bloodletting of the surgeons of the city of the kings of Lima, nor the whistle with bells of the old Indians, 
nor the ceremonial crying of the servitude, because the considerable Blasta Atenza left his daughter orphaned, barely entering adolescence, and turned into the richest young woman in the region and the most powerful. A few years were enough to make her also the most beautiful and the most coveted by the Spanish lords who divided up the kingdom, and there was no one who did not want for their children or for themselves the beauty of Ines de Atenza, adorned with the rich heritage that the girl had received from her father. Song of the sister of Atahualpa the sun came to greet the iron men but the thunder was already crouched. He came as always, luminous, full of gifts, to share the light among the children, but the blue poison was already at the bottom of the plate. Where have you gone, son of my father, what darkness surrounds you, what giant serpent whose tail whips us all with darkness? I who drank with you the milk from your dark breasts, and then poured milk from my nipples on your lips, and hugged you next to the steam from the pond that exhales a perfume of flowers, I saw the tremor of surprise in your eyelids, when they told you that bright beasts climbed the mountain range, and to calm you I caressed your ankles where the gold ribbons are knotted. Look at me now locked in darkness although there seems to be light in things, look at me already lost because I don't have your hands on my shoulders, look at me already kissing one of your executioners with love. When the dream tells me where your bones are scattered, my father, my brother, my son, high son of my days, fire in my nights, I will leave everything, I will leave the bed of my warrior, and I will come down to you, to see our kingdom again as it was in the golden age, when the slow vicuna, above the clouds, chewed the night, when the large keepers of the old women made stories of our childhood sprout, when the sky so sweet and so sweet of stars had not fallen into the well. 3. The house was a palace with large stone walls. The house was a palace with great stone walls, white arches, and wide stairs. And it had been filled with things brought from Spain, because Blas attended to family duties with the same diligence as the call to war, that discord between Spanish captains that had replaced the discord between Huascar and Atahualpa, the sons of Huayna Capac, son of Tupac Inca Yupanqui and ninth grandson of the great Pishakyotec. The background of Ines' childhood was the wars of her blood, the indignant advances of the Almagristas, the devious ambushes of the Pizaristas, the regrouping of the Incas of the mountains under the condor wings of Manco Inca Yupanqui, the siege of the Cusico for a crowd of Incas, armed with songs and prayers but also with arrows with spurs of fire, the remote noise of Valdivia's incursions to the south, the howl of pain of the Indian towns under the gallop of Bilal Khazar towards the canyons of the north. News of joy and news of anguish passed endlessly under the arches of the great house of Trujillo, the murder of Almagro, the uprising of his mestizo son, the death of Pizarro, who had twelve faithful men by his side his entire life and at the last instant, by strange symmetry, he was felled by twelve enemies. After the fleeting power of Vaca de Castro came the brief summer of the men of Avila under the command of Viceroy Blasco Núñez de Vila, who at the end of April 1544 advanced from Tums and Pyra, taking possession of the kingdom with a luxurious procession, and he lodged under the great arches of the Atenza house, pleased with the beautiful eleven-year-old girl, dressed like a queen, who was his hostess. It moves me that Lorenzo de Cepeda y Ahumada, the youngest of that procession, who had met my friend Pedro de Ursua, a sixteen-year-old boy, in Valladolid, months before, who had seen with him the blurred stone bulls of the Sierra de Gritas and rode with him to Seville, and that she would see him again shortly after in the city of the kings of Lima, had also met that girl in his mansion in Trujillo, without even sensing that these two creatures, who through theirs imperceptibly united destiny, they would end up fused in a single fever of adventure and death. The viceroy came to apply the new laws of the Indies, and nothing could please him more than to be attended by a little mestizo princess in whom the Christian blood of Iberia was forever allied with the pagan blood of the children of the sun. But two years later, under the same white arches through which the viceroy left, the news of his death entered, and since there is an abyss in memory between the ages of eleven and thirteen, what the girl knew was that the rebel Gonzalo Pizarro had horribly torn from her shoulders the bearded head of that old man who had smiled at her in distant childhood. That was the same year that Blas, the encomendero, died, and Ines didn't have to make any effort to start commanding, 
because that's what the dead man had raised her for. Like her distant cousin, little Francisca, daughter of the Marquis Francisco Pizarro himself and the Nustaquisp Sisa, and like the less fortunate children of Cuxirimeaclo, Ines also had harpsichord and European dance teachers in her early years. But although soldiers from Spain served in that mansion, Osorno, the Stocky, Quadrado, the Master Mason, Vertigo, the blacksmith, and Verdugo, the merchant, men loyal to the old lord who also faithfully served his daughter, it was said that in certain rooms there were Indian women weaving large blankets for Ines, old women who were her advisors, who lulled her to sleep. At night, that they combed her hair with silver combs, that they submitted to her whims, and there were even those who affirmed that old pagan ceremonies were celebrated in those rooms under the protection of gold and shadows. But the fact is that envy also began to surround the Atenza house, large, with high latticed balconies and stone patios, which in Blas's time the great lords of the kingdom entered, and in the early days of his daughter only friends childhood and old companions of his father. She grew up without reins, and furthermore, fortune made her free, so that the wives of the other encomenderos did not usually visit her. In her father's lifetime she was scorned as a little foundling who had been taken in for charity, when she was orphaned they did not pity her, but dreamed that she would disappear among the dark mass of the defeated, but when they realized that she had legally inherited lands and encomiendas, large houses and mines, Indians and furniture and crockery, they watched her because of her strangeness, they envied her for her beauty, they feared her for her power and for her life on the border between the distant Spanish world and the tombs of the mountain range, so that in the center of Trujillo that disquieting flower of thistles grew, ardent and dangerous, that few saw but that everyone thought of and that for many was a living temptation. Ines didn't seem to notice the haze of rumors that was growing with her. He had some romances that were neither clandestine nor famous, but no man could be proud of having reached the rosebush of that secret girl. And when the young woman turned 18, the city of Trujillo woke up to the surprise that Ines de Atenza had become engaged in marriage to a rich and young encomendero, one of the newcomers to the Indies, Pedro de Arcos. The entire new society of Trujillo attended the wedding and then the party at Ines's own house. There, the women of the encomenderos, including Estet's proud wife, Florencia Eulalia Josefina de Mora y Escobar Alvarado, followed by her seven maidens, took the opportunity to snoop around and see how much truth there could be in the rumors of the messy and dark world of the daughter of Start. But everything in that house was visible and everything was especially rich and bright, furniture and vases, large wooden and leather chests, abundant pantries, curtains, closets full of suits, and the spacious kitchens and beyond the rooms of the masters, servants, and horse stables and sheep pens. Nothing seemed to confirm an excessive belonging of Ines to the world of the Indians, and many ladies even felt that Ines's house was better endowed, and was cleaner and finer than theirs. There were, for example, a good number of basins, ewers, and silver jugs, and an ingenious water supply system that had been invented by Blas at the time he built the city's aqueduct. The most Indian thing about Ines was her passion for baths with perfumed herbs, the loving care with which her ladies-in-waiting bathed her for a long time in chambers with steaming water, and dried and perfumed her next to the stone patio under the blinding Sunday of the coasts, and the care with which she was dressed, which made Ina seem less like the daughter of an encomendero than a princess of the court of King Felipe or Atahualpa himself. It is already known that nowhere in the empire did women learn to dress more luxuriously than in Peru, and the beautiful Ines not only surpassed the proud women of Trujillo in splendor, but also rivaled the most adorned of Lima. The iridescent peacocks of the viceregal court. The wedding served for Ines to become an accepted part of Trujillo society, and the party almost served to dispel many rumors. But since most of them were not born of evidence but of passions, misgivings and persistent envy, they soon surfaced again. Pedro de Arcos passionately loved his mestiza, and exhibited her with pride, so that everything began to be attributed to some kind of Indian spell, a concoction, or spell of those that the Indians are fond of, and as Ines became visible, she also seemed excessively showy to the people of the town. 
How much Dona Florencia Eulalia Josefina and her maids would have wanted to question in detail the priest who was hearing her confession, but Ines didn't leave them much room for rumors. If she left the house it was only to go to church, accompanied by her maids, and she lived secluded in her mansion most of the time. When Pedro de Arcos went to answer his business in Lima, Ines didn't even come to the door. It would be said that she was the most faithful wife, the most beautiful woman and the most discreet young woman in the city, and no matter how many times the shutters were opened and the subject was formulated and the eyes prying greedily, no one found serious reasons to talk about her. Her. Then the business of the viceroy's nephew happened. The game two fingers that touch at the end are the sacred beak of the Coraquenque, and the three extended are its plume. Three fingers together are the alpaca's head, and the two extended are its ears. Now the two hands facing each other, two Coraquenques looking at each other. If I take them to your face, my hands are your mask. The girl has the face of two birds, the girl has Coraquenque feathers. And if I lower two fingers, two alpacas look at each other over their eyes. 4. When in 1557 the court of Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza. When in 1557 the court of Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza y Bobadilla, Marquis of Cainte, touched Peruvian land, the notables who were waiting for him at the port saw a drunken, young, and arrogant man get off the galleon. Everyone ran to offer their greetings and reverence, and the hand-kissing had already been going on for some time, when the true Marquis, a heavy and venerable gentleman, appeared on the ship's bridge. The young man usurping the honors was his nephew Francisco de Mendoza, entrusted to the protection of the viceroy by a widowed sister. It is not that I intend to necessarily occupy a place in this story, but it is necessary to mention that I was then the viceroy's secretary and clerk. The problem was that, as soon as the galleon that brought us from Spain had landed in the marshes of Castillo de Oro, ready to attend his inauguration in the city of the kings of Lima, an unexpected incident kept me on the isthmus, when the viceregal court he was already embarking on the waters of the South Sea. To make matters worse, the surgeon ordered me to remain immobile for several weeks before starting my work, and this delayed me in nombre de Dios, but thanks to this delay I was able to make friends with the new chief of the royal troop, who had the task of pacifying the rebel maroons, entrenched in palenques in the torrid jungles of the coast. I was beginning to reacquaint myself with the crazy rhythm of the Indies. Although I had been born in Hispaniola 35 years ago, and although I was part of the expedition that, embarked on a brigantine in 1542, discovered the immense river of the Amazons, I ended up more than ten years later entangled in the Emperor's Wars, for the wheels of Flanders and by the fence of cutlasses of the Mediterranean. Later, calmer, I spent years in the office of notary public in Valladolid, trying to forget my past, oblivious to the affairs of this side of the world that change with diabolical haste. But destiny is an elf who is skillful in disrupting all things. Suddenly returned to these lands, thanks to the fact that the new viceroy exaggeratedly valued my experience and believed that I was useful in helping him become familiar with his new domains, I began my mission in the Indies by missing his possession. And in my place was the ostentatious nephew, Francisco de Mendoza, added to the procession at the last moment in the port of Cadiz, and who was going to become the main disappointment of the viceregal family. He was noted from the beginning for his inclination to get drunk and star in noisy scandals, for his attacks on the Indians, and for his tendency to compete with everyone, making himself pay excessive honors as a member of the viceroy's court. He had already come from Spain admonished for besieging women with an owner, and a jealous dagger had marked his chest in a duel of honor. The Marquis quickly gave him a position in the administration of Trujillo, but there were those who said that the Viceroy knew the nephew very well and tried to keep him as far away as possible. It was inevitable that, as soon as he arrived, the boy would cast covetous eyes on the most beautiful woman in Trujillo, whom he saw crossing one day on her way to church with her maids, and coming out like an apparition from the sedan chair to enter in the darkness of the temple. And, of course, that strangely beautiful 25-year-old woman, at once wild and luxurious, powerful and discreet, was none other than Ines, the orphan of Atenza, 
the mestizo princess of Pedro de Arcos. Francisco de Mendoza began to court her in an insistent and impudent way, he shouted clumsiness as she passed in broad daylight, sent her suggestive letters to the servants, sang in a bad voice on her balcony at night without even wondering if her husband would be in the house. Some people who were waiting for an opportunity to talk about Ines and accuse her of something found their opportunity. No one has been able to prove that she corresponded to the requirements of the official, but even she, who was haughty and bossy, had to keep her composure and assume the courtesy that corresponds to the claims of the nephew of a viceroy, and Pedro de Arcos himself, who knew only what the rumors were spreading, at first he let things go, hoping that the nephew's capricious fever would pass without further noise. But the facts became notorious, because Mendoza got drunk easily, so Pedro de Arcos warned him one day in private not to bother them, a second time he rebuked him in the middle of the street, and when the provocation appeared again, he challenged Francisco de Mendoza to a duel of honor. Solemn godparents came and went, Ines de Atenza locked herself up in dismay, the old encomenderos tensed, the neighbors spread new rumors, and the duel was fulfilled, with such bad luck that Pedro de Arcos was badly injured by Mendoza and that same night changed the covetable bed of Agnes for a cold tomb in the mountains. Whether the duel was with a sword or a musket, I never managed to find out, because for the days when I came to trust her I didn't dare to mention that murky and painful story. The viceroy was not unaware that his relative had been creating a reputation for being a brawler in the barracks and in the taverns, but he never expected that the first act of the viceregal family in the Indies would be a crime. It was spread everywhere that the viceroy's nephew had killed a man over a petty affair, and that the dead man was the encomendero Pedro de Arcos, opulent in mines and haciendas. Rumors flew saying that the reason for the duel was his mestizo wife, envied orphan of one of the discoverers of the South Sea and mysterious granddaughter of the Inca kings, and they came back saying that the girl had the secret of the women who formed the ring of Atahualpa, who had lighter skin than his royal grandmothers, who governed a luxurious mansion, who spoke Spanish with a naive song that made her seem younger than she was, and who, in short, had the arrogance and mystery of the mountains where he was born. The nephew was immediately brought before the viceroy, who intended to be sent to Spain without scandal, but a group of indignant encomenderos had already gathered, determined not to allow the new authority of the kingdom to come and undermine the rights recently confirmed by the rulings of the Gasca. This one, trying to impose a minimum order in a turbulent region, had prohibited duels of honor among many things. The men of the Indies, who since the time of Gonzalo Pizarro had been convinced that they had to be respected by the crown, demanded justice and the viceroy understood that he had to please them. That was how the beautiful Ines de Atenza, who had lost her father twelve years ago and had been married just seven, was left alone again, now a widow, with her heart twice in mourning and, why not decide, with her hacienda also duplicated by this new inheritance. The blanket weavers the jungle woven of greens comes, and the flock woven of feathers passes by, and the sun woven with blessings rises, and the river woven with fish and songs descends, because nothing is alone. The warm bodies woven with blood come, the meek night comes woven with caresses, and the mornings woven with dreams open, and the song woven with praise rises, because no one is alone. 5. The first thing the viceroy did when passing through the Panamanian jungle. The first thing the viceroy did when passing through the Panamanian jungle was to load a galleon with 1,250 gold ingots and 48,357 silver bars, accumulated in the Indies during three conflictive administrations since the departure of Pedro Lagasca, and send it with blessings on the bitter waves as a contribution to the wars of Felipe II. La Gasca had left the viceroyalty asleep and scarred after confused discord, but the water took longer to calm down than to receive the disturbing breath of new winds and more rigid moons. The country always incubates rebellions again, and those who have been dreaming of enjoying the delicacies of Jaja learn that in these Indies every night brings its vigilance. The heads of Gonzalo Pizarro and Francisco de Carvajal, parched in a square in Lima, already showed the passerby the fate of the insurgents, and yet in the following years there were at least ten rebellions. 
Francisco Hernandez Duran led the largest of them, and his head ended up keeping company with the skulls of the old rebels. The Marquis of Cain was lucky to immediately find someone to pacify the Isthmus disturbed by the Maroons, but now almost certain of the malign success of that enterprise, he embarked before us, eager to assume power over an unstable domain he had held for twenty years. Years more than ten rulers, the inventor of the kingdom and assassin of the Inca, Francisco Pizarro, the one-eyed and offended Diego de Almagro, to whom the crown never granted clear rights over his conquest, the clueless and ephemeral Vaca de Castro, the old man from Avila, the white-bearded Viceroy Blasco Núñez de Vila, frail and solemn among his troop of wild boys, the murderer of Viceroy's Gonzalo Pizarro, proud and resentful, who lost his kingdom, and his head, at the hands of that inscrutable cleric with the legs of a heron and an iron will that was Pedro Lagasca, and from there the confused Viceroy's Andres de Chienxa, Antonio de Mendoza, brief and ailing, and the enslaver of Indians and governor of Chile Melcher Bravo de Saravia. The Marquis now brought the mandate to tighten the subjection of the Incas, consolidate the power of the crown, weld with new iron the fidelity of the encomenderos, redouble some tributes, multiply the production of the mines, plant new cities, suffocate uprisings, give work on the spears and pikes of the newcomers, and put a stop to the swarm that the ships threw almost uncontrollably. Let the weight of the empire be felt from the canyons of the north, in the kingdom of Pasta, where villages sleep under the roar of the volcanoes, and on the lands of Quito, where the breath of the sea dries the slopes to the west and the breath from the river wets the east with jungles, and throughout the mountain range where the abysses are staggered in terraces of cultivation, where there are rows of hasty feet that measure the kingdom carrying orders and news, and where there are sacred dogs that emerge from the depths. The wind that published the Inca's orders now carried a flight of bells, the abysses were already obedient to the whip, the unruly feet were of the stocks and the human hearts were of the law or of fire. The yoke of the true god had to be felt from the snows of Cotopaxi to the last foam of Araco. In the cabinets of Spain, the Indies are made of paper and fable, but another thing is to make the crown of diamonds and the crown of thorns weigh on ten thousand parched mountains and long coastlines whitened by seabirds. The Marquis learned how difficult it is to govern a mountain range whose mere sight tires, red lands that seem dead even when we see beyond grey lands that seem even more dead, if it were not for the fact that others, burned to white, have copper in their entrails, striations of precious crystals, sinuous galleries of silver. The Spain of stamps and titles, of minute memorandums and account books, codes, reports, minutes and records, motley maps, stacked volumes and precise chronicles, the strenuous kingdom of writing and clause, and now everything is subsections and paragraphs, glosses and scolia, paragraphs and edicts, decrees and sentences, the traces of extreme Roman formalism, aggravated, I know why I say it, a petty sowing and vile poison, to impose the watermarks of the letter on tattooed stones of other laws, the opinion of judges and clerics on the orders of corn solar and the mouth of stars. In order to escape a bit from that withered air that the archives spread, the viceroy wanted to have the illusion of a real brush with the mud and the stones, and he thought he saw in me that possible contact. I had to ensure that his experience in the Indies was not limited to that sea of papers, fill the letter of the chronicles with real substance, faces and details. But what makes so many notaries and judges lock themselves in their paper Indies is that, as soon as they arrive, the words begin to change their meaning. The flames are no longer tongues of fire but beasts bordering the abyss between the wind that pushes, the tigers are not the striped Bengal cats but the sign-studded jaguars, cities are not roams of palaces and cathedrals along rivers that sing in Latin, but masses of rock carved into the back of precipices, flint plates in the mist where we gasp for air. The Marquis had barely set foot on the ground of the dead Incas and was beginning to take possession of his position, when he received the news of his nephew's duel in Trujillo and the death of the offended rival, and he understood that the encomenderos were going to react with fury before the crown for the arbitrariness of the new viceregal family. The eaves of glory were going to change into days of fury. Of course he was glad that the dead man had not been his nephew, not for his sake, 
but for the eternally anguished Lavinia Hurtado de Mendoza, who breathed in the illusion that her son would prosper in the Indies in the shadow of the Viceroy. Then he got mad at his nephew, and banged his fists on the desk chewing profanities. I couldn't miss the damn Wednesday in the week. What need did he have to bring that conceited man who was already pretending to be Viceroy from the bridge of the ship, with his eternal glassy alcoholic gaze? The handsome young man. He was already behind every whore in Seville and had already been stabbed for being a whoremonger in some tavern. He didn't know about honor or respect, for him the world was a pool of oil. And he cursed the hour in which he listened to his sister, and he cursed the children and grandchildren of the devil, that ridiculous peacock reduced to an idiot and a criminal. Who knows who would be the trick for which the viceregal family was now sinking in shame. And what would they say in court? That the viceroy, whose primary duty was to set an example of restraint and decency in these last lands, where everything was insurrections and crimes, where everything was barbarism, had brought a parasite more poisonous than the river snakes, more pierced than arrows, more boastful than drunken monkeys. Let it rot in the stocks, let the jungle eat it, let the caimans in the river devour it, let it leave them alone. He was not going to tolerate in any way that the name of the Hurtado de Mendoza and the blessed blood of the grandparents be put in the public pillory, that an idiot confuse the government that was just beginning. But he said all that to let off steam. He knew that his first duty was to protect his nephew from lynching, and open a process with the appearance of legality that would save him from being hanged in the Indies. He had him arrested and taken to Lima, there he gave him his palace as a prison with harsh language, and soon he managed to ship him to Seville, where they absolved him with all severity. He immediately took pains to appease the anger of the encomenderos by studying their requests, giving them new advantages over the Indians, making them feel his paternal proximity. That consented part of the court was known, to be sure that no further abuses against them would be allowed. And above all, he was concerned to find out who was the mestizo woman whom his nephew had left a widow in that irresponsible act, to procure for her the bombs that it was possible to apply from the cabinets of power. This is how the fame of the late Blas de Atienza, discoverer and founder, a man faithful to the crown and the deposed and murdered Blasco Núñez de Vila, reached his ears, his prestige as a mining engineer and aqueduct builder, and his adoration for that daughter of mixed blood, adoration that other veterans shared. And so he also received the rumors of envy, a whole cloud of advice and curses, about that Indian who bewitched men, that rich mestiza who entangled them in her threads, that libertine who drove them mad in her bed. The good Marquis spent his efforts weighing the reports from one side and the other to know what attitude to assume before that unknown and disturbing woman, who was the first victim of the viceregal house. Contrary to what the envious tongues thought, he understood that he had to make amends to the widow, because not apologizing to her would attract bad feelings among the old encomenderos and rancor among the Indians, who perhaps saw her as a kind of sign of the alliance, the image of his own lost greatness. The golden orphan had just become a black widow adorned with estates, the funeral of the husband, surrounded by the consternation of the city, in which the Marquis did not dare to be present, exalted her in a sort of suffering queen, and Andres Hurtado de Mendoza y Bobadilla, second Marquis of Cainte, former friend of Emperor Carlos V and calm advisor to his son Felipe, scion of a house older than the two crowns, scholar of laws and chronicles, and descendant of saints prelates, suddenly found himself in his first days in the Indies wondering how to apologize to a beautiful girl dressed in mourning, who was also a descendant of ancient Spanish lineages but above all heir to the thick mystery of the Indian lords of the mountain. The girl weaves the green threads are corn in the furrows. The yellow threads are the golden stones. The red threads are the fish of the sky. The white threads are the beautiful waterfalls. Cross your fingers, blow into the warm nest of your hands, tell the wind of herbs what you dreamed. It intersects the threads, the rivers. Knit the blanket. Grandpa comes through the mountains with a golden rod. Those big wings in the sky tell us to close our eyes. But the girl sings to lengthen the day. The girl has eyes that light up at night. 6. 
In another place I have told how we went in 1541 to look for cinnamon. In another place I have told how we went in 1541 to look for cinnamon, how we built a ship in the rivers of the mountain range, how a river that did not stop growing took us for long months between impenetrable jungles. That trip is reputed to have been heroic, but the only thing we did was not let ourselves die, and the truth is that we undertook that adventure because we knew nothing about the jungle and the river. Only that ignorance allowed us to survive, we let ourselves be carried away like a leaf that falls in the current, and we managed to make sure that the jungle hardly noticed our presence, that its tangled hair of ghosts did not turn against us. My second trip to the jungle was very different, and to understand it I must talk again about the man who conceived that conquest. In 1548, on the plateaus of the New Kingdom of Granada, the adolescent governor Pedro de Ursua asked his uncle, Miguel Diaz de Armendariz, a strict judge of four governorates, for permission to go looking for the gold of the Muiscas. Deer branded Indians in the cornfields of the savanna revealed to him where Tesquesusa hid the countless pieces of his treasure, when the shoes of Jimenez de Quesada's horses were stained with blood. Cortes had brought Moctezuma's treasure to Spain, Pizarro had sent nearly capsizing ships of gold, laden with Atahualpa's ransom, but Mexico and Peru were not lands of strident gold but of discreet silver. The new kingdom of Granada sinks its golden roots deeper than the others. The Zippa of Bogota, who bathed in gold dust to talk to the sun in the high lagoons while his people threw tunjos into the water, spawned a legend of the golden man that has consumed entire expeditions. Through the canyons of the Cauca River Jorge Robledo saw armies of thousands of men where each warrior went like a king, crowned with a resplendent helmet, and hearing all this, Ursua also dreamed of placing a mountain of gold at the feet of Carlos V. He asked his uncle for permission to look for the treasure, but the uncle, cunning and devious, replied that his kingdom was weak and was riddled with enemies, for ten years an indignant Indian named La Gaitana had raised thousands of Indian warriors against Spain and the boy had to prove his talent fighting the Timana Panches. The young and still naive Ursua rode with his troops next to the Tequendama Stone and Water Temple to the river plains inhabited by the Catfish Men and the Serpent Men, from where the Blue Mountains can be seen to the west, and then he went to the south, where carvers hidden before time hammered a forest of stone demons. Across the burning plains, on canoes undermined by giant saba trees, under skies populated by beasts, he fulfilled his bloody work, and when he returned he informed his uncle that the panches had already been punished, and asked permission to go look for the Zippus treasure. The ceremonious Armendariz celebrated the victory, which affirmed the power of Santaf over the southern kingdoms and the Valley of Sorrows, but instead of giving him the promised authorization, he replied that, first things first, the Chitareros had to be pacified. News have been received for weeks that your the uprising has spread to the Shikamaka Gorges, and reaches the banks of the Shugamuxi and the Magdalena River, which the Indians call Yuma. There is no graver threat to our kingdom today, he added, affecting more dismay than he really felt. The obedient Ursua traveled to the mountains of Northeast, he crossed ghostly moors where the hundreds of Indians he had taken by force were bruising and dying of cold, naked inhabitants of the plain who could not resist the ice of the height and there he waged a laborious and soulless war, because although patience is industrious, urgency is always the sister of cruelty. After hearing with his eyes the silent thunder of Catatumbo, the lightning that never goes out, he returned bewitched and cruel and told his uncle, the Shikamaka region is pacified, and I have founded the city of Pamplona in the mountains, to remember our lands of origin, in the hills of Navarra. Let me now go in search of El Dorado. Miguel Diaz de Armendariz rejoiced with that news, but he did not want to give up his nephew so soon, who was his main instrument to subdue the kingdoms. You have shown yourself to be bold and courageous, he told her. The power we wield is greater than before, and the gold you have brought speaks well of the wealth of that region and the energy of your triumphs, but now I lovingly order you to travel to the country of the Musos, in the middle region of the Madeline. It was a land of rocky mountains, between grey deposits of salt and emerald mines, which the Musos had made impregnable. Completed a hard war, 
which was sealed with betrayals, Pedro de Ursua returned tense and gloomy, and told Armendariz, I have defeated the Musos, and I have founded Tudela, the city of emeralds, on the flanks of the mountain, which will keep your memory and mine. Now give me authorization to go in search of the country of gold. Do not doubt that you will go in search of him. Answered the fat and ceremonious uncle. But I must make one more plea, because I cannot waste your fighting talents without fully asserting our command over the territory. For the last time you will travel to war, to the snowy mountains that rise by the sea, and you will defeat the Tirana rebels. And the resigned and already gloomy Pedro de Ursua. He returned through the waters of Yuma to the north, under the ancient gaze of the iguanas with great crests, he entered as governor in Santa Marta, under the white mountains, he shocked the mountains, he led blood troops along the sea that devours unsuspecting swimmers, and advanced in iron and in terror against the brave Tiranas, from the warm jungles of fava beans and sava trees to the steps of the stone cities, and pierced the mists where the gold seekers hid from the Indians, and forced the Kajas and the Ikas to take refuge in invisibility and mist. And there the Battle of Paso de Aragua took place, where Ursua, with twelve soldiers, resisted the sieges of three thousand Indians. Then that man came back hardened, bloodied and feverish, to finally demand permission from his uncle to go look for the treasure that obsessed him. But when he arrived in San Taf, he was informed that Governor Armendariz had been dismissed, that the hero Montana, a quiet and righteous man, had opened a case for salacious conduct, and that there was an arrest warrant against him for his cruelties to the Indians. The world had collapsed. Ursua fled like an outlaw, followed at a gallop by his friend Juan de Castellanos, who heard Hendeka syllables even in the blow of horseshoes, and for several months they took refuge in the moors of Pamplona, where the young warrior had friends. But news reached that point that the troops of Luis Lanchero were coming after him, whom years before the boy had humiliated, so they rode down the mountain to La Terra, or Cuatro Brazos, which some already called Barranca Bermeja, and they embarked heading to the thick jungles of Santa Marta. It was on that hazardous trip down a river. Caymans, suspiciously looking upstream, where the persecuting boats should appear, when the young lawyer told Ursua that one afternoon, in the Pearl Islands of Cumana, he had seen a boat arrive made of jungle trunks and caulked with oil of river cetaceans, a ship of one-eyed men, and that its captain, Francisco de Orellana, revealed to him that, exploring the confined waters of the Inca rivers, his brig had been dragged for eight months by a monstrous river that did not stop growing, and he had traveled through rains of arrows, under an immense jungle populated by Amazons, ferocious and naked women and the persecuted Ursua, who had won in. Four wars were in vain but he had lost a dream, he made the decision before the tiger ravines of Tamalamaki to repeat the steps of Orellana, conquer the Amazon River, become governor of those immense jungles, and then travel along paths that only he I had news, to finally rescue the gold from the Zippas. In Santa Marta he parted ways with his friend Castellanos, who had decided to stay and become a cleric and write an endless poem, and sailed alone, heading for Peru, still not knowing how to undertake that conquest. You hear with your whole body. You never know if what you think. Don told you the tiger in the evening. If the thoughts that fill the tomorrow they come from the branches or from the bottom of the water. If the midday resolutions are dictated the fiery sun or the memory of the blackest night. You don't know if the sudden calm of the sunset, which brings again ancient faces and words, pours from the wing that brushes the branches of the lightning that bursts, far, on the jungle, or of the moon that makes its home between the red clouds. You hear with your whole body, you touch everything with Dazzled eyes. You feel the fear on your back. Sweats, in the legs that hurt. In the fingers wounded by the thorns of the water. 7. And he was new to Panama, persecuted and without troops. And it was just arrived in Panama, 
persecuted and without troops, when Ursua had the bad luck to find us. To me, who opened the doors of the viceregal court, to the Marquis of Kaint, who discovered that that Navarrese boy was of the blood of famous captains of his land, and to the Palenques of rebel Maroons that it was his destiny to reduce, whom he harshly persecuted, poisoned, and massacred, just to gain appreciation of the viceregal powers. That man, whom I in the early days considered a vagabond, he managed very soon to become chief of the viceroy's personal guard, and when the account of his adventures reached us we knew that, despite his youth and his refined manners, we were dealing with a ruthless man who had fought for wars. Savages against the Indians of Tierra Firme. Sooner or later what we are shows. His Lost condition could not long hide the powerful commander of troops, who had been governor twice before he was twenty-five years old and who left his name written in blood over extensive provinces, everything that I could not foresee in our first meeting on the docks. I still needed to discover that in Ursua. Any conquest was but a prelude to the next, any triumph was only a stepping stone that allowed him to see further, and his ambition did not stop growing as the landscape widened. Like a man climbing a mountain, smaller and smaller things in the distance filled his horizon, and he needed to move faster to reach them. The arrival of the viceregal court on the continent promised to be just a sequence of tedious trades, bureaucratic procedures, things that by dint of repeating themselves produce the illusion that the world is the same forever and that the power of the trade and the seal will never be annoyed. The arrival of Ursua changed everything. Was Curious as a hound, I don't know how he found out that I was a veteran of Orellana's trip and he wanted me to tell him about the adventures of the expedition we undertook looking for the country of Cinnamon, if it was true that that trip turned into a butchery, if our final escape had been an accident or a betrayal, and how we experienced the greatest discovery of Spain in the Indies, the discovery of the largest river in the world and the jungle that surrounds it. At first I was suspicious. I did not understand the cause of his interest in those days that left us full of enemies. I don't remember having offended Gonzalo Pizarro's men who were abandoned along the Coca River, but I did not stop being seen as a traitor by the survivors who returned through the cruel mountains to Quito and Lima. I had been trying to forget that trip for many years, when one of those days, in Nombre de Dios, a stab wound in the belly revealed to me that the world had not forgotten it. Someone in the shadows wanted to collect Orellana's supposed debts from me, and Pedro de Ursua saved me in that trance that could have been fatal. By one of those coincidences that end up being definitive in every existence, his help in a moment of danger made me not only his friend but also his faithful companion until the day the stars betrayed him. Life, here, does not stop shaking. The moss. Fortresses crack, roads fade under grass, Landslides undo camps, villages wake up with a start at midnight, when streams turn into raging rivers, jungles close at the slightest carelessness, and every firm enclave is humiliated by elements. We look for firmness in men and in beliefs when the reality around us is fluid and weak, but men also participate in the urgency of the rivers and the cunning of alligators, the agility of the deer and the precision of the jaguar that calculate the distance and force on the branch. It would seem that the charm of some men of inflexible will is that they seem to embody more powerful laws, forces that subjugate and drag others, so that nature itself is willing to submit to their force. Walking with Ursua I felt at times that he was with someone before whom nature submitted. But in the long run everything is an illusion, a man is nothing when the rivers rise, when a sky of stones hangs over the villages, when the heaped cloud prepares its rays. The only human forces that resist this confrontation are those unleashed by madness, which does not set limits, and which does not consist in the loss of intelligence but in its insolent and sacrilegious magnification. But Ursua did not belong to the lineage of the insane but hardly a lineage of the stubborn. His was above all stubbornness and ambition, and soon he would find forces capable of opposing his dreams. These voyages of conquest have had moments of fortune but also long stretches of devilish madness. It was already an extreme purpose to conquer the kingdom of stone and lacquer of the Aztecs, in the lake surrounded by bloody altars, 
it was already a delirium to subdue the abyss of the Inca temples, and there were men whose will was more made of iron than their breastplates, fierce and fiery troops who defied the impossible. But the story I am trying to tell is perhaps more senseless and sadder, because the greatest madness of this age of the world was conceived early by Pedro de Ursua, the inordinate ambition to conquer the Amazon jungle and dominate the water serpent that goes through. Orellana's adventure was very different. When we started our trip we ignored the existence of the jungle and the river, it was all an accident, our feet barely consisted of surviving, and a journey of discovery is not the same as a journey of conquest. Ursua, on the other hand, already knew that the jungle and the river existed, I had warned him of its magnitude and its dangers, and I had repeated that they were not simply a river and a jungle, that those regions were an endless and stormy world, inhabited by secret gods, governed by laws that we do not know how to decipher. Perhaps what has forced me to write this story is the fact that so far I am the only human who has experienced these two trips. Anyone will wonder why a man who in his youth was dragged through the water serpent has been able to return to his hell twenty years later, already at the gates of old age. We are not masters of our destiny, a life that has not found its answers is subject to temptations and challenges. For years I rejected the memory of my first trip, but now I know that every vehement rejection is secretly a bond, and Ursua, who was a conqueror in every way, managed to turn my rejection into attraction, my repulsion into curiosity, took my tired life and brought her back to the age of questions. Against all warning, he persisted in believing that this vast world could be conquered, that it was possible for a man to saddle the serpent, ride the abyss. Now I know that the countries are his men. Only that old Spain capable of risking unknown seas, that courage that lifted the mist that covered the worlds, could dream in the midst of the delirium that the storm also had in its hands. Some who had suffered limitless frustration subdued, it is true, very powerful and extensive kingdoms, but this boy who had been born in the cradle of princes, this son of the frontiers who had been born in the shadow of Pyrene and Heracles, finally believed that his hands reached for the sky, and he awoke to lightning. Story In the song of the bird luck In the cloud the story of the possible In the coca leaf the milk of the earth In the light the dominion of the passions In the reed the music of the abyss In the stone the souls of the dead In the knot the secret of alliances In the dream the fabric of the ponds In the silent tree the memories of Water Old age in the mist on the moon the garden of those who know. They were. In the wind the flower of storms. In the condor that flies the friendship of. The kingdoms. In the red cob the laughter of the sun. In the blood the disorder of the. Stars. 8. In the idleness of the jungle. Panamanian. In the idleness of the Panamanian jungle, after that war against the Maroons that I later learned to see as an evil fact, Listening to the promises of the horizon under the leaden sky of the South Sea, Ursua asked me to tell him what he did not know. Of our expedition. He wanted to repeat Orellana's trip, he thought he could seize everything that our captains couldn't keep. He had talked to other veterans, but he was always on the lookout for revelations, new significant details, and perhaps that was why he devoted himself to me with a lover's intensity. With the impatience of knowing everything, he reviewed. Again each detail as if he were going through his own memory, correcting me to minuscule data that he remembered better, and very soon I understood that he was not interested in my thoughts but only in my memories. That is why there are many things that he failed to appreciate, elemental truths that he never took into account. The expedition that was proposed, I repeat, was the fruit of his will, it was governed by his eagerness to conquer, while ours had been an accident. What we were looking for we never found, what we found no white man had imagined, and that was what allowed us to survive. If ours had been a voyage of conquest we would have had to wage war, establish settlements, make lasting deals with the natives, things that would have delayed our passage, that would have created ties, obstacles to that free flow that allowed us to get out to the other side, battered and sore, wasted and full of visions, but luckily alive. 
so even though Ursua knew many circumstances of our navigation, he was mistaken as to the causes of the discovery. His information came from the stories that Orellana, Fray Gaspar de Carvajal and the other travelers made in Cubagua and Margarita as soon as they got off the ship, and in those stories, without agreeing, we recounted the journey through the jungle and the river in great detail. To better silence what happened in the first months of the trip. The facts were colorful, the episodes tremendous, no one could suspect that we were keeping something quiet, that a secret was tormenting us. The day finally came when he told me, with his usual enthusiasm and as if it were a prize, that he had a place for me on his expedition to conquer the Amazons, he was sure that my presence would be very useful to him. A single trip down the river, I replied, is enough to poison a life. Mine had enough with the anguish of that time. No one knows how long it took me to stop feeling trapped by a spider's web. The jungle is still attached to the skin even if one is already far away, the strength of the river is still present when we have been its toy for so many months, it is as if the flowing time were just a memory of the river, as if the rushing hours were still its banks. There is no way to avoid, even on the most placid days, the fear that a deadly arrow is going to pierce the halls, that a jaguar is going to roar in the branches of a temple, that a huge snake is coiling in the evening clouds. You were able to face all that to the 20 years, without knowing him, he replied, you can't be intimidated at 40 by a trip you've already made. You forget, I told him, that we weren't looking for the jungle or the river. We found them without looking for them, we didn't even take the initiative to go through them, the river prevailed. But it was all an accident, you would have to be crazy to knowingly embark on that navigation. Besides, I added, no one repeats a trip, so. If we were the same men and embarked on the same brigantine, everything would be different. In such a jungle and on such a river, each trip will awaken a different madness. And this shows that, without knowing it, I foresaw everything, but it is that the true meaning of the words we pronounce is only revealed to us very late, when reality confirms them. I entertained him for a whole day with my account of the journey fifteen years ago in search of the country of cinnamon. He listened attentively, any piece of information could be invaluable, and although he was anxious to interrupt me to look for details, he allowed the story to flow, for fear that the pauses might spoil my memory. I had never completely recounted that experience because I resisted remembering the minutiae of a miserable trip, but listening to that man modified those old facts for me, I understood that narrating them gave me a certain power over them, it made me a privileged witness of the events, and the story that I had avoided for years became interesting in my eyes, I was filled with a sort of relief to rescue her. How cunning was Ursua? He managed to fascinate me a memory that a little before caused me rejection. Got me to see less and less. I was disgusted by the possibility of reliving that trip, and I don't know at what point I already felt ready to face, almost anxiously, the nightmare of my youth. And so we returned to the city of the kings of Lima. Fifteen years ago, when we were going to look for the cinnamon, power had a name, Francisco Pizarro. It had taken me a while to get to his palace and timidly ask him for my father's inheritance. I only managed to get enlisted in the expedition in the hope of receiving some benefit in case the aroma forests appeared. Pizarro then seemed as firm as the mountains. Now of the disgraceful man who three lustres before was owner of the world there was nothing left but a bundle of bones under the stones. I had believed in his promise to recover my father's inheritance, and I was leaving my faith along the way. While the power lasts, the powerful suffer from the illusion of being invincible and immortal, and manage to spread that fantasy, but in these new lands time grinds everything faster. Now I was returning to Peru as a member of the viceregal court, and I was a close friend of the new captain of the troops, while of Pizarro, the mythological conqueror, not even a ghost remained in the world, he was less than mist in the mist of the mountains. Prophecy of the Arrival of the Invaders. Without putting pressure on him, he split into my hands the arrow. Without anyone pushing him, he slipped and 
That pitcher has fallen. My palm is broken before the thorn the wound. It deforms on my lips and turns. An insult the friendly word. A dark saliva pours out of the sun. The winds say fearful things in the stone niches. The condor takes flight and bumps into the lower branches. The children suddenly have faces of elderly. 9. We reached the port. Foggy of El Calau. We reached the misty port of El Calau, the same day we rode to the city of the kings of Lima, and at nightfall we reigned in the horses before the big house of the Marquis of Cainte. After Panama, to fill an entire day from moon to moon with my account of Orellana's voyage, after two weeks on the deck of the Pishikamak, watching the rainy coasts go by, the islands where the first explorers lived their hell, the long cliffs of white birds and the dark backs of whales or sea serpents, Ursua and I had forged a good friendship. He knew almost everything about me, I already had memories of the Navarran hills, Donostia taverns, lustful women from the shores of the Bay of Biscay. Having known Peru at different times, now we arrived together, and those who go alone do not see the same world as those who feel accompanied. The viceroy who had already made Ursua his chief of troops planned to use his arm to suffocate rebellions, to subject to his sword a world always ripe for insurgency, but Ursua came drunk with dreams. Remembering the postponements of Santaf and the terrible outcome of those delays, he was determined to prevent his uncle's story from repeating itself, that the viceroy began to use him as a spearhead to conjure up uprisings and calm regions where there were fires of indigenous rebellion kept in secret. Embers, settlers ruminating grudges, crazy adventurers brewing conflicts. Already in Panama the captain had formulated his expectations if he managed to beat the Maroons, it was time to clearly present his project to the Viceroy. The gloomy 31-year-old warrior, survivor of so many battles, endlessly reborn from his ashes, wanted to immediately embark on the conquest of the world's largest river and the jungle of mysteries that surrounds it. For him, the country of the Amazons was a ring of fortresses arranged in the jungle to isolate and protect the anticipated city. Legends, rumors, and chronicles were interwoven in his mind, stories of travelers that bordered on delirium and fantasy. Attentive to every story, he was only convinced by the things that confirmed his obsession, he dismissed as fables what was discouraging and disregarded warnings and recommendations. Because he had convinced me to accompany him, he he felt more secure than before, he felt capable of convincing almost anyone. And if the Peru we arrived at was very different from the one he had suffered in another time, I know that Ursua had changed more. From the dreamy and indecisive boy, drifting through the kingdoms, an influential warrior had risen, appreciated at court and full of eloquence. I almost regretted having expressed it to him in Panama so many severe opinions on the conquest, because in the end he was everything that I criticized about the conquerors. But I confess that under his influence excesses and crime seemed understandable, the malignancy was filled with mitigating factors in light of the circumstances. And it is that being his friend led one, at least it led me, to minimize his mistakes and his responsibilities, because if he was arbitrary and brutal when he was possessed by the permissive passion of war, in ordinary dealings he was friendly and loyal, and at his side one felt under a protective shield. He was brimming with wit, grace, and mischief. From Who left his women in Santaf, an Indian Cumanagata called Zibali, who prayed to her body before the battles, and a Spanish lady that he sometimes dreamed of bringing to Peru and who had a daughter of hers in the savannah of Bogota, only dealt with women who did not compromise his affections, who did not occupy his heart beyond the moment and they left him all the time to rave about campaigns and treasures. The thirst for power was the only passion that filled him, that filled him with arguments, and the Marquis of Cainte was docile like all of us to his dreams of blood and his ghosts of gold. Like Gonzalo Pizarro twenty years ago, Ursua did accounts all day long, costs of horses and soldiers, provisions, tents, pigs, and the main weapons, dogs, crossbows, arquebuses, and gunpowder. It had to include the expedition ships in the initial cost, 
and it had far fewer resources than Pizarro's company. He began to tour parcels, knowing to the gentlemen and bringing them the greeting of the viceroy. In principle, he did not intend to request anything from them, but instead to form an idea of which ones would be candidates to finance his project. There was a long series of visits and lunches, excursions on horseback through the mountains, meetings with landowners and Indians, and Ursua never missed an opportunity to relieve his exploits from the new kingdom of Granada, which were admirable. In those stories he was a hero at seventeen, a founder of cities at twenty, a triumphant warrior at twenty-two, a tireless horseman through tremendous mountains, among tigers, alligators, and hostile populations, in all the splendor of his youth, and he knew how to dramatize the vicissitudes of the search for his lost treasure, the wars against the Panchi and against the Muso, the Emerald Wars, the story that Castellanos had told him about the young lungs of the Indians burst in the extraction of pearls in Cubagua, the story of his two great foundations in the new kingdom of Granada, the fearsome stories of the stone beasts and the lightning that does not stop, and above all the chronicle of his war against the Tehrana, with the discovery of the mysterious stone cities of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, to close the cycle with the defeat of Bayano, king of the Maroons, in the burning jungles of Panama, amid the metallic flight of giant beetles. But the story of those past lives was just the appetizer of the adventures that they expected. Ursua was building his legend in the minds of others, and many were very willing to finance the adventure of a man so clever and brave, so ingenious and reckless, that he was determined to face the greatest obstacle that had been found in the Indies, to lands that, being the cruelest that could be imagined, were doubtlessly suspicious of the greatest treasures. It still seemed possible that what was missing was much larger than anything that had been found, undoubtedly, a lasting glory awaited him under the skies of the new world, but also something to flaunt and narrate in the old site with a stone fortress of his elders in Ariskin, in the hills of Navarra, and perhaps in nearby palaces, where relatives of his they used to be hosts to the greatest lord under heaven. Many were convinced, and after. During the first visits, some promised important resources for this expedition led by a garrisoned and princely captain, and was endorsed and trusted by the viceroy himself. Not much time had passed since our arrival when Ursua began to feel in a position to start collecting resources and recruiting the men who would accompany him. He began to inquire about the regions from which it would be convenient to leave, and I myself suggested that it would not be necessary to go to Quito, as we had done with Pizarro, with a tremendous waste of energy and men, because such a large river rises everywhere, the tributaries are innumerable, and from the eastern slopes of the Peruvian mountains we would undoubtedly find waters capable of taking us to the deep jungle. But there, in those very days when the city opened before our eyes beyond the grey ravines, the Marquis of Caint was facing the first difficult situation of his government. The need to prevent a new Encomendero revolt was forcing him to present himself as a humble and contrite ruler in the eyes of a mestizo widow, of whom all of Peru spoke with a passionate mixture of admiration and envy. In the jungle inside. He lay down on the clay floor and. The lights of heaven came down to her. That they were coquillos, the sorcerers said. But she trembled. That were eyes of foxes in the jungle of. Inside which were holes in the wall of the dream house, that were ink stains on the skin, nude of the firmament. She stretched out on the water and the water did not devoured. He lit bonfires on the roads of the saw. He threw embers into the abyss full of fog. It always passes leaving a trail of shining stones. It always leaves its shadow in the pupils. 10. After thinking a lot about how to correct the offense. Nephew. After thinking a lot about how to correct the nephew's offense, which compromised his entire family, the Marquis of Caint made the decision to send Pedro de Ursua, his right-hand man and the most colorful warrior in the kingdom, to visit the widow of Pedro de Arcos, to pay his respects and the testimony of deep indignation of the viceregal house for the crime of her relative, 
telling her that the criminal would be prosecuted with all severity under the imperial laws, and asking her to one day agree to be visited by the Marquis himself. We were still writing imperial laws. Though now we were ruled by a king and not a emperor, although the empire of a few decades struggled to unravel into kingdoms. Ursua could not refuse to comply with that embassy, but for the first time in his life he was forced to assume the role of humble apologist, and that did not fit his character. He did not attach great importance to the mission nor did he think much about the lady he had to visit, he could represent her as a poor suffering lady locked in her world, people who one knows how to ignore after completing the visit. He asked me to accompany him to Trujillo, since he was going to take advantage of the circumstances to visit the encomenderos of the region and share with them the project of his campaign. Along the fiery coastline we rode for more than ten days, resting at haciendas assigned by the viceroy, followed by a large troop. Finally, escorted by that same troop but without my presence, Ursua arrived at the great stone house of the Atenses and asked to be received by the lady on behalf of the viceroy. After being kept waiting for a long time, it seems that the widow appeared under a mourning veil, heard his greeting, hardly even looked at him while he recited his message with the greatest respect. He began to feel especially mortified by this mission, because he detested the role of humble, apologetic emissary, and also because the woman, haughty and spiteful, treated him like an insignificant subordinate. That same night the captain confided in me his dislike for that woman he had just met, and the next day he confessed to me that the rage of having gone to that house hardly allowed him to sleep. Wanting to get even, he wrote to him for the Marine mail a letter to the viceroy telling him, not false things, but exaggerated truths, among them that the widow reluctantly received his apologies, that he was more Indian than Spanish, and that he did not seem like a trustworthy person. To his annoyance, the Marquis in his response found the woman's attitude perfectly explainable, taking into account that she was sunk in mourning, that she had just lost her husband, and that she was the only person whom the recently inaugurated vice-regal government he had seriously offended. Ines had assumed her role as offended queen, so she barely deigned to thank the viceroy's words with a hard face, but that hostile face stuck with my friend in an offensive way. I thought of her often. At first he told himself that it was her tragic fate as a widow that affected him in this way. But he did not forget the face, hardened by the offense, and he even confessed to me that there was something disturbing in it, more hateful in its stony firmness than the rumors of the city said. It annoyed him that a strange woman aroused such a lingering dislike in him, and against his gentlemanly ways, he felt like cursing her. Fortunately, he had other things to think about, and he took advantage of his visit to the coast to get to know the region, to find out about many things that had happened in previous times, to find out who he had to talk to in order to further his interests. Together we visited the citadel of Chan Chan, and I remember that both of us were impressed, on a day of blinding sun and long winds, by the enormity of that city of baked clay, the immense squares with walls decorated with seascapes, the hardness of the shadows on a floor that seemed to be buzzing with stories, the slight vertigo of getting lost in a labyrinth of suffocating galleries, many of which were still full of natives who tried to continue carrying their merchandise there and celebrating rituals, although we all knew that this was not the case. The world of the Incas but a previous world, to which the Incas themselves looked with contempt. The dignity of the cities was in the high and polished stone walls, in the tombs of the mountain range. These mud citadels, monumental as they were, seemed remnants of an earlier, somewhat barbaric world. Chan Chan was too close to the sea, the gods of the Incas were of another substance, condors from the frozen heights, pumas from the mountain cities, snakes from the hidden jungle. The descendant kings of Pishakyotek had no trade with the sea, nor with the seagulls that flutter in the distance, nor with the fish that populate the abysses. Maybe that's why it was so easy for that abandoned and fragile side to be the door of perdition. Before returning to Lima, Ursua was already moving like a bird from encomienda to encomienda, trying to convince the lords to join the project with dukedoms, horses, and soldiers. 
it had done him some good to hear me talk about my travels in Europe, he wasted his grammar painting for those gold-plated rustics the marvelous countries that would open up before the expedition, all those riches on which the governors of the Caribbean had already set their eyes, the nobles of Seville, the merchants of Spain, the bankers of Augsburg and Genoa and even the cardinals of Rome. With a timely investment, everyone's flows would increase. And it was fortunate that the financiers could be so close, because the tycoons and remote bankers, even if they wanted to, did not have within reach of their boats the rivers that cross the jungle or the cities of Amazons that populate the world of the Great Serpent. Ursua began to speak and immediately believed. His own tale. Perhaps only he could have written or dictated this story, and no doubt he would have done it with much more eloquence than I can put into it, because sometimes I only badly imitate his way of using words. His childhood stories, his devilish taverns, his dialogues with his beloved uncle and having frequented so many illustrious men served him well. As a good seducer, he did not use words to think but only to convince, and he always had time for anyone who could sponsor his warrior adventures. We returned to Lima and Ursua finally gave up his inform the viceroy about the thankless mission he had entrusted to him. The Marquis declared himself satisfied that he had overcome the problem in the best way, and Ursua redoubled the pressure to prevent new missions from messing up his plans. It was the year 1558, and Ursua was going to undertake right away preparing for your adventure. He disappeared from court. Days later we learned that he was dealing with all sorts of people in the idle alleys of the kingdom. He visited taverns and prisons, stately mansions, and gloomy dens. He got involved in fights, he entered into strange complicity with strangers, he soon became the center of the groups and the soul of the fights, although always in the role of leader of men, protector, and leader. I always wondered if he was such a friend of the people as it seemed, because it was not easy for great friendships to arise so casually and dissolve into nothingness afterward like knots of wind. But at that time he did not seem to need me or my memories, and I took up my duties in the viceroy's office, without delving too deeply into the sorrows and delights of memory. The Huaca of the Sun The Sea of the Opaque Color of the Days the sea that advances salty licking. Boulders. The land's covered in a white that. It's not daylight. But the long spot of birds. Marine. The rocky beach where each. Pebble. Talk about old lovers. Abandoned. And behind the city of mud walls. Of walls with painted fish that. They jump. And in the background the great ponds. Where the sacred fur dogs. Naked. Feverish fur dogs. Dive at noon. When the water is still. And they emerge slowly, first the tips. Black from their ears. And then the muzzle. Before the sweeping wind blows. Cities and people. And seeps its insidious sand into the. Sunken overlapping temples. That had colored walls and they were filled with new walls and strokes because here we draw for the guests of the land and the darkness because here we draw for the dead 11 we didn't have much weather in lima we had not been in lima long when the news reached the viceregal court less expected the crown had appointed a new viceroy Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza and Babadaya, Marquis of Cainte, was suffering the worst injury an official could expect. Be replaced in the most important position in the new world without warning. Worse yet, to put it bluntly, being removed without having had time to settle your assets or collect your profits. I was present when the news arrived, which was not even an official message but a well-founded rumor, and I witnessed his embarrassment. The poor Marquis did not understand what was happening, he met with his closest officials and his family and they discussed the case, wondering who in court was plotting against him. The list of possible candidates was not small, although they also examined the possibility that the nephew's crime had precipitated the catastrophe. 
such lofty decisions are unappealable and fall like rays from a serene sky on the heads of subordinates, so that the Marquis did not know who to turn to find out the facts, who to turn to to conjure them up. We didn't even know how long His Majesty's decision had been taking, the new Viceroy was perhaps already on his way. I copied several letters in a tone that alarmed me myself, and the Marquis did what must be done with the pages that spring from pure anger, revised, corrected, and destroyed, because although his indignation and arrogance were great, the court habits had taught him to be prudent and shrewd. Every day he wondered if the impostor, if the usurper, if the damned court liquor who was going to replace him had already embarked. Sometimes I found him on the balcony looking at the severe and dark mountains of the Inca with a melancholy incomprehensible to someone who did not know that the viceroy sighed less for the appearance of the mountains than for the veins of silver that were hidden under them, for the wealth saved that it would no longer be his and that an ambitious earner would inherit. Then the rumor began to circulate that the Marquis of Cainte, jealous subject of his Hispanic majesty, right hand of the king in these last lands, faithful puppy of the crown, was suffering from the disease that had poisoned Gonzalo Pizarro, that planned to rebel against the determinations of Philip II. Moreover, the rumors not only said that Don Andres wanted to declare himself king of these empires, and prevent the landing of his replacement, but he was preparing Pedro de Ursua as a great general of the troops to guarantee his power over the territory, and to resist even an army sent by the crown or that it was improvised by some new bishop with real sealing wax. In those days, Ursua reappeared at the viceregal house. Between him and the Marquis there were secrets, messages, and counsels, because the captain had contracted important debts, and the sudden dismissal of the viceroy was about to ruin his dream, so many times wasted, of conquering his own government, his will to make his fortune in the country of the Amazons, the decision to finally root his foot towards the golden heart of the eastern jungles. Ursua hated betrayal, having so many defects, being capable of so many mistakes, only that crime seemed impossible to him. He could be cruel, he could be ruthless and brutal, but he was loyalty incarnate, and when he gave someone his trust, he did so absolutely. The brave are frank, they do not lie or mistrust, and they are also overconfident. Instead, when it became clear that he had been duped, his confidence turned into a ruthless rage. But for the first time it seemed to me that Ursua was beside himself. It was as if he was secretly holding a pulse with his destiny, as if realizing that an invisible hand was about to break his hand. A man like him, made not to give up, needs tangible opponents up front. He always gained in strength and determination when measured against other men, but he was unable to fight with nature and seemed like a castaway in the hands of fate. In those days I noticed that when he was in trouble because of invisible or unappealable powers, by fateful decision of the stars or occult powers, he seemed to need flesh and blood containers more than ever, and he got into trouble with everyone. He did not even realize it, he did it impulsively, and it is possible that he left behind silent enemies, offended beings who would no longer forget that Pedro de Ursua had humiliated them, and whom he instead forgot with an ease that seemed too much to innocence. Perhaps it was from those imperceptible faces that the rumor began to emerge that Ursua and the Viceroy were preparing a new rebellion, and that very soon there would once again be great discord and great sacrileges under the sky. Then the least expected happened. Time had stretched out to the limit, until when there seemed to be nothing but extreme solutions, black deeds of insubordination and war. The Viceroy decided to send his final message to the Crown, a message that he was preparing to dictate to me but the one that I could guess from the silences and the tension of the previous days, from the entrances and exits of Ursua from the government house, a message that it was surely going to cause deep commotions, when from a ship just anchored in the harbor came first a message from the king's own hand. And this message brought the news that Mr. Diego de Acebedu, the new viceroy, whom the the Marquis of Cainte had to hand over his kingdom and his throne, his mountains and his ambitions, his hopes and his troops, he had had the strange occurrence of suffering a sudden pain in his chest while still riding on his luxurious pony with velvet trappings, 
and collapsing from his luxurious horse on the banks of the Guadalquivir, and seeing from the stony ground the agony of the sky over the olive groves, and dying like any mortal on the way to Seville, when he was going to embark for Lima to receive the power over a third of the world, so that Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza unexpectedly returned to be, for an indefinite time, Viceroy of Peru. There was no longer any need for rebellion or betrayal. The message that had been gestated in the Viceroy's soul died sweetly in his chest without coming to his lips. Fate had saved him at the last minute. Death, which for the days when we had been sailing the ocean, when it seized young Toribio Alderite on the high seas, had been his fearsome adversary, had now become his silent ally. Salvation had come where least expected, and the noble and wise monarch Don Felipe II was once again an invaluable benefactor in his soul. Never had the slightest thought crossed his mind. Shadow of doubt on the generosity and greatness of King Philip. God knew who he had on the throne of the greatest empire in the world. The land weighed down by gloomy clouds was now a resplendent mountain range, full of strong men with tasks to perform. And the beautiful and princely Pedro de Ursua, who had been his main ally in the dark times, would now be the beneficiary of his protection. I listened to all these things from a corner of the room where the viceroy continued to preach the gospel of fidelity, the homily of the magnanimous throne. Suddenly he burned with indignation remembering the perverse rumors that had tried to make him a traitor and ungrateful. And I listened to the torrent of his joy, trying to understand why he felt that all this was not happening to the Marquis but to me. The death of an unknown official, in a remote city, on the other side of an endless sea, was going to change the course of my life forever. It would have been more serious to know that this fact. So happy for Ursua that she was writing the text of her fate at the same time, and that this fate that insinuated itself with all the sparkles of happiness was not happy. But, alas, destiny, fortunately, is merciful and knows how to mask itself. I didn't know whether to be happy or worried about the obvious fact that the immediate consequence of that abrupt turn of fortune would be the definitive expedition of Pedro de Ursua to the lost country of the Amazons. The deepest reality was another. Immense. Powerful, invisible, the serpent was closing its ring over our lives. Drum stories. Someone knocks hard on the moon. Month of stones. Someone knocks merrily in the sun. Old turtles. Someone calls to dance on the back. Of clay from the mountains. Do you understand that story that throbs? In the light. He talks about beautiful girls like him. Corn. Talk about wise old women with the. Herb. He speaks of the tales of the old, who. They smell of grass and wood. Thick. You feel them in the belly, like blows wild. You feel them in your chest, like battles. And as constructions. You feel them on your skin like rain. Fresh. And hearing that drum you are the moon that. Echoes in the night. You are the sun that is hidden. Deep into the night. You are the red back where they dance from. Evening. 12. Ursua had been about. To be rebellious. Ursua had been on the verge of being a rebel, but not because of treason but, how to say it, because of an excess of loyalty. He was a true soldier, as war texts describe him and as chiefs and kings have always dreamed of him. Being so brave, so risky, and so cruel, he was completely subject to authority, to an idea of the world, according to which everyone who commands has to obey. He did not carry in his blood the vocation of a tyrant, and even in his hinted and aborted rebellion he remained faithful to the man to whom he owed his power. Nor in the new kingdom of Granada had he ever resisted the will of his boss, who was his uncle and his judge, and that was precisely the cause of his failure. But at last he wouldn't have to be so tied to command lines, for the first time he would govern an expedition of his own. I stopped seeing him for many weeks. Before I he was looking for any pretext to ask for details of my trip or to entrust me with worries and difficulties, but now there were a thousand tasks on his hands, 
the company did not have enough resources and promised to cost more than originally calculated. The search for the country of cinnamon was paid for with the spoils of a city of gold, no one experienced the anxiety of appraising each coin invested. Now no one had such riches, there was no doubt that times had changed. If legions of Indians began to extract silver from the great mines of the south, no conqueror was collecting the gold of the towns in handfuls. There was no longer wealth without work. Could have. Encomiendas of more than 3,000 Indians for a single Spaniard, but there were many more men of conquest who never achieved the favor of the crown and who barely resisted waiting for a somersault of luck. One day, Ursua came back to look for me at the palace. Viceregal to tell me a curious fact. Traveling through the interior of the kingdom, he had made contact with two Brazilian Indians who had survived the river crossing. I already knew that a year ago an entire people of navigating Indians had arrived in Peru through the rivers of the east, which flow beyond the green rocks. They claimed to have traveled upstream for ten years, from the province of Omegua, going up the adverse currents in canoes, in the midst of great hardships, to come in search of the mountains. For me, the revelation of that trip was amazing. According to the Indians, more than 10,000 natives had set out in canoes from their world in the impenetrable jungle, had sailed year after year down narrowing rivers toward the blurred mountains of the west, and barely a few hundred reached the first villages in the upper part of the mountain range. Those who had questioned them through interpreters could not understand the reason for the trip, the Indians answered vaguely and did not even say where they came from. I always feel that there are many things of your trip that you haven't told me about yet, Ursua told me one rainy afternoon, while we were riding, exploring the eastern regions of Peru. I remember that the sky opened up in lightning bolts, and while we cleared next to some huge rocks, I went back to my memories, added details, recounted moments that I had undoubtedly already told him, and I felt that it was not my intention to prevent him from advancing in his company, that rather I was infected by that persuasive magic that his face and his words had. We talked about the thunderstorms that we had seen on our trips, and Ursua recalled the story of the thunderbolt that fell on the men who were waiting for Judge Armendariz, at Cabo de la Vila, one afternoon almost fifteen years ago, when the still sky unleashed lightning on one of the boats anchored in the bay. Another bolt of lightning had set fire to a palm tree when they were traveling down the Magdalena, and finally he remembered the mysterious and continuous lightning without thunder that exists in the jungles of Catatumbo, which made him feel at the gates of hell. The most powerful thunder I had heard was not in the sky and Ursua would never hear it, it was the crash of the river against a white wall, when instead of being thrown into the abyss we found ourselves surrounded by the foam of the sea. In all my memories I seem to be telling stories to my friend. The words are never the same but the same purpose always governs me, telling the facts less than rescuing them, giving them an order in the story just to try to understand them. When the rain stopped I was in the middle of some story, but Ursua asked me to reserve the story for a time when he could give it his full attention, and he took me to see the ranches he had planted under the large groves on the banks of the river. River. In that camp, he told me, were the Brazilian Indians who had come from the jungle. I don't know if I was more impressed by the Indians or by Ursua's attitude. I knew that he had waged four wars against Indian peoples, that they had prosecuted him for his cruelties, that he had left the trail of an executioner in the provinces. And there he was conversing with them as if he were speaking with kings or princes, struggling to understand their deformed and jungle Spanish, interested in their language of origin. Like other times before, he reminded me of Orellana, my old captain had that strange interest in Indian languages and spent entire afternoons learning words, finding equivalents. The meeting was brief, but Ursua assured me that he would take them on the expedition, and I was pleased to hear that. Many questions I wanted to ask those solitary travelers who were my secret brothers, they had lived, in reverse, the path that I suffered in the fevers of my adolescence. And the truth is that I could not wait until the beginning of the trip, one day I returned to the region on my own, accompanied by an interpreter, and I went along the banks to the village where we had seen them. 
I did not tell Ursua what I learned, and it was perhaps the only secret I had for him. It was a truth for myself and one of the most revealing I have ever received. When I had the two Brazilian Indians before me, I asked my interpreter to tell them that I had passed through their land in a ship many years before. The way they reacted was strange. One approached, looked at my face, touched my beard, touched my hair that fell to my shoulders. Then, as if weighing his words, he said something to my interpreter, raising his arms. He wants to know what the canoe you were in was like. Tell him it was a big ship, with sails of colors, and that at his side was another also with candles, and that they were followed by canoes. He wants to know where they got the boat they came down from the mountains in. Tell him we built it ourselves on the river bank. That we came by land from the mountains but that the jungle was closed and, since we could not go back, we made the boat. The Indian looked at me with wide eyes. He spoke animatedly to the other, explained some things to him, and they seemed to be talking about something that greatly disturbed them. He says that they, hidden from the shore, they saw the two boats go down. That after losing them, they spent days and days waiting, to see if others would pass by. That they talked to other peoples in the jungle, and that there were many different explanations for what they had seen. I asked why the passage of some travelers called their attention so much, and only later did I notice my clumsiness. Sailing ships were familiar shapes to me from childhood, but those children of the jungle had never seen such an object. After digging in the memory of each one, and in their songs, which are the memory of generations, and in their dreams, which are the memory of trees and birds, they found nothing that resembled that. It was the strangest thing that had ever passed along the edge of the jungle, and everyone began to wonder what was up there, up there, at the root of the rivers, on the imperturbable face of the mountains. For me it was a flash of lightning to understand that our passage, fifteen years ago, had disturbed the hitherto invariable life of those settlers. All the inhabitants of the shore had seen our boats pass down the river. Some went out to receive and honor the travelers, no doubt believing them to be magical or sacred beings, others dismissed them with clouds of arrows. But others made incantations and prayers, the evidence that a house or temple descended through the rivers of the mountain range had an effect similar to the one that the news that there was an immense country of cinnamon growers had on us. And just as we put together a delirious expedition, those ten thousand men left their homes to look in the mountains, at the source where the rivers are born, the nest of the demons or of the gods, the factory of the proud brigantines, the furnaces, or the storms where we came from. The Indians looked battered by life, their primitive copper color fainted by an unhealthy pallor, faces that revealed great suffering, eyes that had seen terrible things. And yet there was evidence in them that they were fulfilling an inescapable mission. I felt reverence. In the priests of our church I never had such a clear feeling of witnessing a sacred destiny. These were the natives of the jungles who years before had seen some boats pass by, and after seeing them disappear downstream, they turned their eyes to the west and wondered where those floating objects, full of unknown beings, coming down the river came from. These were the men who, after ruminating for many months on the meaning of that apparition, could not bear the uncertainty and sleeplessness, and assembled boats to launch themselves into the adventure. They were the ones who climbed up the mighty back of the serpent until they saw the mountains appear. One of the very few survivors of the crowd that set off in canoes and pirogues, looking for the secret that lay in the peaks. Taller adventurers than us, not the greed had moved, but only the need to clarify an enigma. Suddenly I felt responsible for them being here, so far from their jungles and their gods. I was the secret that caused thousands of them to have died exhausted in a struggle with the waters that go down the box steps. They were also victims of Pizarro, Orellana, and their men, among whom I counted myself. For anyone who has witnessed it from the outside that was just a small casual dialogue, but for me it was definitive for many reasons. The loneliness that trip had left me, having lived for months at the mercy of the river, its inexorable and growing bed, its turtle eggs, its indecipherable screams, its pink dolphins, 
its water snakes, its showers of arrows, its warrior women, their mysterious smoke, everything made me feel closer to these men of clay than to my Spaniards. We were veterans of the river and we were marked by him, we had listened to his story and we had complied with his will. For that alone we were alive, the life we had was a concession from the great river, on one of whose remote tributaries we now found ourselves. I promised myself that the time would come to share those feelings with them, although the implacable time does not allow the past to be invoked without the future coming to impose its laws and its whims. Nor does the river, which has always existed, know how to remain identical in its being, but rehearses its transformations without ceasing. Maybe that's why I didn't even try to tell Ursua. I felt that he would not understand what moved me about that story. For him, the Brazilian Indians were signs of what he imagined of the jungle. Those drums that we had heard on both sides of the river, in the dark, were the evidence of immense populations, of the cities that were hidden behind. That crowd of 10,000 Indians in canoes spoke of industrious and enormous kingdoms, and their eagerness to know what was hidden in the mountains was not for him a proof of curiosity and astonishment but a sign of the need of those peoples for protect your treasures. There the preparations for the trip began again. The mountain. The tall vicunas are carrying their bundle. Gold to the mountain. The mountain is so hard and so high that. No one can ever touch it. The old woman passes by with her silver knife. The old woman passes by with her knife. Emerald. Sometimes the gentlemen leave a bag. Full of seashells. Right at the foot of the road where they go. The tired vicunas. This was all invented long ago. Lives, when you were a child. And every time you look up, it's not the sky what you're seeing. But the memory of what you saw. When you haven't seen the pain. When you had not yet seen the fury. When the words were blue and the skin was water and the heart was as good as the trees. 13. Omega is a word that I knew. Omega is a word that I have known since our trip with Orellana, but where the Brazilian Indian said Omega, Ursua understood El Dorado. He began to mention those two words together, and very soon the viceroy, who could not offer him any more resources, finally made him a solemn appointment. Appointed by royal decree governor of Omega and El Dorado, before those provinces appeared, Ursua received sufficient powers to recruit men, discover lands, populate cities, appoint officials, collect tributes and rewards on his own account, appropriate everything that his conquests gave him, reserving the fifths of the king, and permission to continue discovering and populating, populating and discovering the immense kingdoms of the river, founding his lineage, preparing for his descendants, without a doubt, a marquisite like those that had already been granted in the Indies more than once by the magnificence of the kings of Spain. At the beginning of 1559 the day was solemnly published, and Ursua assumed his work with more energy than ever. We traveled along the eastern slopes of the mountain range to decide the region where the soldiers would be concentrated, the place from where we would undertake the journey. There were months to go, but one of the first decisions was to order the ships, and Ursua spent many days finding out what rivers we would find, calculating the style and dimensions of the ships based on the demands of navigation. There he began his search for carpenters and cockers, officers, and expert ship owners. Soon he had gathered 25 officers and 12 black carpenters, and with them he began the acquisition of wood, tools, and nails. Also seriously stockpiling supplies and weapons. He talked tirelessly with Spanish veterans and with Indians, and when he thought he was sure of the route, he chose the Modi Lones province, where the Brazilian Indians arrived, as the right place to start the expedition. On the banks of the Modi Lones River there was already a hamlet called Santa Cruz de Capocoria, settled long ago by Captain Pedro Ramiro. On that bank the governor installed the workshops for the assembly of the brigantines and the flats in which the men, horses, provisions and weapons of the trip would be distributed. He left experts and officers working under the guidance of Master Juan Corzo, 
whom he appointed chief master, and to ensure the fidelity of that enclave he considered it appropriate to appoint Pedro Ramiro himself, who was already Chief Justice of Santa Cruz, as Lieutenant General of the expedition. He then returned to Peru, and undertook his final campaign through the haciendas of the encomenderos, to collect the money for the company. He had in his hand the list of those who had received him with enthusiasm, who had been delighted with his stories and had hosted him in their stone mansions. Now he was not going to tell them gallant stories or to decorate the hacienda parties but to reap the fruits of his previous campaign. Then the encomenderos began to allege difficulties in providing everything that Ursua expected. Before, their eyes lit up at the description of that planned trip, the boats, the horses, the hundreds of soldiers, the thousands of Indians. Now the soldiers began to seem too many, the horses excessive, the ships costly. They remained convinced of the need for the enterprise but were quick to demand that it not be too ambitious, too ostentatious. Any conquest expedition required sacrifices, they themselves were veterans of many campaigns. With what difficulty they had had to make their way through horrible mountain ranges, through poisonous forests, through treacherous seas. Ursua explained calmly that he was Programming the trip with the greatest austerity, the ships were essential, the soldiers had to be well fed and well armed, the horses would face difficult lands. He would not take as many dogs as to the country of the Chitareros, less than the 2,000 that Pizarro had when he went out to look for cinnamon, but he had to take dogs. And the bills for the pigs, the wheat, the grains, the tools came. Undoubtedly the least expensive would be the Indians, but without Indians no campaign was impossible, because they were guides in the mountain passes and connoisseurs of plants and animals, and also because they knew the languages and would help in contact with the native peoples, since it was necessary not to wear yourself out in endless battles. After three months of visits and trips, what Ursua had collected was far less than he had anticipated, but enough to pay for the first jobs. The governor knew that he could not compete with that previous expedition that had had all the resources imaginable. He returned humble to the shadow of the viceroy, and he promised to give him double what they had agreed. But the viceroy's priority now was to improve his relations with the crown. The production of the mines and all the usable wealth had to be converted into shipments that would satisfy the kings for months on end, convinced that they had efficient officials in the Indies, vigilant defenders of the royal house. And the viceroy had to save something for himself. Himself, thinking about his own future, already taught that nothing is certain in the world, because when one is not physically present in the councils of Seville and Valladolid it is easy to lose the esteem of his protectors. The experience had just taught him a bitter truth, that even being a viceroy and a relative of half the court, it was easy to become a ghost in the Indies. So although Ursua's resources. They grew a little, they were very far from what their expedition required. Life had become hard for the traveler since when not only riches but promises became scarce. We were already a quarter of a century after the arrival in Peru of the first conquerors, and things had changed a lot. The men of the beginning seized. Chambers of the lavish dead, fortresses. Laminated with gold, rotten mummies stripped of even the last chagwala, but now the wealth was out of sight, there were no temples with relics or jeweled Indians to strip of necklaces, bracelets, and pectorals. Much wealth remained, but it had to be plucked with sweat and with iron from the depths of the earth, from the silver ribs of the mountain. Years ago, when the emperor proclaimed the new laws to protect Indians from extermination, curses were heard throughout the mountain range, because the time had begun when the only lasting wealth was to have Indians who stooped cultivating the fertile terraces and extracting metals from the ungrateful and parched land, in a world of cliffs and of glaciers that the Incas looked at with veneration and the conquerors with a mixture of avidity and fear. We wouldn't have gone out looking for cinnamon if still dead in their golden chairs with plumes of feathers and withered ceremonial robes, if the luminous walls were still in sight, the temples with silver moons, the trees with golden voices. And if the encomenderos were enthusiastic about the mirage of this new expedition, 
it was because they could no longer have so many willing Indians to work in the mines. Once the viceregal license was received to go in search of the Golden City, and fulfill the task of recognizing and conquering for their majesties the kingdom of the Amazons, the work of recruiting soldiers from among the vagabonds that filled the cities of Peru, who were many and bad, and that they had been the main sustenance of the rebel armies that Lagasca defeated. Ursua believed that the viceroy was supporting only his expedition, but he began to see with strangeness that at the same time sent troops in various directions, as if the threat of losing the viceroyalty had convinced him of the need to extend his domains, leaving no stone unturned, no rock unclimbed, no point of the star of the winds unexplored in the crazy and urgent task of covering the territory and obtaining new wealth to distribute, to increase the income of the viceroyalty, to increase the tribute brought to their bellicose majesties by the fleet of great galleons that every so often sprouted from the sea followed by a courtship of warships, and pursued, alas, by a pack of hostile frigates. I remember how he had investigated the situation in the Indies since the time they were pacified by Lagasca. And I was a witness that, since his appointment, he wrote a long letter to King Felipe, to tell him that the main problem in Peru was the number of idle men who accumulated in the cities. There were 8,000 conquest men, and only a thousand of them had property titles. The others had been staying in the Indies despite the fact that there were no longer any large expeditions, population campaigns, bureaucratic positions, or employment in the encomiendas, where there was only work, of course without pay, for Indians, and Indians. Slaves. He understood that the expedition that Ursua adorned with gallant gestures was a resource. Savior to get rid of adventurers. Noxious that disturbed the kingdom. If they have so much energy for evil, I heard him say one day, let them face the river and the jungle, there they will find where to waste their rebellious spirit. The viceroy was only worried about the men of Spain that converged on the new lands like the sowing of winds, he had no time to wonder what world this was that now gave him its gold and its greatness, what mysteries lay among the charred stones of the kingdom. And it is true that night falls before we have deciphered the lines of our hand. Kipus. The white rope is the village. The colored ropes families. Your family color is red. From the first knot hangs the story of your dad. Your story hangs on the fourth knot. The color of your rope is green. The first string is your years. If you only have an inch, you're dead. Before the age of ten. The cycle of the alpaca. If you have seven you have lived all your time. The second string is your functions. From the green knot will come the story of your. I work in the field. From the blue knot your function in the rights. From the red knot your inventions. The white rope of the red knot. We'll talk about songs. In the first section of work, in the. Second of memories, in the. Third of your love, in the fourth of suffering. None of this is true, it's just a figure as possible. Knots and ropes and an order are enough. Defined to represent all things. The drawings of fog, the nuances of thinking, progress. Of the poison in the blood, the songs of the crescent moon. 14. The successive rebellions of Gonzalo Pizarro and Francisco Hernandez Duran. The successive rebellions of Gonzalo Pizarro and Francisco Hernandez Duran had dragged down numerous men, caused many deaths and left a bitter memory in the crown. From the court they were already beginning to see the Indies as a source of conflict rather than as a source of wealth. That is why one of the Marquis' objectives was to set up expeditions to different corners of the Viceroyalty, seeking to find new riches and dominate territories, but above all, as I have said, free Lima and Cusico from dangerous men. This is how the expedition of 1557 to the eastern regions was put together, which did not have as much resonance as ours, but which founded populations that soon became prosperous and powerful. And even before the Omegua campaign, the Marquis' own son set out to occupy the governorship of Chile, 
and led a powerful army to defeat the Araucanian rebels. I would have to transfer myself for a moment to the same ship in which we came from Spain, with the Marquis and his court, to realize how many things were taking place on that deck. One of the most memorable events of the trip was the death in the middle of the ocean of the young Captain Geronimo Alderete, who had been appointed governor of Chile. From the moment the boy lost his breath and died on the high seas, when the shadow of misfortune and mourning covered our faces, the Marquis decided that his own son would assume that governorship of the southern lands. Among the court officials who came with the new viceroy, there was one on the ship whom I almost did not meet because he was reserved and perhaps too proud, but who I later got to know better at the Lima court. He had been a page to Prince Philip since he was a child, and he had a passion for letters. His name was Alonso de Ursula, and I have heard from him again because he has just published a poem in Madrid in which he sings about the Araucanian wars in which he was a part for two years. He participated in the advances against the indomitable Indians, and he not only met those characters who have become legend, Copalican and Lotero, great and courageous native chiefs who were defeated by our troops, but he also made them the heroes of his epic. If Castellanos later decided to sing in Handeca syllables and in real octaves the voyages of Columbus, the Caribbean campaigns, Garay's advance on Jamaica, the conquest of Barinquin by Ponce de Leon, the conquest of Venezuela by the Germans, the Ortal, and Sedano's journey through the mysterious waters that spill into the Gulf of Trinidad, the Sinu Wars, Robledo's campaign through the Cauca Canyon, Jimenez de Quesada's journey with his men through the Alligator River, the date rise of Lugo, the voyages of Andagoya through the Pizarro Sea, the advances of Bilal Khazar and Fetterman, the attacks of the French pirates and even our adventure under the command of Orellana through the Amazon River, it is because having known the poem of Ursula it was said that all these facts deserve to endure not only in the chronicles but also in the music of the language of the songs that Castellanos has composed. None moves me as much as the one he wrote to recount Ursua's journey, and the fate of the poor lovers through the jungle, abandoned by providence and suddenly surrounded by insubordination and madness. Perhaps I will include some of those stanzas later in this story, but I want to tell first how the campaign was organized, and the difficulties in obtaining the resources, which were nothing, although we see it, compared to the difficulties that came later. If King Philip himself and his insatiable court complained of scarce funds, what could not adventurers say in these confused overseas campaigns? Ursua wandered through dens and markets, already in the The Panamanian campaign had been trained to hang out with crooks and rioters. They would not be the most docile soldiers but they were resistant, hard for work, brutal with the enemy, made in the open and hard bread. It was said that lovers of comfort are not good adventurers nor do they know how to solve the serious problems of the struggle with the world, better to walk with strong devils than with delicate princes. I was amazed to hear you say these things. Because the only one who looked like a prince in those throngs was himself, the only one who gave the impression of being refined and fragile. But it was his appearance that was deceptive, and his always jovial gallant figure helped conceive the campaign as a joyful march, full of comforting tricks and satisfying rewards. I knew it well, at the time of black rain and spurting blood, no one was more resistant or ruder, more savage in combat or more brutal in revenge. Many days he was interviewing and hooking men. From the disagreements of Pizarro and Almagro until the pacification of La Gasca, the residual meat of the armies was left behind, without glory and without reward. And since it is customary in this conquest that at the end of each war the adversaries are better rewarded than the allies, to ensure future loyalties, the example of La Gasca, who gave coins to the faithful defenders of the crown and ingots to the who rose against it, was later followed by other rulers, including, of course, the Marquis of Cainte. Men escaping from prisons in Spain found a way to infiltrate the ships, and came to seek glory with knives. One of the viceroy's old advisers said one day, undoubtedly exasperated by the revolts, that four classes of men arrived in the Indies. There were sick people, there were crazy people, there were monsters and there were demons. Of course he was exaggerating, 
but to verify that he wasn't lying, it was enough to walk through the alleys and squares, the convents did not always have better people than the brothels, and Ursua was not looking for good manners or gallant finesse, but strength and recklessness, brutality and cold blood. I did not quite understand at what time my life had passed from the study of Oviedo in Hispaniola, from the cabinets of Cardinal Bimbo in Rome, from the dialogues with Theophrastus in the inns of the Alps and from my office as a clerk in the salons of Spain, among chroniclers, lawyers, and scribes, to fall again into the tumult of the desperate. I feel that destiny was calling me blindly. Erasing the side roads, and I had to continue to the end, I couldn't find a way to turn back, to go back to the viceroy's house and ask him to allow me to continue at his side in government offices, or to help me return to the court clerks. I continued to believe that Ursua needed me, that my experience might be of use to him, I closed my eyes to the evidence that Ursua, still dashing and loquacious, was becoming the leader of a troop of rough Ians, just when for the first time I had the path free to follow the golden trail of that dream that had been growing in him until it reached mythological dimensions. We returned to the coastal towns, from Pyra and Peta to the beaches of Huan Chaco, and Ursua reviewed his list of encomenderos whom he had to visit, now definitively, in the Trujillo region. Gannets. The sea releases words that flap wings. White. White words flying over. Dark rippling words. Words that are nailed from the sky. That break the scales of the water. And emerge foamy carrying in the. Spikes. Shocking new words. Bleeding. 15. One afternoon, in Trujillo. While Ursua rode. Near the aqueduct. One afternoon in Trujillo, while Ursua was riding near the aqueduct, a luxurious procession crossed the cobbled street. From a sedan chair, carried by slaves, someone asked to be called, and when Ursua approached, the voice of a woman hidden in the shadows told him. How are you, Captain? I appreciate your visit. A few months ago. It was Ines de Atenza. I hadn't forgotten her. Because he felt a mixture of anger and relief, but above all he felt the change in attitude. Now she was not dealing with the viceroy or with one of his envoys, but with himself, and suddenly Ursua could not believe that such a beauty had gone unnoticed the first day. He looked at her oblique eyes, her marked eyebrows, her dark and shiny hair, the Indian hair bordering the singularly beautiful face, with high cheekbones, where red and tempting lips trembled. He saw the neck in the dark hair, the long hands emerging from the silk sleeves, the breasts almost hidden under the twine. For the first time in his life he didn't know what to answer, and she walked away waving her hand while the night stood stunned in the sun, in the corrosive wind of the coast. That night he seemed sick. All the apparent rancor of a few months ago had revealed his true condition. He didn't know what to do to see her again, he wanted to console her for the death of her husband, he wanted to promise her that he would protect her, to swear the friendship of the viceroy and all his troops. It was such an intense need that he now felt more concern and concern for her than he had felt for the expedition in all the previous days. He would have wanted to see her right away, even if she was once again that hateful power that had despised him at the beginning and looked at him indifferently from her inscrutable face of Inca stone. Not eight days had passed and Ursua was already in that woman's bed. Protected by the immunity that being the viceroy's emissary gave him, he decided to visit her at her home. She gave the necessary orders to the servants, and gave herself up with the same eagerness, she, too, had been thinking of him long before she found him next to the aqueduct that her father, Blas de Atenza, had built so that water lotuses would flourish on the parched shores. There was not the ghost of the father nor the Ghost of dead husband now they loved each other. Frantically in her bedroom, in the rooms, in the steam baths, it cost them inordinate effort to separate again. He began to visit her every day, he always found an excuse to cancel the appointments he had with the encomenderos and the commitments with his soldiers, he seemed not to think that he had to return to Lima or Santa Cruz, where many people were waiting for the start of the expedition. In the case of Ines, the rumors were immediate, 
due to the proximity of mourning, debauchery, envy, but she felt that Ursua was the relief that the viceroy had sent to her widowhood, the only possible consolation for an ardent woman. And a young woman who had suddenly found herself stripped of her husband and abandoned in a huge house, in a country of wars where she only had discord throbbing in her blood. They tried to meet discreetly, so that the walls of the neighborhood wouldn't hear too much, but soon no one ignored that Ursua and Ines de Atenza breathed for each other. Ines could not believe that he had been to Peru when she was a child. He liked to do accounts. You were six years old when I was born, he told her, and if you arrived in Peru when you were seventeen, I could have known you since I was eleven years old. They had almost met, because Viceroy Blasco Núñez de Vila passed by that house in Trujillo precisely when the girl was that age, and she remembered the boys who came with the old white-bearded Viceroy. But you were not among them, I would not have forgotten you. Ursua had never been able to see the Viceroy, but... He had arrived in the Indies with some of the boys of his court. He remembered, or thought he remembered, that Lorenzo de Cepeda y Ahumada, the friend with whom he had crossed Spain to Seville, and who had seen at his side some vague stone bowls of antiquity in the Sierra de Gritas, had spoken to him later in Lima of a little princess they had met with the viceroy. Perhaps she was inventing that memory, but she liked being in Ursua's memory from years ago. She counted on her fingers, so, when my father died in 1546, you were already governor in Santaf, she told him. He frowned and reproached her, and when I founded Pamplona, the new one, in the land of the Chitareros, you were already marrying someone else. Your fault, she would reply, for not showing up on time. You thought it more important to fight wars in the country of emeralds than to come looking for me, even though you already knew of my existence. And they prolonged their meetings, spacing the kisses with stories of the early days. He asked her to tell him about his king grandparents, when the world was of the sun and the moon, of rivers where snakes reigned and of condors that walked through the sky. It was hard for him to believe that she was of Atahualpa's lineage, and it was hard for me to believe it when he told me. For me, these figures belonged to the story of a dead kingdom, whose golden fortresses I had revered in my childhood, and it is always incredible to see with one's own eyes the vestiges of a legend. He in turn told her about his adventures from the early taverns of San Sebastián. She liked stripping naked and stroking his chest full of old arrow and spear marks. The way he invented in the midst of the games of love to participate in those old wars was to look at and touch the scars of his battles. He caressed the imprint of a muso spear on his thigh, on his left shoulder the mark left by a Tehrana arrow, amplified by the tear left by the arrow a day later, when it was yanked out. She kissed each scar as he told her how he had obtained it, and then she talked about her father, the Encomendero, about the aqueduct he had built, about her lost mother who protected her at night, and she went back to talking about her grandparents, the Lord's Incas, from Huayna Capac to the great Pishakyotec, while he ran his lips over her blouse and lowered the edge with his teeth so that the firm breasts with ingrown nipples appeared. It was enough for him to touch those rigid nipples with his lips and she shivered as if a sudden wind had blown through the window. He, who had always been urgent and unconcerned about anything other than frantic copulation, lingered with her in hugs, gropes and withdrawals. He didn't seem to want the advance of his hand over her smooth belly to the mound of sleeping hair to end, delighting in waiting for the moment when an insignificant touch would awaken in her one of those spasms that made her moan. And if I know it, it's because at the beginning it wasn't enough for Ursua to live it, he had to go out and tell it, and I was the recipient of his confessions. It must be that I had already bewitched you since the first day, I told him jokingly, and he took it as a joke too. But it's not a lie that since when did she? Made visible to his eyes, Ursua's luck began to stubbornly drift in a new direction. He had started by not seeing her and very soon he would only have eyes for her. It was the clearest indication of how Ursua was only capable of giving himself over to a single obsession at a time, and of how passions fought in his soul. Love Song A few brief moments in the region more. Pretty. In the glowing shadow of her arms. 
in the forest of loves of his chest. Haunted. And centuries in the jar of the earth. Thirsty. A few hours looking at the truth in their eyes. In the abyss of their eyes where they look at you. The stars. And then the millennia. In the greedy prison of the earth. Thirsty. One night drinking with pupils. Anxious. Its sky constellated with legends and riddles. And ages after ages in the jungle of absences. In the ice of oblivion, in the well of debris. In the never never of the thirsty land. 16. I have never seen him so happy. I never saw him so happy, so in love, I never knew him so sure. But beneath that certainty were the impatience and nervousness of someone who has seen the bird of fortune escape from their hands many times and can't quite believe that they have finally caught it. He already had more than a hundred men camping in the port of Santa Cruz, in Hualagas, where the boats were being made, and he was eloquent, smiling, more handsome and gallant than ever. He walked through the busy streets and people opened up to him, we were certain that we were looking at the favorite of fortune, a captain who would soon be more famous than the Marquis Pizarro and Cortez, the foresighted conqueror of New Spain. Ursua was not a rustic like Pizarro, suckled by a sow, raised to notoriety for his brutalities, nor a warrior devastated by intrigues and strategy, but a knight full of merits, protected by thrones and dominations, privileged by the eloquence and the gift of command, financed by great lords, and finally haloed with that enviable halo that is the love of a beautiful woman. Suddenly, he seemed to forget the expedition, the viceroy, his large debts, and even the sinuous jungle city that was his delirium. The beautiful Ines seemed to be enough of a treasure, with that face that had something of the intensity of the Moors but also the indecipherable distance of the Indian faces, with those big and deep eyes, the spontaneous smile drawn on her face, and the body full of secrets and promises, exhaling a perfume of flowers. Because fate plays with us. Never. Ursua had been in better condition to undertake an adventure, more vigorous, more master of his will and his language, and never, however, did he begin to feel so far from the desire to travel, to start war campaigns, to ride chasing after dreams. The mountains. When everything from the outside, the will of the viceroy, the confidence of the encomenderos, the resources, converged so that his expedition would make its way, at that precise moment something in his heart held him back and would no longer even allow him to gloat imagining the imminent conquest. When he already felt at the gates of the treasure. Dreamed of for years, a more immediate treasure and. Delightful had wrapped him in his nets, and if Juan de Castellanos were still by his side, perhaps the poet would have said that war and love were vying for Ursua's heart, and that being equally powerful divinities, it was understandable that the, the result was an invincible immobility. For a time he allowed himself to be happy, to walk with his mestiza as if intoxicated, to ride through the mountains with her, followed by trusted troops, because Peru was still a land under conquest, and from time to time riots, fires, assaults, they remembered that those were alien kingdoms, where power was maintained by force and where it was not convenient to be careless. The resources that Ursua had collected were all invested, but Ines's rich hacienda allowed them to abandon themselves day after day to love and dreams. After the walks, the banquets, after the banquets, the long siestas, and from the siestas they passed to the steam baths, from the baths to evenings of cooing, from there to dinners already veiled with fire and music, to end in the long hugs that began to your sleepless nights. And I can understand why Ursua abandoned. So to pleasures, because never in his life, since his childhood in Navarre, had he been allowed to live so carelessly and so little vigilantly. It was as if the soldier had died on those beds and tables, and only a lover and a child, eager for whispers and games, remained. How long could that life last? Ursua sometimes wondered about it, and, knowing that life had to go on, he took advantage of the time, a few more days, he told himself, no worries. He justified himself by saying that meanwhile there was no negligence because the ships were already being built, 
but the ships were beginning to rot in inaction along the eastern rivers, that in Hualagas they were stockpiling food, but the food was already being damaged in the warehouses, that the soldiers would already be arriving, but the soldiers had been waiting for many days for that boss who never appeared, and soldiers not only have to be paid when they are on the march, they have to be supported while they wait, given them some trade, or even a hobby, so that your imagination and your energy are not filled with idle fumes. Every day in the stately home of Trujillo seemed to repeat the previous one and prefigure the following, they were conceived so that time would lose its urgency and sharpness, so that no one would feel how the moon filled or thinned in the sea in the distance over the beaches of Juan Chaco, and Ines herself, so mistress of her world, that she never neglected her affairs, tried to delay the warrior and make things easier so that time would not be felt, so that the urgency would not come to spoil the hours of happiness, so that the demands of the world would not interrupt too soon his embrace. The servants, Spanish, and Indians, who they worked in the house, they were still busy in prevent the lords from feeling any urgency, and it did not even seem to be remembered that the outside world existed, when messengers began to arrive looking for Pedro de Ursua. The viceroy was among the first to know that the captain was neglecting his campaign. He received reports of fights and disorders in the camps where the soldiers were concentrated, and when he inquired in more detail, he learned that they were commanded by improvised chiefs, because Captain Ursua had not even named field marshals or flag bearers, and the structure and troop discipline was strangely relaxed. With the feeling that in Trujillo I was left over, I had returned to Lima, determined to wait for the captain to come back to and give me instructions for the campaign. One day the viceroy called me into his office and asked me about Ursua, not only because he knew of our friendship but because he had found out that instead of returning to Spain, as initially planned, after being accompanied on his arrival as viceroy in the Indies, I had decided to travel with Ursua to the jungle. I don't understand your change of course, he told me. In Spain you refused with abundant arguments to accompany me to Peru, and you spoke of your abomination for the jungle, now I see you determined to enter the same tangle that was hell just five years ago. I replied that now gratitude to that man compromised my loyalty, and that accompanied was also a way of serving the crown. The viceroy then spoke of Ursua's delay in undertaking his campaign. I tried to protect him, and told him that Ursua was getting ready to leave. He is only collecting the last resources, what the encomenderos from Trujillo and Peta promised him, and I think he will be back soon. I immediately sent a message to Trujillo, naively believing it was the first. I did not know that the messengers arrived, first every week, then every five days, now every three, at the house of Ines de Atenza, and that the messages accumulated in a way that might seem alarming to someone with less self-confidence than Pedro. Of Ursua. He kept telling himself that it was good to rest and get prepared. The journey would be rough and the roads dreadful. The joy of now would be unrecoverable for many months. But he was sure that starting the campaign depended only on his will. They'll see when it arrives, he must have thought. It will suffice to give the order and we will begin a journey that the kingdoms will remember. He didn't realize it, but something was beginning to waver on earth or heaven. Even his need to stay with Ines, how much it cost him to get rid of her, was like an indication that something in him resisted his own adventure. Adverse things began to be said in the neighborhood of the powers of Lima, the rumors. They ran with new vigor through the city of Trujillo, and in Ines' own house the apparent happiness of the day seemed like a tighter and tighter rope that was going to break at one of its points. Something had to happen, something had to break the crystal of that spell. One day, Ursua finally saw the number of messages that had been piled up on the big black table, and noticed the frequency of the calls, the silence of the servants, something in Ines's behavior. Some shock in his love life, some claim on another subject, reminded him of the debts acquired, the people hired, the ships commissioned months ago, everything he had neglected in the cares of love. However peaceful the garden, sooner or later, 
early enters the snake. Ines herself woke up one day with the anthem of reality on her lips, and Ursua remembered that he was a conqueror, a man in need of riches. She couldn't keep showing her mestiza her own house all over paradise, because the refuge of love would end up looking like a prison. She, who did not intend to break the magic. He regretted having mentioned his duties to her, but Ursua felt that he was waking up from a dream. He realized that he now needed the jungle kingdom for more compelling reasons, he had to lay it at the feet of this woman. The fabulous country of Omegua, the kingdom of the Amazons, the incalculable treasure of the hidden city of El Dorado did not yet exist, but they already had their queen. Mano. The city already knows you're coming. Hey bang your hammers to the shore. From the river. Feel the sweat of slaves falling on. Water. Hear the voice of the town crier announcing your name. The birds told him with a cry. Yellow. The antennas of the ants. A woman on its high walls. Look on a gold plate. Another prepares the stone knife of the that has never been cleaned. Blood. The city is patient and waits, it does. Wave its tail in the pond. And if the oarsman wields his golden oar, it is because that canoe may be your grave. Motionless women feel shine. The eyes of the shamans. A red butterfly watches over the dream of the jaguar. The city has waited for you like the snake waits for the rabbit. Is full of eyes and ears. A strong tree will sprout from your chest. You were born to feed their birds. 17. First it was Ursua who. He asked me to go with him. First, it was Ursua who asked her to go with him to Lima, to respond to the Viceroy's call and to attend to the claims of his men, and she began by refusing, saying that it was better that he attend to his affairs and that she was also not sure of being well received at court. We have to go to Lima, Ursua told him. Even for a short time, to attend to pending issues. You know that the women of the Encomenderos hate me, she said. They rather envy you, said Ursua, but it's also already been decided that you'll be my wife, and it's better that people, even in the Viceroy's court, get used to the idea of seeing us together. In part he was right. To the Viceroy, encouraged by seeing him appear, he would not be bothered by that romance that seemed to put an end to the mourning of the offended woman and close to the affections of the viceregal house. Dissipating the first cloud that had formed under his rule. Ursua went, then, with Ines to the city of Kings of Lima, and the viceroy took advantage of the occasion to invite them to his house and offer a welcome dinner, which was actually a discreet banquet of reparation. Everything happened in a ceremonious and peaceful way, and there was no mention of the tragic event that they had experienced months before. The dead husband was buried in the mist, and there was no mention of the homicidal nephew or the punishment he had received. She only seemed to have eyes and ears for Ursua, who displayed her charms, her memory of thousands of exploits, and mentioned with renewed enthusiasm the preparations for the trip. What they did not expect and loved. Gentlemen was that Ines wasted simplicity and courtesy. They discovered that she was used to the stately life, although she tried to keep her distance, because she knew well that the first passion she used to arouse was envy. The ladies, on the other hand, did not appreciate it. Because his cinnamon skin, his long and abundant black hair, the wide cheekbones of the royal family, recounted his origin. She's an Indian, I heard Dona Teresa, the viceroy's wife, say one afternoon. You're wrong, replied the Marquis, she is the daughter of Blas de Atenza, who was in Comendero and trusted man of Viceroy Blasco Núñez de Vila, and has inherited a fortune from him. But his mother had no name, she replied, and the captain should find a woman who suits him better. The Indians also distrusted Inés, them. She seemed too arrogant too distant to truly belong to his race. She was a rich woman, that is to say, free and alone, and that was not common in the city or in the kingdom. The early death of her father, 
since she did not know about her mother, as the rumors said, nobody ever does anything, and the confused death of her husband, had left her without direction and without restraint. And other people in the Viceroy's own house also murmured spitefully, she's a whore. Maybe everything is directed. Sometimes I think that even without the embassy of apologies that the Viceroy entrusted to Ursua, they would have met anyway, it was difficult for this luxurious female not to end up in the arms of Pedro de Ursua, the most valued male in energy and command of the entire kingdom, whom everyone admired in his Hidalgo garments, his long knee-high boots for walking along the cobblestones of Lima, his linen shirts and jackets, his silver necklaces, his black alpaca ruanas and his hat. Of a hunter that he used to wear when he did not have on his head the crested helmet of the conqueror, with that natural stamp contradicted or improved by the traces of war. It was splendid to see them both, beautiful and ostentatious of their fortune, strolling through the squares of the luxurious city that was growing, looking together at the sea from the parched ravines, or, when they were apart, constantly looking for each other with their eyes in the midst of the piles of the cathedral. He would have abandoned himself to delight, but just as some of us watched his adventures with joy, many in Lima continued to see badly that relationship that had not been blessed by the church, the viceroy's wife crossed herself more and more often, to warn her husband that he had to beware of similar aberrations, the scandal formed clouds under the sky of the city, and sometimes the lovers preferred to go out, each one on their own, to meet in remote and safe places, to be able to love each other as they pleased. There was no lack of safe crags before immense landscapes, forests with streams, high mountain passes where, after leaving the vigilant guard, they could be together under the sole gaze of snow peaks. The waiting and the delays had reached the extreme. It seemed to me that Ines had known how to overcome her amorous fever, that she had finally understood that it was the governor's duty to go on an adventure and to go to war, and that she was determined to wait as long as necessary but it didn't happen that way. Though she was the one who had reminded him of the duty and had awakened him to the need to finally start his departure, she soon realized that she was unable to bear his absence, and one afternoon, after a long and tense silence, she asked him to take her. He, who had already thought about it and had rejected, he was startled by the proposal. He told her with conviction that that would be crazy. I will feel much calmer if I know that you are in Trujillo, preparing our future. Your memory will make it easier for me, and more urgent, to discover and conquer, to succeed and return. But she found more and more arguments. It will be many months of travel, my presence could help you advance through the jungles, for you it will be better to rest in my arms from the tasks of command and navigation. Someone, perhaps Ursua's own cousin. Diaz de Alz, who came with him from Navarra and accompanied him day after day in the new kingdom of Granada, had told Ines de Zibali, the Indian lover that Ursua had in Santef. Because also to his cousin like to me, in the midst of his lively stories, Ursua spoke of the devotion of that beautiful Indian woman who prayed to him when embarking on her campaigns, who put dried frogs and bundles of herbs and bewitched stones in her saddlebags, who perfumed his bed of wild leaves, and that he knew how to love like squirrels and like salamanders. Perhaps Ines really wanted to accompany him and comfort him, but he was also afraid that Ursua find some other consolation along the way. He went to great lengths to convince her to stay, but it was clear that he was mostly trying to convince himself. There could be no greater temptation than to go on this arduous and thankless campaign, accompanied by his goddess, and put a spark of magic and a sting of pleasure in the roughness of the advances through the jungle and the river. She was disturbed in another way by the history of warrior women. Wouldn't Ursua find the queen of the Amazons herself on her journey? Wouldn't he perhaps end up falling in love with her in the depths of the jungle? Or, even if he did not fall in love, would he not perhaps be captured like the males of the Indian villages by those greedy women, to be their male and their stud? He was careful not to say these things, but he insisted more vehemently, and Ursua refused more and more vigorously. 
he preferred to confess to her that the campaign was not as well financed as he would like, and that under these conditions he had no way of giving her the comforts she required. Brutal men, accustomed to the elements and hunger, could accommodate themselves in any way in medium-sized bricks and in flats exposed to arrows, but a woman like her could not be clad in iron like any captain of conquest. Needed proper tents, bondage. Vigilant. If her place was not the viceroyalty court, it had to be her home in Trujillo, where she was accustomed to cares and delicacies, leg of lamb baked with garlic and vinegar on beds of quinoa, tubers of all colors, sea fish sucks and seafood, where he used to take his balsamic baths, his pitchers with vapors of herbs, his thick wool rugs with drawings of the mountain, the continuous murmur of the servants in the patios, shelling ears of corn and drying seeds, and the morning bleeding of the flocks. She replied that although she was a lady, Spanish was also the daughter of natives of the mountain range, that his family had not been sitting at the harpsichord for centuries but had traveled the land, from the deserts of salt to the valleys of corn that grow under hedges of snow, that Ursua was more than she a stranger in those mountains and rivers, she would know how to show resistance in the face of hardship and, if necessary, bravery in combat and he lengthened himself in legends of his elders that he had received from the lips of the old Indian women, how the Koyas and the Mamas had tamed the mountains, fertilized the terraces, and had taught the peoples to weave and cultivate. Ursua began to feel like the founder of a lineage that industry would have from the Europeans and wisdom from the ancient Incas. It was even said that perhaps what had made the expeditions wild, and the conquests brutal and bloodthirsty, was the absence of women who would put another emphasis on contact with the native populations. But Ines warned in the last excuses of Ursua the crack through which it could leak. Definitely on the expedition. After a new silence, as if to regain strength, she suddenly turned to look at him and said, I can sell my farms. With the resources that we will obtain for them, you will have what you need for the campaign but the condition is that you take me with you. I ask for no other comfort than to accompany you, share your tent and eat from your plate if necessary, but with these resources you will be able to take me and my maidens, and you will greatly improve the conditions of the expedition. It was the shot of grace. Ursua tried to dissuade her but her arguments sounded weaker and weaker. Now not only did he have the consolation of going with her, of not abandoning her in the dangerous solitude of Trujillo, but he suddenly found the resources that would undoubtedly make his expedition triumphant. What he needed were no longer arguments but just pretexts. He soon became convinced that this was the better alternative. Passion found its way, but his practical sense also saw advantages in that promise. He himself would be in charge of selling the haciendas, although not all of them, since some reserve had to be left, and soon he felt more sure than ever of the great treasure that was waiting for him. Ines would travel as a powerful partner in the expedition. You will not regret having invested in it, he told her, your riches will be multiplied with the discovery of the kingdoms of Omegua. And, back to the coast, to fix their issues, and already as a starting point for the expedition, which would leave from the north, along the Trujillo and Shanchan route, from the mournful plains of Cajamarca and through the Cocama River Canyon, explained in detail how he had become convinced that a great city of gold was waiting for them in the mountains. Jungles. Ants. Through the sky the star through the jungle. Ant. Heed the mandates of light and. Hunger. They will never obey different laws. Through the jungle the star. Through the sky the ant. 18. I'm going to tell you how he is. World we are going to. Conquer. I am going to tell you what the world we are going to. Conquer, he said. The first thing that caught my attention was the. Story of the conquerors, who told me. Cristobal on the beaches of Panama, according to which the city of gold, Cusico, had the shape of a jaguar on the mountain. Why did a city have to look like an animal? Araman, an Indian who was my friend in the New Kingdom, told me that each region has its protector, 
and that in the middle lands the jaguar rules. Everywhere I have realized that the jaguar is the god of these peoples. When a chief is really a chief, he is either covered with a tiger skin, or has a necklace of fangs, or paints his skin with spots, and when he dances, he dances with feline movements. I remember some natives we met in the Valle de los Locos, when we founded the new Pamplona. They came painted red, twisting their bodies and looking with such ferocity that our soldiers laughed at first, feeling that they were all crazy, but I told them no, that this was a war dance, that we saw them as Indians but they they looked like jaguars. And I had not finished saying this when behind the human jaguars a shower of arrows came at us. Then one morning I heard an Indian say that in the snowy mountains is the city of the gods above. At first I thought that meant the glaciers and the frozen cliffs, but then I understood that there is a real city, another city of gold, in the shape of a condor, hidden high up in the mountains. I would have gone looking for her, but there are places only Indians can go. In Santa Marta we reached one day the first terraces of the stone cities of the Tehranas, in the Sierra Nevada that is close to the sea. They say they are cities that hear travelers coming from afar, cities that think and feel, and if those worried me, I am even more amazed by these that the Incas made here, staggering terraces on the mountain walls and carving the abyss. The height doesn't make them dizzy or the vertical paths tire them. Chewing their green jungle they can go up and up with an immense bundle on their backs, day after day, and surely only they will be able to reach that city of the condor that they have hidden in the snowdrifts and in the fog. But going through the ruins of the cities. Old, through the burned stones of Kuziko and along the banks of the rivers, I began to see the drawing of a ladder with three steps that is everywhere. You have told me that you do not know its meaning. But Castellanos taught me that here everything has meaning, that what seem like whimsical drawings are more like maps and emblems. I remembered that Zibali, a Cumanagata that I met in Santaf, always put a feather, a fang, and a bell in my backpack. At first I thought it was one of her childish witchcraft, which only managed to make me laugh, but she explained that the feather would protect me in the lands above, in the moors and in the mist, the fang in the middle lands, in the guajules and the solar forests, and the rattlesnake in the lower lands, where the caimans and the rivers are and where the heat dulls the will. It was by associating these things that I understood the meaning of the three rungs, the land below, the land in the middle, and the land above. If there is a city of gold in the shape of a condor, between the snow, and a city of gold in the form of a jaguar in the middle lands, there must be a city of gold in the form of a snake in the jungles below. Now I am convinced of it. It is the city of Manoa, which Castellanos told me about in Mompox in front of the huge trees full of iguanas. They say that only one white man has seen it and has been able to tell about it, Juan Martín de Albujar, who knew medicine and was a hostage of the Indians, who took him there to cure their king. He escaped in a canoe at night, drifting through pipes and water channels, and never knew how to account for the course he had followed. Perhaps what Castellanos told was Traveler's inventions, because he spoke of palaces, of boats whose oars had handles of gold, of golden statues of animals, as well made as the figures in the tombs, but enormous, adorning the finials of the buildings. Now I know what the Amazons protect down there. That's why they don't allow men in the region, that is why they have a kingdom only for women and abundant in riches that no living man will have seen because everyone who is allowed to see it may first receive all the pleasure in the world but later he has to lose hands and mouth so that he never tells what he says. He saw. Orellana could barely sense what they were going. Leaving behind along the banks of the river, the mysterious kingdoms beyond the villages, and I feel hints of it when they mention the sounds of the drums muffled by the jungle, the gold ornaments of the Indians who are close to the Amazons, the replicas in clay and wood that the people of the river have of the objects that they use in their hidden city. Now you know the secret, there is a city of gold in the shape of a snake in the heart of the jungle, in Tupinamba, in Omegua, in the meanders of the river or next to the interior lagoons. A sister city to those found by Hernan Cortez in Mexico, full of riches but also of frightening sacrificial altars, 
adorned with the skulls of men, a wild and terrible world that we are going to conquer for Spain, for His Majesty King Felipe and for the Holy Church. That is why the cardinals of Rome were so amazed with the story of Cristobal, the women's cities are a legend that no one could find, but here they still talk about the virgins of the sun, you also know those stories of maidens kept in the stone cities. I speak to you of more hidden things, and only one expedition like ours can find the country of Omegua, with the golden city and with the kingdom of the Amazons. That's how Ursua must have told Ines, because that's how he told me in the days before he fell in love. And if I dare to think that he mentioned the Indian Zibali, without telling her very well what relationship he had had with her, it is because I know that he liked to make her jealous and make him feel the strangeness of the worlds he had traveled. And if I dare to think that she mentioned me in her story, it is because more than once Ines told me that Ursua spoke to her about me and my adventures to give force to her affirmations. On the other hand, I'm sure he didn't mention Manoa's story to Teresa de Penelver, with whom he had liked the story of Manoa in the amorous shadow of the Saba trees in Mompox, because I know that Teresa would have disturbed Ines. Teresa existed, she was in San Taf, and she couldn't have forgotten Ursua because she had a daughter of his. He thought he had discovered the existence of the three cities, but it was I who told him about them, although only trying to counter his obsession. You always talk to me again, I told him in Panama, as if the moon had driven you crazy, about that city of gold you've raved about since you were a child, a golden condor in the snow, a golden jaguar in the valleys, or a golden serpent below, in the jungle. From that conversation he carved out his legend, he forgot that I had told him, and above all he forgot that it was nothing more than a reproach for his stubbornness and madness. Ines listened to the theme of the golden snake that they were going to capture with the same devotion with which she had listened to Ursua's account of the wars that filled him with scars. She had been raised as a Spanish princess and belonged like me to the Order of the Conquerors, but something in the shadows of her house initiated her in other legends of her blood, he kept something from the wild world even though he lived far from the jungle and the river. Because of her Spanish blood, because of her Inca silences and because of her status as a rich and luxurious woman, she looked at the jungle with suspicion. He didn't know what to make of those cities of cruel, naked women who mated with their prisoners and then handed them over to the knife and the fire. At times he wanted to stay in the mansion in Trujillo, far from those disturbing worlds, but immediately he imagined Ursua in the embrace of the Queen of the Amazons, or under her knives, and he was tormented, and he felt capable of taking up the sword and the crossbow, expose her body to battles and participate in the river wars to keep her man, and with greater energy she wanted to go on the expedition, to be the founder and queen of the wild country. Three cities. One green, one reddish, one white. A snake, a puma, a condor. The sinuous, the cautious, the slight. One of trees, one of gold, one of ice. One that flows, one that remains, one that flies. One full of birds, one full of flames, one filled with spirits. One hot, one cool, one cold. One living, one sleeping, one forgotten. One who feels, one who thinks, one who dreams. One of travelers, one of cultivators. One of sages. One that has always been, one that. Now it is, one that always. Waiting. The house of the earth, the terrace of the sun. The balcony of the moon. One of water, one of stone, one of. Snow. The extended one, the fixed one, the elusive one. 19. If they didn't guess something, it's that. The greatest danger would be on their own ships. If they did not guess something, it is that they would take the greatest danger in their own ships. Ines hastily sold estates and slaves, keeping the people that the expedition claimed, the servants that her own care required, and she prepared that trip with the necessary prolixity. Thirty years ago his blood had been robbed of the splendor of an empire, 
but had entered the style, more arrogant and demanding, of the cast of the new masters. I, who could once look at her with desire, who always looked at her with amazement, would never have been able to look at her with love. If I compared her to Amini, I could feel the difference between an Indian who gave everything, even her pride, simply out of loving devotion, and a woman whose love never made her lose her sense of ambition. His luxurious presence on the ships was going to contrast badly with the brutal troops that Ursua was recruiting. Friends in the vice-regal court warned from the beginning that this mixture was more dangerous than the rum with gunpowder that the Sarmentos pirates of the Antilles prepare on their ships, and some of them wanted to move Ursua to caution. There was in Peru an old man named Pedro de Anisco who should not be confused with another Pedro de Anisco, the cruel one, who many years before founded the town of Timana in the region of the Yalcanes, nor with his first cousin, who was also called Pedro de Anisco, and that he captured the chief of Mentimaneco, Gaetanus' son, and burned him alive before the frightened eyes of his mother, for not having promptly responded to his call. Everyone remembers at the sources of the Yuma, which today we call the Magdalena River, how that conqueror took Timaneco prisoner, who was 18 years old, and before the fishmen and in view of the mother he subjected him to torment, until when the young man, who was strong and kind and destined to be king, was turned into a bloody coal. Logatana, a brave and powerful woman. She indignantly traveled the lands of the Yalcanes, from the lagoons where the rivers are born, through the canyon of vertical jungles where the mountain ranges separate, next to the abysses where the stone faces watch successive waterfalls fall, and through the valleys and hills of Sabas and of Chachafrutos, of Chakara plants and jungles of Just and Cambulos, and shouted for the insurrection. Supported by Chief Pigo and Zot, she gathered under her. He commanded a troop of 6,000 Indian warriors and launched himself against the Spaniards. You have to know what Gaetana did to understand how far the fury of a woman from these jungles can go, because she advanced with thousands of naked men armed with arrows and spears and batons, and when she was repelled by the enemies, she again toured the land summoning Timonace and Pyramas, Guanacas and Pisas, and Aquis and Pijaos, and gathered more than 12,000 warriors to avenge his son and exterminate the invaders. Although they ritually went on their campaign the fishmen and deer men, taper men, and bird men, and behind with their feathered diadems the children of light, and walking among them with spells and basins, with seeds and bells the priests of the jaguar, with menacing necklaces of fangs, covered in yellow fur full of spots, and the nephews of the hummingbird and the grandchildren of the wind, and choirs of daughters of the trout that accompanied the army singing curses and bringing the kasabi and the sacrificial pitchers to cook the hearts of the dead demons, and stone knives carved with slabs from the headwaters of the river, who know the water of the whirlpools and are the only ones who can work great punishments, obtained permission from the shamans for the Indians to use metal things taken from the Spaniards, and there for the first time in the Indies a native army used against the Indian Spaniards many swords from Spain. And Gaetana commanded that army in fierce combats until she found the evil Pedro de Anisco in Timana. Everyone knows that the Casica herself made her way through the troops and seized Captain Anisco with her hands, and when she had him alone and alive among the corpses of many Spaniards, surrounded by the multitude of Indians, she broke his eyes, he had his throat pierced, under his chin, and passed a noose that came out through his mouth and led him yoked to his procession through all the towns. With the sharpest knife on the cliffs of the river, that woman wrought her revenge, and Anisco the cruel, numb, and bleeding, was dragged to his death through all the lands that were to be the boy's kingdom, so that even the stones and trees will remember the torment. In vain Wanda Ampudia, who was born in Jerez de la Frontera, who was in Nicaragua with Bilal Cazar and in Panama with Balboa and in Cajamarca with Pizarro and with my father and with Blas de Atenza, later came to pacify those enraged peoples, in one of the great battles he died with his neck pierced by an Indian spear, and his men gave him the waters of the river as a tomb. Logatana was not satisfied with the revenge he had achieved on Pedro de Anisco, and later gathered more than 20,000 Indians, 
and expelled for years the conquerors from their valleys of Saba trees and from the knot of mountains of the Andaquis, those who came from the jungle, those who speak the languages of the river, the Tinigua, the Kamsa, and the Kofan, those who know the secret of the Andaki vine, which opens its eyes to see the night, and which discovers and frees those who are hidden in the stones. But the Pedro de Anasco of Peru, on the other hand, was a calm man, a great host and a great friend. He had a farm near the coast, and had experienced many adventures of conquest before declaring himself satisfied and withdrawing, in the shadow of colonial power, to see how these kingdoms were consolidated by the advance of trade and war. His occupation was silver from the mines, where many men dug for him, and trade with Seville and Genoa, where he sent ships of his fleet. He had contributed some amount to the expedition, but he was above all a friend of Ursua, and in that capacity he tried to intervene at two different times in the preparations for our adventure. Ursua himself showed me before leaving a letter that this Pedro de Anasco, the faithful, had sent him, trying to dissuade him from taking Dona Ines to the campaign. With quiet loyalty and clear arguments, Anasco told her that what was going to happen did not depend on the lady's virtuous or licentious attitude, nor on the quality of the soldiers, but on the very conditions of the expedition, and that it would not be possible to prevent poor results. Ursua felt above all. Circumstance. After all, he told me, he was not just any adventurer, but in Spain itself a gentleman of great lineage, and in Navarra the princes make their ladies respect and the servants never even dare to look at them. Master Pedro de Anasco would soon see that those dangers did not exist for him, knowing how to command is enough to deserve and obtain obedience. Anasco told himself that perhaps the governor was right thinking about the common Spanish soldiers, who knew about savagery but also about moderation, who were capable of destroying a world but continued to respect centuries-old codes of honor. Then he thought that perhaps it would be easier to get Ursua to take only the best on his adventure, or, to be more exact, to stop taking the worst, of whom he knew some names and backgrounds well. Peru had just gone through enough. Riots to know what to expect with respect to certain troublemakers and miscreants. He sent Ursua a second letter, proposing to unhook ten of the men he was leading, they could be more, but stopping those ten would be the most prudent thing to do. If he agreed to leave them under his orders under some pretext, he himself would pay them a salary for several months, and the expedition would be safe from his disorders. These waves also collided with the rock. Ursua was unmoved, more out of stubbornness than out of confidence. He felt that if he had been inflexible in the case of Ines, now he had to make Anasco feel that he was a self-confident captain, who was not afraid to face the difficulties of the trip and the natural risks of adventure. If there was something he had always felt confident about, it was his subordinates. Only once had he feared, right in the land of the Magdalena Panches, that there was a treacherous sword among his ranks, but later everything was resolved satisfactorily, because the sword that killed his men was in an enemy mahogany hand. From the adversary he could expect betrayal and baseness, perhaps because the adversary could expect it from him, but from men subject to his command he could only expect devotion and obedience. He also dismissed this letter, faced with the announced dangers, he smiled with all his teeth, and abandoned himself to the feverish tasks of initiating the journey. The courtship. The fishmen and the men go up. Deer. The taper men climb and the men. Bird. They come with their feather headbands children of light, and come among them with spells and bowls, with seeds and bells, jaguar priests, with their menacing necklaces of fangs. They pass covered in yellow fur, full of stains, and the nephews of the hummingbird come and the grandchildren of the wind, and the choirs of trout daughters, who follow the men singing curses and bringing the Kasabi. And bringing the sacrificial pitchers. To cook the hearts of. Dead demons. They come with the stone knives. Carved with slabs of the. River headwaters. Knives that know the water of the. Swirls. 
and they are the only ones who can act. Great punishments. 20. When he found the beauty. Ines in her mansion. Trujillo. When he found the beautiful Ines in her palace in Trujillo, Ursua had already perpetrated cruelties, always mitigated by the argument of war. He had betrayed the Musos in the midst of a peace party, but he could tell himself that he was doing it to ensure the peace of the kingdom, he had poisoned the Maroons of Panama at the Alliance Banquet, but he tried to justify himself by trickily arguing that the black rebels were keeping the Isthmus in jeopardy, that many good people, hard-working and respectful of God, were in danger, that order precarious state of the Indies was threatened by these sacrilegious rebellions. Each one of those outrages. Softening his conscience, it made him permissive with himself, and one day he was able to believe that it was enough for others not to see things for them to lose gravity. It is true that war debases, and those who go to it dragged by necessity, defending their honor, may end up turning into a habit a blind instrument of survival, turning into a job what could only be argued as a momentary resource. The betrayal, the poison, the trap, at the beginning are only instruments, at what point do we become their instruments? I have to say it again, already in Panama. Ursua had been forced to resort to brutal soldiers, convicts, outlaws. Accustomed to deception and crime, they were the available people and the war forced him to use them. But what had been imposed on him in Panama later became a custom in Peru. It was clearly stated that to dominate the jungle required men, more than strong, brutal, that the situation made it necessary to recruit men willing to do anything, hopefully without scruples, and in that troop of 800 men that Ursua recruited over the months, a cream of vices and fickleness was thickening. They were the sump of conquest. Resentful, infamous, foolish, and cruel men, who had betrayed more than one cause, who accommodated their behavior to need or appetite. A showy gallery of scoundrels stood out against the horizon of mediocrity of the soldiery, someone observing from outside could feel that there were only wicked and servile there, seventy years of cruelty and procrastination resolved in a mercenary troop almost without thirst for glory and with no more ambition than robbery. Courteous in the bestial palaces of Tenochtitlan and Pizarro in the Cajamarca massacre, Alvarado in the Antillean mines and Valdivia in the violent coastlines, Garay in the plantations of Jamaica and Ponce de Leon in the Borinquan Wars, Ortal and Sedano in the lost ships of Trinidad, Heredia in the looting of the gold tombs and Bilal Khazar in the violent cliffs of Quito, Ambrosio Alfinger in the beheadings of the Yupar Valley and Jimenez de Quesada here, above, in the stonings of Guali and in the burned fortress of Santa Agueda were nevertheless subject to a law and subject to a minimum order. Ursua himself never took a step without prior authorization from their chiefs, but this conquest laborious in cruelty and long exercised in licenses could not fail to engender more membranous creatures, and those same brave and obedient sons of God and servants of the emperor were undermining the divine prestige and the royal dignity. Already Gonzalo Pizarro and the demon of the Andes, on the perfidious scaffolds of Lima, had begun the age of great rebellions. At the gates of the jungle it is finally verified that the hooks of the law are small and clumsy, that the instruments of power are unskillful. The flow of the rivers is not answered with decrees and before the jaws of the great serpent neither iron nor gunpowder are resources. Violence has been the hammer and chisel of this conquest, but a point is reached where violence can no longer do anything, every assault awakens an avalanche, every wound returns a disease, every crime initiates a prodigious annihilation, the responses of the gods are not modulated with common words, and the fury of humans ends up turning against itself. I admired him so much that I never expected. Seeing Ursua committing a robbery today, tomorrow an outrage, the day after tomorrow a crime, and when I saw those things I understood that his actions were already the revenge of the jungle, that his own campaign was beginning to founder in madness, and that other madness was taking place. They would get rid of it. At what point does an affair begin? Become a crime? At what time the hero becomes bandit? How does a crusade full of ideals fall off a cliff in a butcher shop? At this point I would like to tell you something that, 
when I found out about it, already going through the jungle, made me begin to look at Ursua with less sympathy. I had become friends with one of the men who was with him in the war against the Maroons in Panama, and he, whose name was Juan Martin, a loyal and just man whom Aguirre later killed with his own hands, told me how he had been. The punishment of a group of blacks from Bayano, among those who had risen up against their masters in Baragua. Once defeated and taken prisoner, six of them were sentenced to the cruelest death one can imagine. They were taken naked to a central post from which ropes with steel collars protruded, they put metal rings around their necks, left thin sticks in their hands, and ordered them to abandon the cult they claimed to profess to their lost gods of Africa. Because one of those men had been appointed by the other's priest or bishop of that cult. Not only did they not accept to repent of their rebellion nor deny their gods and their ceremonies, but they replied that they were anxious to die, and that once dead they would go to their homeland and bring from there so many people and power that they would pay dearly for the cruelty of their enemies. Then the executioners unleashed against them a herd of large and hungry mastiffs, trained to attack human beings, and the animals made a horrendous slaughter of the captives, who tried to defend themselves with the sticks they had in their hands, without knowing that the Christians were taking them. They had given knowing that this useless defense only served to further inflame the beasts. I remembered the holocaust that Gonzalo Pizarro perpetrated with the Indians in the jungle, and I was once again grateful for not having had to witness such a savage ordeal, because the Maroons could not stop defending themselves while their flesh was torn, thus trapped by the neck, while they were being devoured in life. And perhaps I am only writing this to have a place to confess that I felt an immense admiration for the courage with which those rebels were able to endure such torment without retracting or asking for forgiveness or mercy, firm in that faith of their lost land, which they celebrated in the jungle with dances and songs in an indecipherable language. A ferment of ancient rebellions, of dark inherited injustices, seemed to boil in my veins before these stories, and when Juan Martin added that the Maroons who died after their punishment were still taken to hang on the trees of the forest, I felt that they could not be men but demons who were capable of inflicting such monstrous punishments. Martin did not tell me that it would have been Ursua who ordered executed the torture, but I knew very well that he was the leader of that campaign, and that no decision could have been made without his consent. Hell was made in my soul, because it was thanks to my intervention that Ursua was able to gain access to the Viceroy and become the Dark Peacemaker. The blood of those Maroons came to cover me like a stain, and although those evils were not in my intentions, Ursua's behavior began to seem unjustifiable to me. Cruelty to some poor, vanquished slave seemed to me as unnecessary as it was impious. And to think that at the end of his life it was mulattoes and blacks who most generously tried to save him. Years before I had met Father Vittoria in Madrid. I looked for him attracted by his fame, and moved by the gratitude of knowing that another Spaniard of the time had been able to feel the same that I felt in the cinnamon campaign, when I saw the red herbs, the stained snouts and the dogs inflamed by the smell of blood I already carried on my soul the blood that my father had shed, but also the discomfort, the disgust of those afternoons in the jungle, when I understood that this routine of death had not been made for me, and I was moved when Father Vittoria told me that his blood had frozen in his veins when he found out that the sons of Spain had been capable of assassinating in one afternoon in Cajamarca that exquisite court of princes and hierarchies of an empire that all the references showed him as a kingdom of civility and of job. Because, as anyone who carefully reads these memoirs will notice, there is nothing that has marked me as much as that atrocious afternoon and that lake of blood that seemed to contemplate the stars. Even Ursua felt disgust at my account of the massacres, and that was harder for me to understand. If he had been so ferocious with the Maroons, if we already had clear news that he had been extremely cruel to the Musos and the Tehranas in the new kingdom of Granada, could his sincerity be believed when he rejected those facts? For me, war authorizes everything. Answered. The war is for us to face and that the best wins, and in the middle of a battle I never hesitated to kill or use every resource to survive. But I despise those who take advantage of the weakness of others. I would never kill someone unarmed, that can only be the task of the executioner, 
I prefer to give my sword to the adversary even if I have to fight with an ash cane, rather than feel that I have not loyally won him. But in any war with Indians, I told him, they are at a disadvantage. Perhaps because of their resources, but they are much more than us, he replied. And I have always fought until I defeated them, not until I annihilated them. No one will accuse me of having fired cannons at unarmed Indians, or of having taken advantage of their rituals and ceremonies to take them treacherously. And he added in a disturbing tone, I despise nothing more than betrayal. But I have heard of the way in which Ursua defeated the Musos in Boyaca. It is said that after having agreed to the alliance, having flattered them with gifts and hugs to speak of peace, he lured the chiefs to some neighboring fences, and that there all the principals were beheaded. At first I couldn't believe it, because I remembered those words of the captain. Now I know that war makes men deceitful. Men, who makes things acceptable to them that they affirmed never to tolerate, and that this long conquest is experienced as a state of permanent ambush, where any oversight must be taken advantage of, where any trick is a providential instrument, where no one can stop to think if their actions are fair and if their violence is legitimate, because those minutes of hesitation can mean death. The fountain. Water with fire. Secret river. Receding message over kingdoms. Blue sap from the trees of heaven. Hidden jungle drum. Climbing plant. Dream ant. Pitcher of the lonely night. Liquor of those who fly in the shadow. Sea hay of words son of blind. Mother of twinkling stars. Jewel of the brave. Blood. Blood. 21. The five wars that were. Freed never altered there. Prudence. The five wars he had ever fought. They altered their prudence, but what war could not do now love was trying. There was a month left to start the journey when a rumor spread through the camp that Ursua would take Dona Ines de Atenza with him. The fact could be foreseen, given the attention he paid her, but anyone in their right mind would have dismissed it. To the unknown risks of the trip it was convenient to add the well-known marksmanship of the Indians, the accidents of the river and the inclement weather, but also a reason that was obvious to anyone, except perhaps a madman in love, the danger of putting a woman beautiful in the middle of an expedition of brutal men. They all wondered if he was forcing her to accompany him or if she didn't want to leave him alone. It would have been strange for him to convince her. To invest in the expedition, more amazing. It turned out that the initiative was hers. Men are always willing to give their blood and gold for promises, to invest massive amounts of money in illusions and empires of smoke, but women know how to be more cautious in spending. Ines was a remarkable administrator of her estates, and even before her marriage she had increased her own inheritance. When it came time to sell the properties, Ursua asked her how the spoils from the looting of Kuziko had been distributed, and Ines replied that the part that had corresponded to Blas de Atenza was identical to that received by his companion Geronimo Aliaga, 333 marks. Good silver and 8,888 gold pesos. What a revelation for me, if that was what Pizarro's men had received, that was the fortune that my father could not achieve before the sinkhole of a Peruvian mine fell on him. That's how I came to find out how much of my inheritance the Pizarros spent on their trip. 333 marks of good silver and 8,888 pesos of gold, that's what I invested without knowing it in the Orellana expedition, I repeated to myself, as if sensing that this altered my past and the meaning of my trip. Furthermore, the strange symmetry of these figures made them more unreal, they cascaded down my nightly nightmares, voices from the jungle shouted to me that on that trip down the river I had not only lost my mother and my youth, but also my future, and woke up only to see that my life was still imprisoned in the bars of that phantom gold. Blas de Atenza was one of the few men. Loyalists who were benefited when La Casca pacified the kingdom, but received gold, silver, and death almost at the same time, fate is often so arbitrary. Death, which worked ceaselessly against me, always worked for Ines, the water in Blas de Atenza's lungs gave her, along with her orphanhood, 
a large hacienda, and a larger hacienda brought her the arquebus or the dagger that left her a widow. When Pedro de Arcos, a man not very sweet but loving with her and considerably rich, went to sleep like an Inca in the pots of the earth. Everything seemed to have been made for her. She was nourished by the udders of the mountain, she was showered with the gifts of the kingdom, the Indians served her, the whites envied her, and later Ursu loved her to the point of exhaustion, the jungles looked at her with astonishment and the armies coveted her. But life is like a river that tumbles in. The night. I, who have never seen the face of wealth, still hear the song of the blackbird in the mornings, I still hear the summer wind blowing in the groves of the Magdalena Valley, next to the dry mountains guarded by vipers, and instead the Ursua and Ines in love, spoiled by all powers, have long whispered under the roots and there are no Latin letters on their graves. All those things had an end, and the end was the story. It was necessary for me to leave Hispaniola and join Pizarro in the jungle, it was necessary that the first feat of the nephew of the Marquis of Cain was to kill her husband, leaving Dona Ines in the fullness of her age, more beautiful than the waters that roll, more covetable than trustworthy cinnamon, and in possession of a double fortune, it was necessary for Ursua to appear, and for the two of them to no longer be able to detach themselves, because the story demanded it. And I am the one who loves the story he tells but at the same time regrets that it happened and regrets having to tell it. In truth, there is no memorable story that has not cost a lot of human pain, but it is also true that pain is constant rain in this world, and it does not always leave stories worth telling. Ursua, a tireless hunter of elusive treasures, did not realize that fate had placed a true treasure in his hands, the earthly garden with the goddess at its center, among the palm trees. She saw all that joy as just a moment on her way to the promised city, and she spent the hours and the kisses convincing him to invest their estates in the expedition, and forcing him to promise to take her. After five wars, Ursua felt invincible. He had seen so closely the campaigns of Haradia through the country of the Golden Tombs and of Bilal Khazar in the Lily Valley, where ancient artificers made hives of bees and perfect grasshoppers in the finest gold, he had seen the mistakes of Gonzalo Pizarro and the follies of Hernandez Duran, he knew so well the providences of La Gasca and the watermarks of his own uncle, he knew so much about the art of defeating naked peoples with swords and dogs, cannons and lances, poisons and betrayals that he ended by thinking that his destiny was that of Caesar. A kingdom awaited him, and he too would carry an exotic queen on his galleys, and the jungle would bow its plumage before the happy boats of his campaign. As he sold his estates, he tried. Tell him again in all the tones that he couldn't take her, the expedition was a man's affair, the dangers of the road required strength, endurance, and brutality. Swamps and snakes awaited them, voracious webs of ants, rivers with carnivorous fish, spike soils, trees whose touch poisons, unhealthy rains, poisonous darts, vegetable caverns full of spells, birds that announce death, waters from which the hand comes out without flesh, dangerous nights like scorpions. But the more he talked to her about the risks the more she convinced herself that she could not be left alone. He softened the tone of his warnings, and the madness grew with the days, he could already see himself crossing the jungle with his queen, followed by a troop that would adore them. The regions would fall before the magic of those lovers, and it is true that to myself, more than once, before the jungle arrived with its powerful surprises, they seemed to me like fabled kings, like Oberon and Titania in the forests of Britain, like Caesar and Cleopatra in the Latin waters of Suetonius. The truth was hidden, Ursua and Ines did not. They would travel through wild groves but through merciless jungles, not going down porphyry canals on boats like lutes but down hungry rivers in rickety ships, at the head of a crew that had already plundered empires and defiled a world. Where the rays sleep. Plains of transmitting ants. Posts. Vegetable colors that are hungry. Rivers with teeth, soils that emit. Spikes. Darts of fever, caves full of spells. Blind birds that tell of death. Days that have spots like jaguars. 
still ponds where they sleep. Ray. Waters from where the hand comes out without meat. Knights like scorpions. That stick their sting at dawn. 22. Now I can count one. Saddest story. Story of a boy. Now I can tell a sadder story, the story of a boy who traveled to the Indies following his cousin, convinced by him from the native lot that fortune and glory awaited them beyond the sea. He had believed his young relative ever since he weaved stories with his childhood dreams and transformed his occurrences and family advice into legends. There are those boys who secretly adore to their cousins, who drink from their lips the imagination that was not granted to them, who let themselves be dragged into adventures and chimeras by those close relatives, more dreamers than them, more daring, capable of conceiving worlds and planning exploits. Francisco Diaz de Alz was one of them. He had been born in Ariscan, like Ursua, he also descended from those legendary queens of the Pyrenees and the lands of France. He was beautiful and friendly like Ursua, although less conspicuous, and could seem made only to be part of her courtship. He had allowed himself to be dazzled by the dreams of the Indies, by the thirst for treasures, and when Ursua blew the hunting horn of the great conquests in the Ariscan manors, he rode out with him, and with Balanza, and with Cabanas and the others. And they crossed the kingdom of Spain, resounding with prowess against the infidels, tattooed by thousands upon thousands of blows from horseshoes by Celts and Iberians, by Goths and Merovingians, by Jews and Moors, horsemen with black beards and golden and saffron and garnet turbans, with silver-stitched cloaks. And after leaving that territory blinded by the golden Christs and the blaze of the scimitars, he had had the devotion of the angels for him, he had shared his dreams of conquering a world. When Ursua came to drink legends in the on the docks of San Juan, Francisco Diaz de Alz was there, getting drunk with great visions, and when Ursua arrived in Peru for the first time, Diaz de Alz was there, talking with him through the alleys, sharing his hardship, comforting him. And when Ursua was called by his uncle Armendariz to Cartagena, Diaz de Alz was there among the troop of Navarrese boys who entered with the young captain and went up to Cold Santaf and benefited from the fate that made him governor at 17 and which launched him into a chain of increasingly cruel and bestial wars. Perhaps those are the true protagonists of the story, who leave neither brilliant phrases nor dazzling acts but the certainty of their patience, the secret of their confidence, a few hours that no one questioned, that no one deciphered, thoughts on the bow of the vessels that they went up the Magdalena, explanations they gave themselves about the origin of the stone monsters of the Panchi region, love for the song of some birds on any given morning, love for a dark-skinned girl who suddenly gave a peace, a joy, that they had not dreamed existed. And although we have hardly seen it, it is no less. It is true that Diaz de Alz was with Ursua. Wherever he went, and he was his companion in the War of the Panches and in the War of the Chitareros, in the War of the Musos and in the War of Bunda, in the shadow of the stone cities of Tehrana. The years wreaked havoc on him too, battles traced their scars, wars, and betrayals past darkening the soul. And something more serious must have happened to him as the years wore on the golden dream that they dreamed together in Navarra and that they divined together on the docks of Borinquen, the gradual understanding that the promise of the Indies is a reality for kings, a river of gold for the bankers and the princes, a source of prosperity for the captains and the great bureaucrats, but it is a mirage for the little soldiers who come just to feed the hydra of conquest. The captains walk on the bones of the soldiers, and although these Navarrese boys always looked at themselves in the mirror of Ursua, sharing his prosperous years and his cruel years, the truth is that as Ursua grew older he became selfish and absent, and the fidelity of his men lost luster in his eyes, it ceased to be a passion of adolescence to become a habit of his adult years, and nobody knew when Diaz de Alz found himself seeing Ursua as an insensitive and arrogant captain that he no longer recognized himself in his cousins or in his old friends. It was then that the Pedro Ramiro affair occurred. Ursua had met him at the place where the embarkation was being prepared, and he felt so much confidence in him from the first moment that he made the decision to name him his lieutenant. The fact was daring, 
because other men who had been with him for a long time had expected that position, and in these lands a position of responsibility and importance could be the justification of a whole life. There are many who never get wealth. That the new world promised, and for them the only consolation is to have achieved some title, to be discoverers of some region, governors, chiefs of mission, first or second officers aboard some ship. Something that they can one day show their relatives and their neighbors in Spain, and that in the absence of fortune will even give them the privilege of being admired, of being envied. Ursua named Pedro Ramiro his lieutenant. General and, like other times but with more pain now, Diaz de Alves felt that his cousin was putting him off again. Would his time never come? Would Ursua get all the opportunities and all the titles, all the campaigns and all the luck, and would his faithful companions only bear the burden of the difficult days, the wear and tear of time that neither stops nor forgives? What is certain is that Diaz de Alves came into conflict with Pedro Ramiro, Ramiro treated him harshly, demanding that he recognize his authority and primacy before the captain, and on a bad night the arguments turned into a fight, and the fight turned into rancor. One day Ursua sent his cousin and Diego de Frias, a servant of the viceroy who had received permission to go on campaign, to look for supplies in the province of Tabolozos, and had the bad idea of ordering Pedro Ramiro to accompany and direct them, as he was well versed in those regions. Already on the shore of a river where the soldiers were crossing in canoes, Frias and Diaz de Alves conceived the evil idea of getting rid of Pedro Ramiro, accusing him of treason and trusting that Ursua would believe his cousin's version of events. But a servant of Ramiro witnessed the way they arrested him, and without any justification they made him beat with a club and beheaded him. Seeing that, the servant escaped and went to look for Ursua in a hurry to tell him the facts before the traitors arrived. Ursua thus knew without a doubt that a conspiracy in which his cousin Diaz de Alves was a part had risen up against the authority of his lieutenant. He reacted furiously, blood hitting his brain, his eyes clouded with rage, and now well aware of who was responsible, and of the falsehoods that Pedro Ramiro had come to tell him, he went to look for them himself, and pretending that he believed them, he told them sweetly that he understood the truth. Reason for his conduct, and asked them to go to Santa Cruz and wait for him there. Rumors spread through the troops. Someone told Ursua that his lack of authority was the cause of these bloody events, and that very soon the expedition would become unmanageable. This perhaps aggravated his indignation, so that when the traders thought that Ursua would be lenient, the captain arrived, and without further ado sentenced them to death to instruct the others. The news spread through the camp like a fire, Ursua had just sentenced two soldiers from his troop to death. More serious is that he condemned his own cousin, one of his most faithful friends, who had come with him to the Indies, who had been by his side for half his life, the last vestige that remained of his childhood in the golden hills of Ariskin. I myself dared to ask him to reconsider that decision that, although it could be fair due to the seriousness of the fault, was an inhuman gesture, and a break with his own past. He did not want to listen to me, he was furious, he was blind, he felt that his cousin had committed the worst betrayal, that he had dishonored his blood at the most difficult moment of the campaign, and he must also have felt that if he was soft on that decision, he would not have an authority over the troops. I could have forced him to return to Lima and put it in the hands of the viceroy, who knew how to be both severe and indulgent, as he had already shown when his own nephew left the beautiful Ines a widow but he ordered that the sentence be carried out that same day, and I saw the face of Francisco Diaz de Alves when he learned that his sole cousin had ordered his death without even agreeing to listen to him. Suddenly he understood the black paths of luck, and without a doubt he saw his tremendous story as if in a mirror, that he had come from his land following in the footsteps of his beloved relative, assisting him in battles, comforting him in adversity, spending his entire life at his service, to discover in the last moment that he had only obtained his own death, that he had served his own executioner with loyalty and love. Diaz de Alves was speechless, and I know that when the final blow came, something in him had already died. 
the long journey through unknown lands and exhausting wars was crowned not by a fantastic treasure but by an infamous death. And although that fact among some reinforced the authority of the governor, because it showed him as a severe and just boss who did not allow exceptions in compliance with the law, I am not sure that this was what many soldiers were waiting for on the edge of an implacable jungle, where they had to see the colleagues and bosses as the last holdouts against the unknown, as allies from whom help and understanding should be expected. Ursua did justice to his cousin and his accomplices and this caused a first disappointment in a good part of the troops, because Ramiro was almost unknown to everyone but Francisco Diaz had been a friend of many for some time, and it seemed that they saw him as a link between the chief and the troops, between the veterans of Ursua and the newcomers. Ursua pretended not to have suffered from that impulsive decision, but when the waters receded again he could not ignore that the blow had struck him against himself, that to kill Diaz de Alz was to cut the last tie of his blood, to sacrifice in himself the most precious thing he had left, the breath of an age of illusions, an ancient refuge of legend and fable, the hill of voices where he was detained his childhood. From that day on a shadow fell over his face, and he was never again the Pedro de Ursua that I had known in the endless gatherings in Panama and in the first trips along the Peruvian coast. I, who had also abandoned many things to follow him, understood that we no longer knew in the power of what terrible forces we were falling through the jungle, and I began to suspect that it was not Ursua but the coiled serpent of our destiny that was dragging us towards the edge of madness and despair. Bye. They left on the Luma boat. The cries of children. They left on the wings of the Luma. The fish and the birds. They left in the flames of the Luma. The houses that sang on the hills. While Ursua traveled the river. Below to inspect the. Boats. As Ursua traveled down river to inspect vessels and prepare departure, Dona Ines arrived at the camp with her ladies. And the one who received it on behalf of Ursua was Captain Lorenzo de Salduendo. They had given him the news the day before, he knew of Ines's fame in Trujillo, he had seen her at mass once and had agreed with others that she was the greatest beauty in the kingdom. And when the emissary arrived saying that she was approaching, he arranged for a tournament of knights to be held to receive her. It was, he told himself, a good opportunity to make a military parade and test the discipline of the soldiers. Everyone already knew that she was going to be part of the campaign, so they took her on as one of their bosses, and they made the parade. They carried flags and banners with the colors of Castile, Aragon, the church, and the vice royalty. High above the tents were the banners of Ursua. Ines, behind a veil that only allowed her eyes to be seen, arrived on a particularly well-dressed horse, her ladies also came on horseback, and with them the guard of soldiers that Ursua had arranged to escort them. The black carpenters had worked all night on a kind of improvised balcony so that when they arrived they could settle there, and the parade of helmets with leafy ostrich feathers began, and helmets with long black and white egret feathers, the squadrons crossed, fired their arquebuses, which startled the jungle in the distance, and as they passed in front of the ladies they all stopped and bowed. They smiled thanking them with their handkerchiefs, so that the soldiers suddenly felt far from there, in the luxurious tournaments of Spain, and they did their best to forget the monkeys that watched them from the branches, not to watch out for any snakes. It nodded itself in the branches, ignoring the squawks of the birds with large beaks and the mid-flight cry of the blue macaws. Many rumors had spread about Ines's beauty and everyone was impatient to check it out for themselves. She strutted before the soldiers, heeding someone's plea, she took off her shawl and let them see her beautiful face. We all wonder if Ursua's mysterious absence was foreseen, if the governor had preferred that the soldiers not see them together at first, that they establish a relationship of familiarity with her before getting used to seeing them side by side in the vicissitudes of the bell. For a few days they talked about nothing but Ines's court, her tents, her clothes, her provisions, her servants. Memories returned, or rumors, because there were no longer soldiers from those times, from Atahualpa's court, well, if it was true that she was the Inca's niece, they said, that luxury was not entirely Spanish, 
it was rather the luxury of the court that had been dismantled in Kajamarka. Now I must say that that tournament in homage to Ines de Atenza gave our expedition a glow of ancient history for a moment. Everything seemed to smile at us, and although Ursua was not present, his spirit could be felt in everything, in the gallantry, in the color, in that gallant and violent touch of the crossing of spears, the waving of banners, the martial trumpets. But sometimes I tell myself with surprise that perhaps what gave it its splendor was precisely the absence of Ursua. That moment in which the forces for the advance were concentrated was the last moment in which the captain shone as a winner, as a spoiled son of the gods. What filled the air in that boastful and brilliant ceremony, before the black wall of the unfathomable jungle, was the spirit that the governor had breathed into the expedition, the stories with which he had dazzled the encomenderos, the promises with which he had attracted the soldiers, the energy and slightly delirious confidence with which I had convinced myself, and of course the spell I had cast on Ines. Everything suddenly converged, and the mighty spirit of Pedro de Ursua, advance guard of the Indies, winner of five wars, the bird that was reborn from its ashes, the most bewitched man I ever knew because of the delirium of riches that ignited the new world, the Spaniard who came to believe the most, but in an ambitious and rapacious way, in the legends of the Indians, in their golden tombs and in their flows more elusive than the wind, he filled the company with brilliance and intoxication that afternoon, and no one could foresee that. What we were living was not a sunrise, but the last flash of light cast by the foliage before surrendering to the night. From the moment she arrived at the camp, Ines made feel its power, and administered it with false innocence, she pretended not to notice that everyone was looking at her, that everyone wanted her. She supposed that belonging to the leader of the expedition would put her above all greed, that he could afford liberties and flirtations, and that everyone was obliged to take them as undeserved gifts, that slow cinnamon liquor that Providence added to their traveling ration, but that they had to learn to drink in moderation. Ursua was going to impose the rude but expected labors of adventure, privation, and war, she, on the other hand, came to impose tasks on them that no one had told them about, desire followed by deprivation, temptation tempered by respect, a complacent smile suddenly frustrated by severity. So there were the soldiers and the captains, a multitude of faces each telling an unknown story, Frenchified Navaris like Ursua, strong Basques full of secrets in their language, Jews and Moors camouflaged in the cloud of Andalusians and Portuguese, hard and long-suffering Extremadurans, Castilian noblemen without fortune, mestizo men quieter than the rest, the few women, the loyal mulattoes running errands, always fulfilling some errand, solving some problem, the blacks and the Indians. More than 800 faces hiding or revealing their souls, and that initial anxiety of not guessing which ones will end up being our brothers and which ones are enemies, which ones were born to be leaves of oblivion and which ones to become an indelible part of our destiny. Ursua moved away for the last time to solve urgent matters, and finally he came with his chosen troop of thirty faithful men that the Marquis Ignacio Mendocino had procured for him. On my way to the camp I had path more full of concerns than of hopes the road that separated us from the Inca cities. I experienced again that strange sensation of detaching myself from everything known. The charred fence of the stones of Cusico, the city of my dreams as a child, the new cities of the mountain range with their Spanish palaces, the mansion where the conspirators killed Pizarro, the cold but solemn house of the Marquis near the ravines of Lima, the house of delights of Ines de Atenza in Trujillo, where by the light of the torches in the drums lutes were played and delicacies were served, everything represented for me the deciphered world that we were abandoned. We were heading for the country of the great serpent and the water tree, and I experienced more than others the strangeness of the adventure because, unlike them, I was not looking for riches. Why had he come back? Still on the trip in search of cinnamon, I had some hope of obtaining my lost inheritance, what my father had left me, what Amini recommended I recover. Now I came back so stripped of ambitions that perhaps only I was crazy between so much intention and so much calculation. Where others were led by greed, 
I was barely led by gratitude, and I was close to understanding that not even the object of that gratitude was aware of what I was giving him. Let's say then that I abandoned myself. Destiny with the docility with which the canoe. Delivery to the stream. It was no more than a bird that does not wonder why it flies but follows the impulse of its wings, a mute fish without eyelids that lets itself be carried by the river. Roads. Now the trees go on a journey. Decomposed leaves turn. Roads. Between black branches the day forms. Stars. Now a sun needle sticks into the shoulder of the day. And weapons weave the story. The vines will come to explain the evening. The jungle is the jaguar, the leaves are its stains. The light hides claws. The moss feels the weight of the shade. The jungle now feels reaching the travelers. They came to shores and worlds, and they come back. Night above. Green inside. So many rivers later. So many fears later. Sky below. Time around. Towards the day. 24. The day finally came when the company was ready and complete at camp. The day finally arrived when the company was ready and complete in the camp to begin the adventure, and there the problems due to the delay in undertaking the journey began to be noticed. What was the use of Ursua in different moments he would have obtained large sums, if what he was collecting was spent almost at the same rate, not only on weapons, arquebuses, dogs and crossbows, gunpowder and lead, saltpeter and sulfur, as well as on tools, nails for wood and pitch for caulking the boats, but in victuals for the campers, in fish, in pigs and in birds. Many of these resources were consumed over the months, and here you always have to take pests and the weather into account. The sun and humidity penetrate the wood, the bed bugs gnaw at hooves, horses get sick, pigs are eaten at dinner, dogs need food, not to mention that gunpowder gets wet, irons rust, and keeping warehouses clean and dry is demanding work. I still remember those early days of impatience and confusion. It turned out that of the eleven large and small ships that Ursua had commissioned, and that had been quiet for a long time awaiting his arrival, once put to the test, six leaked because the humidity and the weather had eaten away at them. Ursua was astonished to see that some ships, which had not been used, were already broken and rotten. It's not possible, he said furiously, a brigantine cannot break up in three months or six or a year, least of all if it hasn't even started sailing. Perhaps the wood was not mature, they replied, or perhaps the assembly was not rigorous enough. A cavernous voice in the tumult managed to say, it is that when the chiefs do not exercise permanent control, neither the officers nor the troops know how to demand everything due. And the Corso officer himself declared, it is clear that we are not in the shipyards of Barcelona or in the port of Cadiz, where the climate is favorable and the responsibility of the officers is indisputable. Here everything was improvised, you cannot expect things to turn out the same. Three hundred warriors had been recruited. Main, besides the blacks and mulattoes, who were about thirty, and the Indians, who were more than five hundred. Ursua, in one of his outbursts of enthusiasm, had spent part of the resources buying a consignment of 180 horses recently brought from the stables in the Antilles. He was insensitive to my news that the horses had not been able to proceed through the jungle on the first trip, for us, the only reasonable way had been the river. Because they were on the run, he said, but now our intention is to penetrate the jungle, dominate the peoples, conquer the cities, and we won't be able to do that on foot through the tangle. Neither on foot nor on horseback, neither with dogs nor with swords, nor with spears nor with words, I replied, but he no longer heard me. Before the disaster of the boats, the discussion about how to take the more than 300 horses that the expedition had gathered, only two good brigantines remained. Ursua approved reinforcing what there was with the construction of new flats, wide and balanced barges, in each of which it was thought that 30 to 40 horses would fit, 
it was already seen the impossibility that they were the horsemen riding along the tangled banks of the rivers. Soon an exploring company brought news of new inconveniences. Lug was below the port where the ships were assembled, the river, very mighty from its source, is clogged with rocks and waterfalls that make navigation difficult. But we already know that the canoes of the Brazilians arrived there. The Indians know how to go up the river skillfully in small boats, perhaps up to two brigantines with people will be able to pass, and the rest can descend in canoes, but a few flat boats full of horses will never be able to overcome those gorges. There is no way to carry a heavy weight on them. When Ursua finally understood what was happening, he suffered the second great setback of the trip. With almost all the brigantines ruined, it was better to scrap them once and for all, there was no time to start building others. Forced by the facts, he made a decision that left almost everyone dissatisfied, embark only 27 horses on the sturdiest flatbed and leave 273 practically abandoned in the mountains, since we didn't even have time to take them back to Lima to try sell them there. You already know what a horse means to a soldier, there were men who cried when leaving their mounts in the mountains, at the mercy of the jungle, and someone said that those beasts were the first tribute that the expedition was offering to the gods unknown. I still seem to see the 47 horses, several of them white Arabian foals with long manes, which we took to a spacious and fertile island, thinking that one day we might return and rescue them. We were not unaware that they would die, that they would desperately throw themselves into the current trying to reach less cruel shores, but there are times when all decisions are desperate. And now I remember that, weeks later. Pascual de Urbina surprised me one afternoon in the jungle reciting in romance the names of many of those horses that we had abandoned. I have seen men cry more for their horses than for their absent girlfriends, I have seen someone die pronouncing the name of a horse between effusions of blood. A pack of mastiffs was also released to their fate in the Sierra de los Motilones, and we all tried to forget that those dogs that were meek as doves with us and with the warrior Indians were wild as hawks, loose in the woods without anyone to provide them with. Food would be victims of famine and plagues. We all had to abandon some of our baggage, clothing, and provisions, and now the governor wasted his verbal resources, not announcing virgin lands and new skies as before, but justifying travel limitations and promising better days in return for lightening the weight of the company. Captain Garcia Arce came out first with 50 men to explore the shores. Later we learned that he found a town of warrior Indians against whom he had to fight for three days, and that the first men of the expedition were killed by arrows there. Also commissioned to explore certain islands, at the beginning of July of that year, 1560, Don Joan de Vargas, a personal friend of Ursua and one of his most trusted men, left at the head of a hundred other soldiers. Both captains had to go ahead and wait, far from each other, a few more weeks, because when Ursua was ready to leave, one of Pedro Ramiro's subordinates, Juan de Montoya, angrily refused to participate in the trip, alleging that because of the death they were owed a reward from their chief, and that none of his men would move from the Modi Lones region. Ursua had those soldiers, who were more than a hundred, and to force them to fulfill their commitment, and perhaps also to avoid disbanded from all the others, she took Montoya prisoner. Now many complained about the shipment, no one could bring even half of what they felt necessary, and I felt the contrast between the fervor with which we undertook the trip to Canela years ago, and the continuous lamentations and annoyances that replaced that enthusiasm here. However, most of the soldiers were still willing to undertake the campaign because the hopes that Ursua had aroused were great. So the expedition had two faces, one fascinating and magical, in the shadow of Ursua and his lady, a luxurious and powerful campaign in which trumpets resounded, packs barked, the finest colts neighed, and they prepared almost like fabled kings to descend through those solemn rivers towards the heart of the jungle, and another resentful under a flutter of bad omens, with brutal soldiers looking suspiciously at their leaders, entire companies of frustrated horsemen who would have to advance on foot through jungle, and officers dissatisfied with their provisions and full of demands. 
To manage this oscillating crowd, Ursua, who was forced to alternate his jovial and gallant spirit with a new severity, was beginning to feel impatient. Every time he had to deal with another setback, a new rage invaded him, he dispatched complaints more rudely, he resolved conflicts more rigorously, he only wanted to do something else. I felt it early on, Ursua had started not seeing Dona Ines, and soon I would end up seeing only her. Before, the two lived proud of the kindness they showed to everyone, but Ines' minor attentions were interpreted in a devious way by the soldiers, and his gestures, strong and fair, which would have been seen in other circumstances as the natural way of commanding a military chief, received perverse interpretations for coming from a chief given to pleasure and subject to the whims of that cat in heat. Never forget the river. Then you appear in my dreams. You ask me not to forget the river. When I tell the story, it was the river that did it, you tell me. The river knows what you need. The river can see at night. Offers you its poisons and offers you its fruits. The water is soft but tills the stones. Spins the grass, pushes the mountains. Knows how to quench death in the throat. 25. They came from everywhere and each had a past. They came from everywhere and each one had a past. I never asked them about their origins, Ursua told me at the shipyard, I can presume that they all have a murky history, but here they come looking for the opportunity to be brave, to be heroes, and to be rich. The truth is that you could almost see in their faces that they were not only looking for a future but also fleeing from tortuous memories, scheming the best way to take revenge on their own past. The governor made it a rule to always trust them even when they gave him reason to doubt. Faced with the disaster of the ships, he did not stop blaming the officers, the carpenters, and the caulkers, but that accusation was not entirely fair because one had to consider the poor quality of the wood, the power of the humidity, the little experience of all in the art of building ships in unhealthy climates and in precarious conditions. The wind carried voices. I overheard, without knowing who was saying it, that certain chiefs were worth less than one of the horses left in the mountains. Another replied, you see, we came to get riches and the first thing we do is lose what little we brought. A month had passed since Wanda. Vargas set out with 30 men in the first brigantine, and with 70 more men, distributed in canoes and rafts, to collect whatever food the riverbanks offered, and Ursua was still taking time resolving conflicts, taking advantage of the time to build new rafts and make build a big canoe in the sun. For his part, the other captain sent to explore, Garci Arce, did what Orellana did, since he found no provisions the first few days, he continued forward, rode 300 leagues in front of the jungles, and did not stop with his men until they reached an island on the Marañón. It is not that we camped on the banks of a river. We were in a water star in the mountains. From the Sierra came ravines, streams and flow rates, they were joining and braiding under the branches, and the captains went crazy trying to know the names of those streams, rivulets, and rivers that rushed from one slope to the other. The Kokoma River, the Brac Amaras, the Apurama, the Oenxa. Indian voices told us that this was perhaps the Vilcos, that the Zoxas ran beyond. Like a spider's web of cold waters, this river was born behind the Chinchacacha region, that other was born in Guanaco, several channels emerged from Tamira, many others sprang from the mountains of Pacartambo and Guacambamba, and in the midst of so much confusion of waters and names we did not know if the names of Ruparapa, Purama, Van K corresponded to rivers, mountains, or indigenous peoples. But beyond our ignorance and our loss, what radiance of waters was descending and joining, as if subject to a conscious command, as if some voice were leading them, as if invisible hands patiently forged from above what later becomes the lightning that splits the jungle and it never stops growing and growing, populating itself with birds and turtles and filling itself with the brightness of the skies and the agitation of storms. Only on the 26th of September did we finally embark under the command of the governor, with the beautiful Agnes and her court, and with the majority of the army. 
Ursua had first had to subdue several attempts at mutiny, and he was taking some chiefs prisoner. The brigantine that remained was full of troops and weapons, behind were three strong flat boats, two of which would later carry the chosen horses, which in the initial section were going to go down the shore, and in which we put supplies and tools. In the other, specially worked and provided, with a well-carved roof to protect from the rain and veils to prevent the passage of insects, the governor would go with his wife and his body of guards. In the first outposts I was part of that company. The first three days, as we had been announced, were waterfalls and whirlpools, navigation was difficult as we left behind the Sierras and drifted through larger streams, and so we reached the point where the men bringing the horses overtook us. There we put them on board, already certain that the the rocky rapids had ended, and soon we saw from above the great jungle plain with the mirror of water winding through it towards the green darkness shot through with streams of light. There were also, farther out in the sun, mysteriously spaced sheets of rain. We descended between raucous flocks and very soon we felt the neighborhood of the plain, the vegetation became denser and more tangled, the boxed mountains widened, wide beaches appeared, and I relived one of the powerful initial experiences of my first navigation through the jungle, the jubilant impression of freedom and almost of loss, of entering with a whole river into the bed of a larger river, of an immense river, with the confusion of trunks, foams, branches and eddies that form in that confluence. And as if it were a fateful law of the jungle, exactly as it happened on the previous expedition when we reached a larger river, the brigantine gave a bump, and a piece of the keel flew to pieces. Ines saw the brigantine crash into something, saw the confusion up on the deck, and cried out, but Ursua went ahead with the flat boats, the rafts, the canoes, and the rest of the fleet, trusting, no doubt, in the skill of the pilots. And we advanced in search of Lorenzo de Salduendo's troops, whom the governor had dispatched three days before, to prepare the road and, if possible, stockpile provisions. Two days later the brigantine caught up with us, half repaired with logs and blankets, and sailing like a drunk suddenly shaken by the waves. Ursua tried to keep me close because for him. It was important to know when, although. Now if we came from another direction and by another road, we arrived at the Amazon River. He recalled that our brigantine had also broken down when it flowed into a larger river, and he did not forget the Orellana story, so he feared that Juan de Vargas, who had been waiting for us for more than two months, would decide to go ahead and get carried away. By the river. He chose Pedro Galias, a great rower, faithful soldier, repairer of arrows and spears, and sent him to tell Juan de Vargas that the governor was already on his way, and that the army had reached the Marañón River. Galias arrived at the island where Don Juan was waiting at a crucial moment. Part of the troops were already mutinous, although divided into two factions that were discussing whether to go ahead with new chiefs or return to Peru. And in that mutiny the quarrelsome and cavernous voice of Lope de Aguirre stood out. It was possible to warn the older men. Dissatisfied. Several had even been accomplices of Ursua in some reprehensible maneuver, as in the case of Juan Alonso de la Bandera, Pero Alonso Casco, Miguel Serrano and Fernando de Guzman. One day Ursua asked these four, who were part of the first troop that camped next to the shipyard, to be his assistants to force Canon Pedro Portillo to fulfill the commitment to lend him 2,000 pesos against the results of the expedition. Portillo was the vicar of Moyobamba, I know. He said that he had saved a fortune by depriving himself even of snacks, and at first he was enthusiastic like everyone else with the governor's stories. But finally his thrifty spirit got the better of him, and after committing himself to Ursua, when he had already allocated those resources, he regretted the deal and refused to hand them over. Ursua did not care that he was a cleric, he sent the almost naked mulatto Pedro de Miranda at midnight to ask Portillo to go urgently to the church to confess Don Juan de Vargas, who was wounded by two stab wounds for a reason I do not know, and when the vicar went to do this charitable work, Ursua's henchmen, Pero Casco, La Bandera, Serrano, and Guzman, seized him, 
in the church itself they pointed a gun at him with arquebuses, they intimidated him by the light of the lighters, and they forced him to sign an authorization so that the next morning a merchant who had these monies in deposit would deliver them to the governor. But Ursua took his assault further, he forced Portillo to hand over the rest of his fortune, which was 3,000 pesos more, and took him by force as chaplain of the expedition, because your reverence would not want to lose the money that he has saved all his life. The truth is that he never recovered them, and along the way he lost more than the money that Ursua's felony had taken from him. At the hands of the tyrant he lost his tonsured head, and his only salvation was that death surprised him with the creed on his lips. I can't deny that Ursua got unwell with the scoundrel, and it doesn't surprise me that it was those same men, who no longer saw him as a respectable captain but as a partner of dates, who began to murmur against him when they felt that the trip splendid that he had promised them was turning into a risky and uncomfortable adventure. Ursua trusted everyone as long as they were loyal, he continued to trust when the rumor was growing that some envied him and even hated him, and he always laughed at the suspicions of those who sought him out for warning, just as he had disdained the recommendations of old Pedro de Anisco, in those two letters so loyal that today they seem more like oracles than letters. By happily trusting his rough Ians, he neglected the warnings, and refused to understand the meaning of the dreams of the beautiful Ines, who begged him in all tones to beware of the troop. Now that they're all dead, I can too. Confess that there were a few days when Ines filled my thoughts. I later noticed with resentment that this had happened to many, that during the expedition each one not only felt attracted to her but had the conviction that she corresponded. It was a wild campaign, where men alone and full of energy faced chance and death every day, it is not difficult to understand the disorders that the closeness of a woman can unleash in the bodies, and especially of a woman like that. She was not, as I have already said, the only woman on the expedition, but we all reacted as if she were. Her mestizo maidens and her Indian women went with her, no other soldiers officially took women, but there were servants who helped with the daily work, and some of the men had even managed to take their daughter. We know that Lorenzo de Salduendo talked with Ines upon his arrival and since then he has not been able to sleep. His care for her betrayed him, he was always attentive to her requests, he never hid his interest, and only Ursua seemed not to notice, as if it seemed natural to him that his wife exercised a kind of fascination over the captains. Perhaps he was sure that no matter how much they wanted her they would not dare court her, or the awareness of his authority placed him above the risk of feeling jealous of his subordinates. Little by little he saw a rebirth of the indifference that had made him lethargic during his breaks in Trujillo, he began to feel strange about his own obligation to be chief. At the gates of the jungle, with an expedition wavering in his hands, he became aware that the world was closing in on him, and he only found refuge in the tents of his bewitched love. It was a good thing, he told himself, that the soldiers did not feel too much the weight of their authority. But if there was one thing the soldiers needed, it was a boss, and the gradual abandonment of his duties had to be experienced as a betrayal. They had all embarked, seduced by his eloquence, dazzled by the fascinating world that he invented with his speeches and proclamations, and suddenly Ursua did not want to speak any more. The jungle, which aroused his eloquence so much when he was far away, when he barely dreamed of it, silenced him as he approached, and was nothing like the web of ferocious cities and pagan peoples that he had been weaving on his travels. The discomfort that aroused among the troops became larger and more unpredictable than the jungle itself. It was like the magician who awakens the powers of darkness and is suddenly distracted, seduced by some spectacle in the world, and forgets about the demon he has just conjured. Something was using that resource to stop him, slowly and effectively, the hope that he himself had planted in those men he was now abandoning was being frustrated. And for evil to be perfect, destiny. He had placed in her hands a consoling refuge, with all the appearance of happiness. We heard again about Ines de Atenza's cries of pleasure, which Ursua had told me about in Trujillo, because now he didn't need to tell us about it, they spent a lot of time together in that store guarded by black slaves, from the neighboring shops, 
Enessa's anxious cries, her panting and her amorous blasphemies could be heard at intervals in the midst of those tireless copulations that took Ursua away from her duties and discharged the responsibilities of command on others. Listen. I could tell you many things. The song of a tongue devouring a world. Hammering the treasure of names. Of trees that dream and birds that they think. Of mountains that jump like deer. Of rivers like trees that have their roots in the sky. I would paint in the caves of the jungle the screech of monkeys. I would name the snout of the storms. The rain on the grass of so many dead men. And the silent voices of the trout that heard the flutes of the fire. The throng of the great invasions. And how they rose up against them. Feather darts. Arrows like snakes. Black souls of Chinta with their prayer. Shark teeth to the branch of the arrows. I would say in your ear how the wars. The clash of men and dogs. The song and the spell. The irons that they planted in the bare breasts. Avalanches and shadows. And the god shouting back to the jungle and the river. 26. Some say that he was born in Aramayona, in the shade of the church of San Esteban. Some say that he was born in Aramayona, in the shadow of the church of San Esteban. That the principality is called Anaria, that the place is called Gabaria, that the house belonged to Estebalista Aguirre, his stepfather. Not even he knew anything about his father. And some say that he was born in the year 10, when Balboa founded Santa Maria la Antigua del Darien, and others that in the year 19, when Cortés pulled down the effigies of Tenochtitlan. And they say that after a childhood as hard as that of any poor Biscayan from Onate, he became a shoemaker in Viteria. Perhaps from its earliest days it was violent, cruel, and seditious, but maybe it was life that made him like this. If he had rebelled against his stepfather, what we do know is that he never gave up his name. And Ursua was right when he told me that many of his soldiers had been fleeing from some shady past, he had raped a maiden in Vitoria and, caught by the bailiffs, was sentenced to be hanged and quartered. He was in a prison in the year 33, awaiting death, when the announcements of the great golden overseas kingdoms reached Spain. With the glow of that fabulous gold in his eyes, he managed to distract the jailer, escaped from prison, ran to Seville, and managed to embark for the Indies under the command of Rodrigo Buran. He did not know that he had left little six-year-old Ursua near his land playing with the geese on the Elizondo Road, he did not know that he had left eleven-year-old Juan de Castellanos in Seville studying oratory in the studio of Don Miguel de Heredia. He passed before them by the docks of Hispaniola, where I was waiting for my father and where I received in a letter the story of the death of a city, he passed through the island of Barinquin, where fantastic stories flew, and they tell me that he was in Cartagena with the troops of Pedro de Heredia, advancing through plains where the trees have voices of gold, where men can disappear in forests of giant herbs. He learned to tame colts, he was in Panama in. In the year 35, he arrived in Peru in 36. In the Battle of Salinas he was seen on the side of Vaca de Castro, and in 44 he rode in the troops of the old Viceroy Blanco Núñez de Vila. In Trujillo or Lima he had a daughter, and sometimes he visited her on his travels along the deserted coasts. It is not difficult that he knew Blas de Atenza in Trujillo, it is not difficult that he knew of Ines since she was a child. He was 30 years old and he already knew very well what he hated, the bosses, the rich, the jailers and the winners. For 12 years he had trained himself not to let himself die and he was persistent in his grudges. He saw Ursua for the first time in his brief passage through the Peruvian land, and as he found out everything, he could not ignore that the inexperienced boy, son of a Navarra's fortress, had been called to higher destinies. Gonzalo Pizarro and the demon of the Andes had risen up against the viceroy. He joined the royal side, raised troops for his cause, and one day even tried to free the imprisoned viceroy. But the old viceroy did not get a chance to thank him for his good intentions, 
and the men in the king's cause did not acknowledge his efforts. For helping the viceroy he was wounded in the right foot, and no one came to offer him their support. Since then he became an even better rider. Because it is hard to have an unskillful foot when you go on campaigns of conquest. He felt more and more angry and one day, to make matters worse, he seriously burned his hands firing a broken arquebus. He tamed horses in Trujillo in the year 46, he lived on fights and intrigues, he made friends, but when they knew he was a fugitive from justice, they turned their backs on him. In those he was when he crossed the mountain range. Like a trumpet blast, the news that Bishop Lagasca, the vigilante, was coming, invested with all the imperial power, to subdue the rebels and punish the fugitives. He preferred not to tempt the devil, he fled with Melcher Verdugo to Nicaragua, and only in 1551 did he return to Peru, attracted by the legend of the Potosi Silver, perhaps in those caves lay the fortune he had been chasing for almost 20 years. Since then he has dedicated his life to getting. Take advantage of the work of others to obtain. Quickly fortune, but Judge Francisco. Esquivel learned that he was tormenting the Indians and arrested him. He shouted to her face that being a Spanish Hidalgo he could treat those beasts as he pleased, and the judge, in the face of that vociferous rebellion, sentenced him to public whipping. Since then, Lope de Aguirre had a reason to live, to take revenge on the judge who had subjected him to that ridicule. Waiting for his term to expire, he chased the judge from city to city, from province to province, becoming his silent and furtive shadow for six years, from 1553 to 1559, sometimes limping and sometimes riding his way to his revenge for more than 6,000 kilometers. He went after him to Quito, he returned through the deserts of Saltpeter, through the parched mountains, through the cities of the coast. He stalked, intrigued, brooded over his rage, returned in his footsteps through the city of the kings of Lima, where the Marquis of Cain already ruled, caught up with the judge in Cusico, and killed him there. Now he needed to hide in hell, and then he knew that a gallant and lucky captain, rich and successful, was mounting an expedition to the impenetrable jungle, and he ran to hitch a ride. Ursua, of course, did not ask him about his life or his past, but it seemed to him that this misshapen man with a big head, suspicious eyes, violent gestures, a cavernous voice, and rough language would be useful for the expedition. Surely Pedro de Anisco knew his history, because he was the first one he mentioned in his letter, recommending that Ursua not take him, neither him, nor Juan Alonso de la Bunda or de la Bandera, nor Pérez, nor Lorenzo de Salduendo, nor Diego de Torres, or Vargas, or Miranda, or Cristobal Fernández, or Miguel Serrano, or Anton Lamoso. This Lamoso had gone with Aguirre to the interview and, at the same dark moment, Ursua hooked them both. Aguirre told him that he could only go on the expedition if he could bring his daughter, an 18-year-old girl, and Ursua accepted because in those days it was already being resolved that Ines de Atenza and her maidens would go with him to the jungle. Aguirre was one of the first two. Concentrated in Santa Cruz, because he was dodging justice. He knew that he could not return to Peru, where he would be executed for the death of the judge, he knew that he could not return to Spain, where he would be dismembered for an old crime. Then he began to hear the complaints of the soldiers waiting for the gallant governor who never came. He saw how the brigantines were made, how it rained on the jungles, how idleness invented nightmares before a horizon of blind trees, he heard from other fugitives and convicts stories of daggers, gangs and stolen keys, he saw how the humidity and the bug gnawed at the boats, how the troops grew impatient, how the delay seemed like an omen or warning that the chief was reluctant to set out on the road. Later Ursua arrived and began to exercise his authority over a troop eaten away by impatience. I decided as always, because he was used to being a leader, but he was incapable of noticing that those decisions made righteously, consulting only the merits of men, left furrows of hatred in the souls of others. And there were the pretensions of Fernando de Guzman, a man of high birth trapped by the wars of the Indies, 
who once let slip the affirmation that he felt more worthy of governing that campaign, more full of decision and merit than Pedro de Guzman. Ursua With the arrival of Ursua and Ines, soon. Rumors started. If Ursua sent a squad to explore, someone found an evil meaning in that decision, if he decided to take the Brazilian Indians, there were dark comments about it. And when Ines's first cry of the night was heard, many things were said in that camp. Lope de Aguirre was weaving his plot. From The first time I saw him I had the impression of something not entirely human, he had enormous strength, he was able to lift his own weight several times, he moved with amazing agility, he combined the brusqueness of a mountain beast with a surprising quickness of mind. And a powerful and wicked language. He made Fernando de Guzman feel that he should assert his blood and his titles, it was not clear why Ursua was the boss. One day, for some infraction, Ursua reduced Bandera to prison. Aguirre became close friends with the flag ever since. Ines had brought a mysterious dog from Trujillo, a viringo, to the expedition, and since these dark dogs seemed to burn with fever, to the point that the Indians use their contact to cure themselves of the cold in the bones, Aguirre did not stop suggesting to the more credulous that he was a dog from hell and that obviously Ines was a witch who had dominated the governor. The truth is that long before started on the road, Lope de Aguirre was already moving like a demon among the troops, insinuating something perverse here, throwing something crooked there, making some distrust others, and all distrust Ursua and poor Ines, who according to he thought, one day he favored these and another day he betrayed them by offering his favors to those. I did not frequent the cliques of the soldiers, but I was noticing that a climate of gossip and danger was growing in the camp. What happened in the canoe? At that time there was no night. You always had to travel in the light. He had given each one a gift. Hidden things that were not to be looked at. But one of them opened the dark bag. And ants sprouted from it. They covered the hands, the arms, the body. Covered the neighbors, the canoe, the water. Covered all the walls of the sky. And so the night came. Pamuri Max gave each one a Kokio. And in that dim light they advanced. The ants were more and more each instant. They were filling everything. Then came the yellow man. The sun came with his crown of feathers. The ants no longer covered him. With a stick he pushed back the dark spot. Put the ants back in the bag. Filled the bag with millions of ants. But they no longer fit in it and they spread by the jungle. Although the light returned, since then, the night exists. But no night will be so closed. As thick and dark as night. The ant. They came to the rock, the big rock. Pierced. Believing they had reached the end. Of your trip. They came out through a hole in the tip of the. Canoe. They were scattered around the world before. Weather. Each carrying his gift. Bow and arrow. The fishing rod, the grated cassava. The blowpipe and the basket. The bark cloth mask. Men chose where to live. On the shores, in the jungle, in the river headwaters. In the clouds, above. 27. Because of its enormity, because of its color and by the strength of its flow. Because of its enormity, because of its color, and because of the force of its flow, I was beginning to recognize the river we reached on my previous trip after the Aparia region, but I had the feeling that now the Indians did not want to appear. We saw the villages on the riverbank, and sometimes found sufficient provisions in them, but the Indians were absent or invisible and neither did they sound the drums that years ago had always been the harbinger of great attacks. I told myself that if the first time they had besieged in some sections of the river was because they thought we were coming to stay. Perhaps now they hoped that what had happened with the first would happen to this expedition, that it would vanish downriver and not return for a long time. If the brigantine of the troops had suffered a breakdown when leaving the great river, 
the one that Juan de Vargas was carrying practically fell apart when he reached the first island where we met. When it was already taking on water, the men were able to row to the beach and from that moment the navigation was done with only a brigantine, and with the rest of the troops in flatboats, rafts, and canoes. We stopped every day at six in the afternoon on the right bank of the river so that some soldiers fished, others cooked, everyone ate, and many took advantage of the stop to rest while a part of the troop watched over the inexpressive jungle and the extensive waters of the river. In an Indian village, no doubt little abandoned. Before by its inhabitants, we found more than a hundred large turtles and many eggs. And it was after that that we finally found Garci Arce, the one who had left first with thirty men. The experience of his trip had been one of anxiety and scarcity. The Indians had waged war against him every day since his arrival at the Marañón River and had killed some of his men. The group had to feed only on water lizards, which the chief hunted with his arquebus, because he was the best arquebusier in the army. One day a large group of natives came to. Wanted with peaceful intentions, but Garci Arce and his men thought that they were going to be victims of a huge assault, so they received the visitors in a large bohio, or maloca, a little far from the river, and when the Indians thought they were going to arrange with them some deal and enter into some alliance, the men of the company, full of fear, launched themselves into the attack and, out of sheer horror, carried out an atrocious butchery. They fell with sword and knife on the unarmed Indians and killed more than forty before they could react, so that the rest of the Indians fled, bringing such alarming news about the reaction of the invaders that for many leagues we always find the abandoned villages on the shore. From the river. The expedition assembled at last, we stopped. Eight days on the island of Garci Arce, and there they were appointed Lieutenant General Don Juan de Vargas, and Ensign General Don Fernando de Guzman, whom Ursua considered his great friend. But we already know that Guzman was secretly envious of the governor's titles and believed himself much more worthy of being head of the campaign, especially from the moment that Aguirre began to extol the garments of his lineage and celebrate his merits. One of the two flats got lost in the next game, in the first region of the jungle where we saw a flock of white parrots pass over us. There was nothing left but the governor's luxurious flat, and all the rest of the expedition went on numerous rafts and canoes, until they reached a town called Kareri, a name that we gave to the entire province from then on. We managed to be there for more than a month, reinforcing the baggage, and already talking about the need for a safe shore where to build new ships. The few Indians we saw were helpful and friendly, but Ursua was so eager to reach the country of the Amazons that no town tempted him. Nothing that announced cities could be guessed on the shores, the towns were rustic, their adornments were feathers, inks, and seeds, gold was scarce in their bodies, and the best proofs of their industry were the slender canoes, the finely woven hammocks, the malocas that face the sun and the moon, the pitchers, the spears, the darts and the blowpipes. But the governor was not interested in knowing what the braided vegetable fiber cylinders, the pointed and flexible rods, the grated yucca, the baskets where the natives keep invisible things, or the bark cloth masks were used for. Nor did he appreciate the noise of the canes. Curatives with bells and seeds, nor the sound of prayers, nor the music of the flutes, nor the pounding of the drums. In the immensity of the jungle it did not seem. Reciprocate great wealth, the Indians only spoke with exaltation as if it were pure gold of the knowledge of things. Here it is only wealth to know was the incomprehensible translation that an Indian language made of the words of a king who had a necklace of fangs and a diadem of blue feathers. Ursua smiled suspiciously, but felt nostalgia for the campaigns of the new kingdom of Granada, where from each region came a multitude full of pectorals and nose rings, bracelets and paparos, frog or bird necklaces, helmets or headbands, where they were crowd the grasshoppers, fangs, bats and golden bees. But the governor told himself that without a doubt. Here too the treasures were hidden, perhaps behind each tree there was a warrior lurking, under each feather a watchful head, in each trill a song of war, in each howl of a monkey a message that was traveling from region to region, on each crest a warning, on each motionless iguana a sentinel of hidden kingdoms, 
all arranged like a flower of cautious fences protecting the secret. It was during those days that I tried to become friends with Ines, to make everyone feel that there were people faithful to Ursua and her entourage, and to learn old things about the kingdom that she, daughter of the palaces and granddaughter of the mountains, could relate better than many. There, by the jungle, I came to know Trujillo's house through his words as if I had once lived in it. As Ines talked about her arches and her baths, her gardens and water channels, I saw how much she missed that world she had given up for an impulsive love. I had practically never been out of those walls where her old Indian women pampered her, where the servants pampered her, and where her husband and her lover went to love her. I was really happy to go on an adventure with Ursua and he preferred this destination to any other, but he couldn't help but feel the helplessness of the elements, the vertigo of the unknown jungles and the rivers without memory. A ceiling of cloudy skies and nights with patches of stars did not sufficiently protect his life thrown at random from the indomitable regions, and in that state of fragility and fear, he had eyes to see many things that the arrogance of Ursua would never see. Montoya, the man from Santa Cruz, had been one of the first to dislike Ursua's authority. He openly declared himself in rebellion and was again reduced to captivity, which only consisted of wearing a collar for a few days. All the men robbed the villages, and the captain prohibited these abuses by trying to put order in relations with the native peoples. He didn't want us to be seen in the jungle as thugs, but he wasn't able to prevent the outrages from repeating themselves at each contact. Alonso de Montoya stirred up the others. Prisoners, Juan Alonso de la Bandera did not. Forgot his humiliation, Fernando de Guzman. Encouraged secret thoughts, Lorenzo de. Salduendo felt more jealous of Ursua every day, Miguel Serrano de Caceres hated the disorder of the expedition, Cristobal Fernandez and Diego de Torres felt continually offended and mistreated, Alonso de Valeno was a friend of Portillo, the cleric, Martin Pérez felt that he had been deceived and that he had left Peru, where he had a good future, to enroll in an expedition that was more confused and more disoriented every day, and we had to add to all this the persistent work of Lope de Aguirre, which made one's vanity grow and the rancor of another, the resentment of the third and the jealousy of the fourth, the indignation of this and the contempt of that. Food was scarce and many began to feel that the advance would be suicidal. Anything seemed preferable to continuing along the river into which new torrents flowed endlessly. These torrents arrived so muddy from both banks that it was easy to conclude that the rainy season was beginning upstream. One afternoon, when we had camped in an abandoned village, and when Ursua and Ines, as always, were locked in their tent, a storm broke over the jungle so terrible that for hours and hours the members of the expedition could not see each other. Each other. The men secured the flatbed and the rafts on the shore, managed to moor almost all the canoes, and managed to protect themselves, some in Indian huts, others in tents, others under improvised leaf sheds, but for a long time it could be felt that this was not the case. It was not a vigorous and fearsome expedition but the spoils of a rare adventure. Ursua woke up in Ines's arms with the feeling of being in the last confines of the world, he felt that there was no land beyond, that from now on only storms and desolation awaited them. From that moment on he had a remnant of loneliness, he did not want to leave the store, he reacted rudely to requests, the demands of the soldiers filled him with impatience, each of his functions as chief annoyed him somewhere in the body, it provoked an uncomfortable reaction in his bones and muscles. The entire army seemed to merge with his body and everything filled him with anger or indifference. The memory. As I walked away from the mountains he returned to me the memory of a pain of these men, the memory of the sacrificed king. I experienced the surprise of knowing that there were still, so many years later, Indians dressed in black and white for him, and I made fun of those who awaited his return, melancholy Incas believing that the blood spilled in Kajarnarka would mix with the rain and the earth, and would make the king rise from the mist of the mountains. Stranger was that if you think that a city of ours was already growing on the dry blood, where there were churches lit like lamps in the rocky mountains, 
and at sunset the metal of the bell sang the praise of a world very different from the one deplored by the ghostly reeds of the mountain range. But here the mountains have the shape of a sleeping body, here the wind in the abysses sometimes dreams with the voice of an absent person, here the jungles speak of the mystery that is in each rib and in each leaf, here each ray of the sky has a refuge asleep at the bottom of the lagoons. 28. And so we come to the region of Maki Pharaoh. And so we arrive at the Maki Pharaoh region. A. Land of naked Indians who paint their bodies in bright colors, and only wear necklaces of red seeds and feather ornaments. I remembered this region but I didn't know why, I had the feeling that something specific had happened to me there. I spoke with Ines again and felt that she was increasingly worried about Ursua's situation. She feared things, she dreamed of blood, of assaults, of deaths. He told me that Ursua was not paying attention to his premonitions, and that he needed to be more careful. I talked to her about something else, I took the conversation back to other topics, and she calmed down by telling me about her father, Blas de Atenza, about the Trujillo Aqueduct, about her mother, the Koya, who had died when she was still a child. Later I promised him that I would talk to Ursua, taking advantage of the fact that we were in the last days of the year and that we planned to delay for a few days in that region. I know that others had tried to warn Ursua of the danger that was growing in the camp, and I sought him out again to discuss those rumors. The last afternoon we met, I told him how little I knew, since I wasn't very aware of the conspiracies that moved in the shadows. I only noticed the dissatisfaction of the troops everywhere, I heard conversations that were suddenly interrupted when they saw me appear, small groups that whispered in the light of the fires in which so many things with wings that wake up at night are going to die. I was surprised to find him more willing than other times to talk, and I even think he was relieved to see me, to have someone to talk to for a while alone, while in the distance he heard the noise of the crews preparing to leave at dawn. The Incas who were on the expedition celebrated that night the Capac Remi, the festival of the rebirth of the sun, so there were songs in the camp, and since it was Christmas night for us, I wanted to remind Ursua of my friendship, despite of his estrangement, to make him feel that there were faithful men who did not follow him for the gold or for the hope of a glory that is difficult to imagine, but out of loyalty or gratitude, as in my case, because in definitive moments he had exposed his life for saving me, and had assisted me when there was no one else who could care for me in danger or lend me a hand. He told me that others had come to bring him reports of alleged rebellions and conspiracies, to warn him of rare threats, and that Ines herself had recently been agitated and nervous, she slept badly, mistrusted almost all the soldiers, horrible nightmares woke her up. But he attributed that restlessness to the jungle itself. Ines was too used to the luxuries of her stately home, the security of its stone walls and the protection of her servants, to be now sleeping on the banks of some immense rivers, in the night of whistles and crickets and cries of beasts, or thunder in the clouds in the distance, filled her with visions. Fortunately he knew how to reassure her. When she insisted on her anguish, it was enough to tell her that he had warned her that the life of conquest expeditions is not for weak and frightened women, then she was filled with courage and promised to show him that she would be worthy of the difficulties, that she was not going to let herself be overcome by fear or by the voices of the jungle and the river. But his security did not last, the next night he would dream again of blood and betrayal. That's how I remember the last words that Ursua said to me, I'm not afraid of men. I have arms like them and I can wield their daggers and swords with equal skill, I have legs to chase and escape, I have eyes to spy on their movements and to notice their advances, I have a mouth that prays and insults, and my insults can be better modulated than his and have more effect, because of the command that the will of the Viceroy gives me and because of the majesty that the words represent in these jungles to represent the great powers of the world. I have a mind that encompasses kingdoms and seas, lineages and legends, I know the tales of the jungle but also the true story of the god who was suspended from a tree to purify the blood of its curses, and I have a heart in which neither iron nor frowning brows, nor evil thoughts nor threatening words, exert their influence. I remember sometimes being afraid. 
but it was not about arrows and daggers but about inexplicable things. In the country of the stone beasts, because I felt the presence of beings that do not look like us, in Catatumbo, before the lightning that does not go out, because the sky seemed governed by other forces and there was a light that instead of clarity seemed to bring confusion and omens, later, before the Sierra Nevada, because I heard that stones feel and listen, that paths have a will, that stairs surround visitors, and that level after level there are things that think, trees that watch, eagles that carry messages about the forests. And finally when I am attacked by uncontrollable rage, the desire to abandon everything, because I know that there are pleasures that soften the will, delights that intoxicate and end up making one hate what one has accepted all of life. Those things that cannot be bent or submit, that cannot be destroyed because they are not made of flesh or blood, that do not listen to orders and do not heed pleas, nor obey the authority of kings, the order of armies or the reasons of teachers, are the the only ones that puzzle me. In this world, even iron obeys, even stone allows itself to be molded, the violent can be subdued and poison itself is docile to intentions, but everything that escapes command, authority and torment belongs to a dark kingdom. Of diabolical things and monstrous powers. You will never see me falter before armies of Indians, magnificent with spears and arrows, before the challenge of the mountains or the risk of navigation, neither before the claw nor before the fang, and not even before the back of the beast with a thousand heads, which are these armies to thee I know how to command and protect. But I can dig my nails into my palms when fangs emerge from the stones, when the sky punishes me with lightning without thunder, when even the horses feel that the path is haunted, when the body is free and seems tied, it is alone and seems surrounded by thousands of shadows. When one wants to advance in one direction and the feet go in another direction, and the one who is the master of visible things becomes the slave of a thousand things that cannot be seen. As long as the dangers are visible and the enemies be human I swear I'll know how. Face them and beat them, and I can't fear. Who are under my command, forced to obey me and paid for my money. I know. Prevent rebellions and punish disorders and subdue crimes with the same power with which light illuminates the world. And everything else is in the hands of God, who knows who he protects and who he abandons. I left the Bohio that he occupied and went to the place where my store was. I told myself that if Ursua had uttered those words, pretending to have everything under control, it was to give himself strength, because the truth is that we were entering the realm of everything he admitted to fear, stones that sprout fangs, the haunted paths, the invisible bonds and the throngs of shadows. Why did he insist on advancing towards the country of the Amazons, if in his imagination it was full of enchantments and monstrous powers? What unsettling joy did he derive from defying what disturbed him, from moving toward what made a cold sweat break out under his armor? It was almost midnight and there were some men still by the fires. Later I learned that it was at that time when the old commander Juan Núñez de Guevara, a great friend of Ursua, saw a dark figure pass behind the place where the governor was, and that I had left a while before, and he heard him exclaim to that shade. Pedro de Ursua, governor of El Dorado and Omegua, God forgive you. In the camp it was later learned that the commander followed the shadow trying to find out who it was, but an instant later, before his eyes, the shape vanished as if it were a form of smoke or mist. I didn't know about it that night, but something noteworthy did happen to me. Returning to my place, I remembered at last why the region of Maki Pharaoh made sense to me, it was the place where twenty years ago I had seen a canoe of Indian children sailing after our brig, children carrying monkeys and macaws, and a snake meek that played to release in the water. While you browse, you will draw the song of the birds. You will decipher the rain. Father of the water, grandson of the squirrel. You come from chewing sacred fruits. You drink the juice, you hear the flute in the background. Of the pond. Red claw of the living boats. For you the moon moves its plumage. Wings move the air. And there is a long hour without colors. And there is a sad stone. 
flexible bear of the jungle. When the trees jump. When the rainbow burns. When you hear the thunder. Dear. You are the gold dust that covers them. Living skin of the jaguar covering the world. 29. At one time, the only one. Went into the store. Ursua unannounced. At one time, the only one who entered Ursua's store unannounced was his cousin Francisco Diaz de Alls. The governor was able to believe, in the confusion of waking up, that his cousin had come to see him, but that, alas, was not possible. Now no one was authorized to enter the room. Pulling back the mosquito netting with the intention of getting a good look at the visitor, he noticed that others were coming after him. Perhaps they had come to say goodbye, that early morning of January 1st, the parties had planned to march in different directions. Ursua was neither in a presentable mood to attend visitors nor in the mood to attend parliaments, but in the dim light of dawn he attempted a strange greeting. Gentlemen, he said, to what do I owe this early visit? No one answered him, in the tense silence, Ursua saw the faces of Serrano and Salduendo, Fernando de Guzman and de la Bandera, Torres, Vargas, Lamoso, and Aguirre appear one after another, and he had the shock of something more serious. He went back to look for Ines to ask her to fetch his clothes, but it was precisely the time that Ines was going down to the river with her maids. When he realized that it was not the clothes. What he had to look for, but the sword, already between him and his weapons were the others, armed. The impossible was happening. The impossible, the inconceivable, the abominable, the brimstone of the devil, already permeated all things. He jumped out of bed with the agility of a cat, he did not find a speech or someone to captivate with him, nor a cry of majesty that could stop them, he reacted like a cornered boy, and his lips only found in the void the creed in Latin as they recited it in Ariscan when the arrows wounded the walls. Then his friend the flag gave him the first thrust in the center of the chest. Ursua tried to defend himself, to reach, naked, for his weapons. When Ines entered almost immediately, Salduendo and Guzman, Aguirre and Lamoso, Serrano and Vargas had already pierced the governor with their irons, three more men were about to do so, and Ursua was struggling, bleeding, held up less by his strength than by the opposing swords that riddled him. The conspirators were more than ten, but the ten who decided to go in to kill him had sworn the night before that they would all stick their swords into him, so that none could later repent and blame the others. There were short swords, long ones, sharp as foils, sharp as cutlasses. All of them had already been tried on Indian bellies, on backs, on arms, and on necks, all of them had been made to kill. The room was full of screams, and due to the number of bodies and weapons, one would say that there was a combat, but all that ferocity rained down on a single body, which, in addition to wounding, the assassins cursed. They called him tyrant, ruthless and traitor. Ines, with terrified eyes, looked at the scene and was unable to take a step towards the wounded man, from whom the swords were already withdrawing, dripping blood. None of the assassins sheathed theirs, but instead came out flaunting their bloody blades, as if exhibiting them would absolve them of their guilt and give meaning to the crime. When Ines pounced on the body, Ursua was already dying. Pale and terrified, she kissed him on the mouth, hugged him trying to scream but barely a thread of voice came out of her lips, a rattle. The steels had passed through the body in all directions. With hatred, with envy, with resentment, with desperation, with jealousy, with greed, with indignation, with wounded pride, with ambition, with malice. For a moment, Pedrarias de Almesto, who came right away or was already present, told me, the body looked like a sacrificial bull, pierced with iron. The blood was a puddle under the embrace, and all around the screams of the murderers grew. They shouted, swords raised as if they were performing in a public square and calling for mutiny. Then Aguirre's croak was heard. Saying that Ines had to be killed as well. That which, he said, has been the cause of many evils. They pulled her from her bloody embrace, and just as someone was about to cut her throat, 
a tough, determined man stepped in, a bleeding sword still in one hand and a dagger in the other. It was Lorenzo de Salduendo, who had not killed Ursu out of ambition or resentment but for her, because always imagining Ines in Ursua's arms had robbed him of sleep and peace of mind, and now he was willing to get himself killed by his partners just for saving her. At that moment the voices shouted that Don Joan de Vargas, the governor's lieutenant general, was coming down the road, and the murderous fury changed course. Ines's situation was desperate, besides. From the horror of Ursua's death, he had to feel gratitude for the man who saved his life, even if that savior was one of the murderers. Salduendo sheltered her by opposing her chest to the irons, then put it in the hands of his maidens, he swore to her that he would not touch her, he promised to take care of her, he wept with red hands for the death of the governor, he placed a party of faithful servants at the doors of her shop. It all happened at dawn, but for me it would be always the memory of a knight of swords. Already the other conspirators were waking up the camp. They cried out for freedom, they shouted long live the king. To attract the bewildered and the undecided, they congratulated them on the grace obtained, they called them free men and lucky soldiers. They had been avenged, they were freed from the cruel tyrant, from the traitor, from the source of all their misfortunes. Of course they weren't going to mistreat those who mourned Ursua, they were going to show everyone that this death was the end of all evil. I had foreseen this, but it cost me. Believe it was happening. I ran to the store when the news spread through the camp, and I found Ursua's corpse still on the ground, naked, covered in purple wounds, and more helpless than a bird. In that mace-rated body that tears erased I could see my own failure, the night that fell on my thoughts, the madness of my destiny always lost in someone else's war, and I also knew that Ursua had sharpened the swords of that dawn night and day. Where were the beauty and the eloquence, the energy and the courage, the laughter and the audacity, the language enchanting the souls, the history in gushes, the ambition that was turning into stories, the smoke of dreams that sprouted from that bonfire. As it happens with every death that hurts us. Soul. I felt that the world had ended. All the things I knew about Ursua went through my mind, everything I've told in this long story, and his profaned and destroyed relic taught me more about his destiny than all his words. He knew well that each sword tells a story. He had loved swords since he was a child, ever since he saw an ancient saber erected as a cult object in his old house in Ariskin, the instrument with which Hugo de Auxiliary, his great-grandfather, had lopped off many Moorish heads, which the child imagined to be dark-skinned and red lips and large dark circles and beards closed as shadows. It is true that the murderers had a pact. But I believe that if they all plunged their swords into Ursua's body, it is because each one of the executioners had a particular reason for killing him. In the heart of the jungle, and believing himself to be at the gates of his dream kingdom, that lord of five wars had been assassinated ten times. One wanted his position, another his wife, another the benefits of the expedition, another his titles, another revenge, another justice, and from that moment they began to divide everything that seemed to be theirs. They not only declared themselves the saviors of the expedition, liberators, redeemers, and vigilantes, they assumed command, the administration of resources, the decision of the course. But from the beginning Agir was the secret impetus of that rebellion, and with greater cunning he pretended not to be. The first thing he did was to persuade everyone that Fernando de Guzman be appointed, not governor or leader of the expedition as might be expected, but prince, and Guzman meekly accepted this farce. Aguirre had told him endlessly of his ancestry and his merits, and he soon made him king, but in this world no king has ruled a kingdom more uncertain and more evanescent. The misshapen Aguirre pretended to obey him, bent the knee before him, accepted to be contradicted when Guzman rejected some execution, some evil deed, but it was all a masquerade. Then we learned how the shadows around the camp the night before. One of Alonso de la Bandera's servants, a black man named Juan, had heard the conspiracy in the shadows, and as he felt gratitude for Ursua, for some gesture that the governor had shown him, 
he went to the store where he was locked up with Ines. And waited a long time to notice it. I went back and forth, nervous and desperate. But seeing that Ursua never went out, and fearful that his master would realize what he was doing, he made the decision, which almost cost him his life, to leave Ursua the warning with his servant Hernando, who guarded the store. Due to a mysterious fate he forgot to tell him, or he already knew that Ursua paid no attention to rumors and didn't tell him anything. The truth is that that afternoon, in order to ingratiate himself with the new masters, Hernando told them that Black Juan had come to give them away, and the loyal servant was only saved from death because he was one of the indispensable carpenters for the construction of new brigantines. Before the silent jungle and before the complicit troops they gave loyalty 500 lashes. The next day Ursua's burial in the jungle, on the riverbank, in the haunted region of Maki Faro, with Ines sobbing in the embrace of the women, orphaned and widowed again but now stripped of wealth and haciendas, an eclipse of moon by pools of fever, it was the saddest parade. There was no coffin or honor or ceremony. Under whispered prayers her body entered the jungle to become moss and water, and the soul did not find angels among the giant trees but the wings of macaws, the whistles of birds. And not many days had passed when Ines began to live with Salduendo. Was known in. He was in danger and understood that only he had sufficient influence over the conspirators to prevent his death, but in the midst of the battles of love he angrily plunged his nails into his chest and back. They say you can love and hate at the same time, but it couldn't be easy for her to separate gratitude for her savior from hatred for her executioner. And fortunately Ursua never knew that one of those swords had physically taken away his love. We did not stay much longer in that. Oppressive region. As we resumed our march, although many pretended to believe that we were still going to conquer a fabulous kingdom, the faces revealed that we were rather heading towards the most horrible part of the journey. I had lost something irreparable. I preferred not to look at Ines's face at the time of departure, already deprived of the luxurious boat in which she had traveled until then, suddenly converted into one more woman on a campaign aimlessly, as she had been so often warned, lost in the tumult of a raft on a violent river. And what could I blame that woman for? For love she had lost everything, perhaps even more beautiful in her misfortune, already totally helpless and alien. Nobody could demand that he die for his friend, that he go down with him to an unmarked grave. But echoes of an old song heard somewhere in the mountains came to mind. The echo. Look at me now locked in darkness. Although there seems to be light in the stuff. Look at me already lost because I don't have your hands on my shoulders. Look at me already lovingly kissing one of your executioners. 30. What happened next? I also wanted erased from me. Memory. What happened next I also wanted erased from my memory. Prince Fernando de Guzman did not keep his ghost kingdom for many days. When he got fed up with him, Aguirre had him executed without pretext. With each dawn, the suspicion of a new betrayal became his habit and we got used to waiting when the sentence fell on whom. How much time passed before Salduendo? Get your share? I couldn't tell. But. When Lorenzo de Salduendo lost favor with Aguirre, the despot full of swords and knives, who controlled the camps through terror, always surrounded by his sinister guard and with Anton Lamoso turned into his shadow, the fate of the beautiful Ines was decided. Someone must have brought him the news that Salduendo had been executed, and the only thing she managed to do was crazier than sticking a dagger in her chest, fleeing with her maidens through the dense jungles. The tyrant could let her abandon her at the mercy of the Knight of the Ant, but he preferred to satiate his evil and collect the last piece of Ursua's treasure. She ordered the horrendous Lamoso to persecute her and that useless flight through the jungle, which the other members of the expedition, who were outside the circle of the conspirators and their henchmen, found out about later, was the most evil and useless crime in history. Already too useless and evil. Like a hunting dog, the executioner let the hares run for a long time before taking up the chase. He knew that fatigue would come to them soon, 
he knew that they would most likely turn around thinking they were fleeing, because escaping in a straight line was impossible. He wanted to give himself the luxury of looking for them, of creating in them the terror of being lost, of being cornered, and of getting closer. In the end, her blood dyed the mosses and fed the trees, and that was how neither Ursua nor Ines were able to reach the kingdom of the Amazons, nor did they step on the gates of the city of gold they had dreamed of, and left waiting in the heart of the jungle the stone knives of the warrior women and the altars of the city of the serpent. But what the city had foreseen was fulfilled, each one of them was left alone in the Maki Pharaoh region, and on their great love great trees grew and birds flew. We found her later on the ground of decomposed leaves and between the fence of silent trees, we saw his paleness and his resignation to death. I saw in his face that he would not know how to meet Ursua in the night of the moss, after having clung to his murderer, but I know that love solves things differently, and that in the loneliness of death the lovers who were together even for a moment they will know how to accompany each other forever. The news of Ursua's death took a long time. Time to reach the house in Ariskin, where Tristan his father had already anticipated him, where in vain the lot of the elders had become his inheritance, and where Leonor Diaz de Armendariz, who kept small relics of childhood as talismans of his son, some cloth sheep and a tiny wooden car, he had become accustomed to the absence as a way of preparing himself for the news that his heart foresaw. Uncle Armendariz, who was his protector and his boss in the wars of the new kingdom of Granada, was also unaware that he had already seen Ursua for the last time, and after taking the robes he alternated memories and prayers with the also retired Bishop Lagasca in a Palencia monastery. I don't know if anyone told the relatives in Navarra that the worst result of that trip had been the death of one of the boys at the hands of the other. No one came to be moved in their land with the titles that Ursua obtained in these overseas provinces. Fame was still for the greats. Winners and for those who returned. Loaded with gold to the peninsula. The oldest of them was Hernando Pizarro, who, upon leaving La Mote Castle, where he spent twenty years in prison while his brothers killed and died in Peru, married his own niece, Francisca, cousin of Ines de Atenza and daughter of Francisco Pizarro, and enjoyed with her his copious inheritance for eighteen years. The Marquis of Caint was not able to deplore the fate of an expedition in which he had placed so many hopes and so many resources. Ursua took longer to leave Santa Cruz than the Viceroy to die of bad winds in front of the mountain range with foundations of silver, and what he received, without a doubt, Ursua would not envy, a magnificent funeral with seven bishops dressed in purple, a luxurious dream on the soft velvet bed of a gold-plated sarcophagus. We still continue for many months under the gloomy madness of a gear, each day more infamous and crueler, but when we finally went out to sea and turned course again towards the island of pearls, we verified that his crimes had just begun, things that filled the coast and the kingdoms of terror, and the court of indignation and alarm. Not because Aguirre was more evil than others, but because his victims were not, as always, thousands of Indians but dozens of Spaniards, because knowing he was condemned and lost, he had nothing to lose by rebelling, and he dared to send a sacrilegious letter to Felipe II, calling himself a traitor. With pride, to himself, pretending to be king of the Indies, announcing his intention to return to Peru to seize the viceroyalty, and claiming to have become the wrath of God. Years have passed and now I can talk about these things with a serene voice and almost with my spirit. After the tyrant was shot down at the last moment, more because of the fear of his own men than because of the royal parties that tried to stop him, his cruel henchman Anton Lamoso, murderer of Ursu like the others and executioner only of the beautiful Ines, fled of Barcasamato where the tyrant, as a last feat, stabbed his own daughter before being killed by two shots from an arquebus. Lamoso passed through El Tokio, where he would be. Dismembered his chief and where they were going to exhibit his head, he crossed the mountain range, entered the territory of the new kingdom of Granada, fled through Merida, in the province of Tunja, trying to be more and more secure, he passed through the forests of Bacalema and Chinacota, and entered Pamplona one night, where without identifying himself, he asked the town's rulers for asylum. He did not know where he was getting to, 
but without a doubt it was Ursua and Ines who guided his steps. The mayor of the city had received news of the rebellion, with the alarmed proclamation of the names and history of the rebels, and since everything is known in these lands, they understood that the newcomer was Lope de Aguirre's bloodiest dagger. Lamoso arrived precisely at the city that it had been founded by Ursua, still governed by the most faithful friend that the governor had in the new kingdom, the serene old Orton Velasco. Like Ines through the jungle running towards him. Knife, Lamoso unknowingly ran through the jungles of Catatumbo, and through the solar forests, to arrive punctually at the scaffold. As I have never believed that blood erases. Blood, freedom was my only revenge, and life was my reward. I also came to Pamplona and heard from Orton Velasco's lips an old part of this story, Ursua's progress through the country of the Chitareros and the year he was hidden in the town. Later I spoke with the beneficiary Juan de Castellanos in Tunja, and I fed his verses telling him in detail the adventures of his friend, from when the two of them separated in Santa Marta, and he and I met in Panama, until when the snake closed its rings about our destiny. He was already starting to write his verses, and Ursua's memory was already in them, but I also told him what he didn't know about the trip we went in search of cinnamon. So I came to this region of Santa Agueda. Del Guali, from where you can see dry mountains that seem to hide Indian temples, and I finally met Mr. Jimenez de Quesada, who told me from late to late about his trip down the Magdalena and the discovery of the kingdom of the Muiscas in the savanna. Now he is writing a book about the wars in Italy, so as not to think so much about the spotted leprosy that is taking over his body. But one must not believe that with Ursua and Agir the follies of this outrageous conquest came to an end. Jimenez de Quesada has just returned from a defeat almost more appalling than ours. And here I could begin to tell the story of a man who led the third most successful expedition on the continent thirty years ago, the man who with his troops discovered the real El Dorado, there, in the endless savanna, at 2,600 meters above sea level, a kingdom that gave them in a few days 200,000 pesos of pure gold and a pitcher full of emeralds, the story of that man who, after becoming rich, returned to Spain and was the first advance of conquest who could really spend an immense fortune on the peninsula, in boastful suits and Vitellian banquets, at gaming tables and scandalous tips, of that man who, once again impoverished by the crapulous life of the sentry boxes, by the deck and the dice, the mount, the bank, the bispus, the royal tables, the cacho, the chowica, the tuba, and the flower, already spent gold, legend, and glory, he returned to the Indies when he was older to begin again, and in full old age he was once again blinded by the legends. I learned from his own lips that, aware of the story of Ursua, who was said to have lost everything at the very gates of paradise, put together another delirious expedition to reach what Ursua had not found, and left Santaf in the Bogota savanna in April 1569 with 400 Spaniards, 1500 natives, 1100 horses, with dogs, pigs, chickens, slaves, servant women, cooks and eight chaplains to conquer the infinite plains, to fall to the north on the jungle city of Manoa, and was detained for many months then due to the unexpected winter and the water wall of the jungle rivers, and he lost 333 Spaniards, 1,496 Indians, 1,082 horses, and six priests. But it is not with the chronicle of these times. Last with which I will end my long account of the two trips to the river that my strange destiny imposed on me. But with these pages that I have rescued from the end of my adventure, when in Barcasamato his soldiers suddenly killed Lope de Aguirre, and his head was exhibited in a cage to the consternation of the kingdoms. Because it was there that I finally discovered the reason for my trip, the teaching that the Isla Serpent had stored in its scales, as the people of the jungle call the river. The dream. We had set sail from a shore behind which the boats piled up, and we saw a flock of white herons pass through the sky, followed by a single black cormorant, which was cawing. I remember that, that the herons were silent but the cormorant caught in a sad way. We advance along the river and suddenly, without having disembarked, 
we were already at the gates of a city. But although in the dream it was said that they were the doors, what we saw were great rocks and in the middle of them a torrent that descended and that had carved caverns in the stone. We rode through the jungle, first over leaf litter, then over mossy soils, and finally over muddy paths where the horses' feet sank deep. Then the city appeared, but its walls were completely covered with green slime, and they shone in the sun, but behind it the city was dark, and the temples were barely hinted at. I was certain, without having seen them, that in those temples the skulls of dead men abounded, and that there were altars for sacrifice, and then I saw Ursua enter the city, followed by his officers, and I was with Zibali, with Araman, and Anuma, and behind was the legion of Indians from the mountains, who did not mix with the Indians from the jungle, although they understood their words. When I finally got in I heard the drums, and I saw the waterfalls falling from the rocks, the huge canyon next to the city where a river meandered, and I saw Ursua and Ines sitting at the banquet with the Amazons. A stone man was cowering in the center of a room, in the moonlight, watching two snakes advance across the floor. Suddenly a woman crossed him like a fish crosses a reflection in the water, the woman had a beastly face. Ursua pointed in the distance, at the bottom of the mirror, to the king's ships, and there were many of them, and they filled the horizon, but they did not float on the water but on the grass, and Dona Ines shouts could be heard calling Ursua to the fence. I saw the statue now dead and broken, still glaring from the flint, and his beard was not stone, it was a real beard, so long that it went overboard and entangled the course of the ship. There the dream became more confused. There were huts on fire, there were wheels of fire like chopped pineapples that rolled towards the bottom of a cavern. 31. They inform me that tomorrow. They will take ten directions. Different. They inform me that tomorrow they will take the body of the tyrant to ten different directions, whose head is still fierce in the cage where they keep it locked up. I must now continue with this story, to which I dedicated so many days of fever from the moment in which the tyrant Aguirre was shot down with arquebus shots for the peace of the kingdoms. I filled out many pages without crossing anything out, so as not to give time to oblivion to erase the stories that Ursua told me on the eve of our adventure. It is hard to believe that in such a short time we have fed and lost so many dreams, that so many nights of sleeplessness and fear have surrounded us. And it is especially hard for me to believe that from Ursua, who seemed more alive than anyone else, we are left with nothing but words, elusive phrases as if he wanted to hold them in the wind, words that may be able to explain the past but cannot tell me my luck, what a man who twice descended the river must do with his life, first by chance, abandoned to the will of the waters, and then out of loyalty, following someone who very soon shed all loyalties. Now my fatigue and my astonishment are great. But in these hours of emptiness, while the terrible head blackens in the cage, more worthy now of pity than hate, only this devoted river of memories manages to be my consolation and my star. After a week in its cage, the head looks dry and dark, a bird of rage that people come to see from far away, still not believing that the danger is past. The man divided into ten parts recomposes himself in dreams, tyrannizes people again under the merciless moon. Only three months ago, the rumor that the tyrant was advancing with his troops towards Santaf moved people from all over to mount expeditions against him. In Tunja, the poet Juan de Castellanos himself left his desk and his letters to go and punish the murderer of his best friend. Men from Panama have said that another punitive expedition was organized on the Isthmus and that Alonso de Ursula, who was already beginning to write his poem on the Iraqo Wars, recovered from the fevers that held him back and ready to travel to Spain, postponed his journey to participate in the advance against the tyrant. A third campaign was being prepared from Santo Domingo, called by the friends of my master Oviedo. Incredibly, the false news that Lope de Aguirre had died demobilized all three expeditions at the same time, just when the tyrant was more alive and more unrestrained than ever. What hope could there be, if the opportune armies capable of stopping him dissolved like a dream due to that baseless news that the devil undoubtedly took to flight, no one knows where, and that ran through lands and seas faster than the winds? What do they roar? 
the threatened kingdoms lowered their guard, and everything seemed to remain at the mercy of the tyrant, crazier every day, with his insomniac eyes more exorbitant and his blasphemous tongue more cursed every day. And, as a result of infinite fear, it was his own men who stopped him at the last moment. The fact that his head is displayed in a cage shows that, dead, he still strikes fear, but few will know what it was like to see him alive. Those eyes that watched over everything and never went out, the wry, thoughtful, offensive face that seemed to always be in front of us even though the man had his back turned. And the long road of cruelties that he filled with his name, people now speak of the tyrant's cove, the dead man's bend, the devil's islands, the camp of the ten swords, the rebel's river and the beach of the traitor, but those traces bear as little resemblance to man as to the tiger the furry tracks of the tiger. Even a blue flower dotted with red was called the Guire's eye by one of the crews. No one will know how to name this other flower, this fragment of rubble, the severed head, which can no longer govern or monitor the destiny of its own arms that have left for Barcasamado, nor of the legs that walk through Valencia, nor of the quartered trunk that is traveling towards Merida, nor of the heart that will be thrown to the beasts. He who thus tore up the territories cannot now feel his body and his shadow disintegrated by defeat. I would have preferred that they buried him whole, upside down, in a lead box, I fear that this body and this blood that return to the earth dismembered will infect things with their horrible disintegration and make the jungle hate the plain, that the rivers hate the sea they seek. Someone who knew how to be a curse in life can also be a curse in death. Now, we need to unload the terror of the days, disperse the evil shadows and triumph over their specter, we cannot give him as a final alms the opportunity for something of his to continue sowing evil on earth. The memory of Ursua comes back to me. I return to his lips the story he told me one night while we were traveling on the river. Through the plains of Venezuela, more than twenty years ago. Years ago, when the Germans were here, a young man named Pedro de Aranda leaned on a trunk one day while descending the ravine looking for water from a pond. The trunk moved under his hand. Aranda jumped and understood that it was not a trunk but the body of a huge snake. The head was the size of a bull's head, and a black, forked tongue protruded from it. Aranda felt a shock that made him lose control, and it seemed that it was not he but his fear that fired the crossbow at the snake's head, and the first arrow hit its eye. This unleashed in the animal such brutal contortions of pain and fury that, lashing the trees with its tail, it snapped branches and tossed foliage. Those who watched from afar saw that as the huge jaws opened and closed, they split logs and stones with them. Everyone was fleeing and only Aranda, more out of terror than courage, continued shooting arrows at the head of the snake, which after a while lost strength and began to die. When they saw her weak and dying, the soldiers, who had hidden in the woods, finally dared to approach. And a despicable thing happened, because then, yes, when they saw her immobile and defeated, they all began to hit her with branches and stick their swords into her limp body, the same ones who fled when she was alive, seeing her dead, became fierce with her and destroyed her. Cowards rage at weakness. I still seem to see him, speaking of the value and the honor, of arrogance in the face of enemies, and I turn to look at the black head of the tyrant delacerated by those who feared him, I contemplate thoughtfully the derisory head of the madman, an object among the others, but charged with passions and stories, and condensing the fears of a world. If I had made that trip many times, the images would end up replacing each other and I would no longer know when the arrow flew into the eye or where we saw the smoke, but two intense occasions, so far apart in time, can preserve their integrity, and even more so if different faces and voices give meaning to the facts. Now I know that the first time I was terrified and dazzled by the outside world, every moment was the beginning of a story, we were going towards the night of the trees, towards a land that no one had seen, perhaps towards the precipice of the worlds, and the trip was full of supernatural voices, of fantastic creatures, of hidden crowds that watched us, the second time we suffered the world almost without looking at it, the fear of the jungles had given way to the fear of men, the night was in. The soul, the unknown was the hearts, 
and the awareness of being watched night and day was not born of the looks of the monkeys and the birds but of the mobile eyes of Lope de Aguirre, who noticed everything. The nightmare that we were for the Indians is the same nightmare that Aguirre became for the members of the expedition. As I have already said, he was not called a tyrant because he was so bloodthirsty, since spilling blood was the job of those expeditions, what has given him his legend and his shadow is having been the murderer of 72 Spaniards and having dared to raise his voice against the crown. Because in the world it takes courage and madness to deny the king and defy his armies. And for this reason it is also a source of astonishment for me that fate has allowed me to meet, day after day, two men as similar and as different as Gonzalo Pizarro and Lope de Aguirre, who in a span of twenty years dared to raise the same cry of rebellion, who advanced without king and without God through these vertiginous lands, and in whose fevered temples madness was slowly taking the form of a golden crown. I say courage and madness, and those words describe both well, although in Pizarro courage prevailed, insanity in a gear. And perhaps my memories of the river are hopelessly altered, distorted by those two wild captains. In any case, Pizarro's was a dwindling memory, each day there was a little less and therefore the jungle and the river existed a little more each day, on the second trip Lope's presence worsened day after day, the river and the jungle seemed to dim or fade before the intensity of his gaze. And a cave was opened in the afternoon. And a cavern opened in the afternoon. Each creature spoke in its language. There were tales of feathers and tales of scales. And the children who shiver in the torrent. Learning to guard it? Memory. They were already the keepers of the secrets. Of language. Because the jungle is not silence, it is. Most abundant language. That's where all the words are and. Where they are more alive. Our roads and bridges, medicine and. Incantation. Networks that do not allow to penetrate. Enemies. And doors that open in the rocks. It's the countless ways. And the poison and the remedy that are in the shapes. 32. It all just happened but. I sit talking about days. Old. It all just happened, but I feel like talking about old days, times that seem to be lost in legend. And among those mists I still hear the tireless murmur of water. It is amazing to see that we saw more of the jungle when we were fleeing from it than when we wanted to go to meet it. Under the Orellana expedition the jungle existed, the beings of the river showed themselves, the populations of the shore made us feel their drums, their prayers, their smoke, and their songs. Also his arrows, his spells, his gifts. In Aguirre's desperate campaign, the travelers saw only one another, watched each other with anguish, full of suspicion and hate. Each one felt that the greatest danger was the others, and Aguirre woke up every day with the need to get rid of someone else. As his madness grew, his power. It grew larger and at the mere brightness of its eyes the men trembled. Suddenly the tyrant was on the deck of all the ships, as if multiplying himself, and he was also spying on us in our dreams. It was a strange way of not seeing the jungle, of not hearing its song, of not feeling the powerful voice of the river, which speaks of the mysteries of the earth, of the purpose that lives in the seeds, in the flowers that attract blowflies. In the darkness of the foliage where suddenly the sunset turns some unknown bird red. Now I know that it was the jungle that abruptly. He took possession of Lope de Aguirre's destiny, closed his eyes to the mystery of the world, and no longer allowed him to see more than what was in his soul. Perhaps the gods protect the world by driving men mad, ultimately turning their stingers against themselves, and there is no evil in that, because the jungle does not think or conspire, but the dark law of life protecting its secrets. That is why I am not interested in telling how the adventure of the trip was under Aguirre's wild eyes. Others will tell it and it will be known that it was nothing more than the small combustion of a troop devoured by its own fear, incapable of loving a world that it could not understand. As they peered into their hearts, into the eyes of others, and they conspired and destroyed each other, I tried to make myself invisible, I tried to see the jungle through Amini's eyes, I tried to feel her stories again. 
and the Brazilian Indians taught me to disappear from the eyes of the captains by means of the magical resource of not disputing their power, of not coveting their wealth. I sought solace in the trees, in the song of the birds, in the certainty of the parasites on the trunks, and the jungle seemed untouched by that brutal nightmare. They always said that the jungle was crueler than man, that it is a deadly hell, but the opposite truth is that in it everything is life, the jungle is rather life taken to its extreme, and what intimidates in it is not death but that overwhelming profusion of births, that humidity that opens in lichens, those pools that boil with creatures, those branches interwoven with colonies of cross worms, those sloths that are exasperated by the torment of their parasites. Life is overwhelming. And nowhere in the jungle can anyone claim to have seen the hate, because no creature feels hate but us. I felt that I had lived my life as in a dream, locked in the memory of a world. Distant, and caught in a gaze that distorted things, the river was nothing more than a leak, the trees were beings on the prowl, the animals poisonous and irritating slime, stings and deadly pincers. I felt rather the loyalty of the trees, those creatures that ask for nothing and instead give everything, and the waters advancing to their dissolution, and the eyes that look from the foliage. There is no evil there, there is nothing diabolical, its swarm has no evil intentions, only need, elemental violence, insatiable and avid life. I only saw evil in that robbery that he bloodied the ships day by day, writhing in madness. But I told myself that this hell was not mine, if I had to continue with the expedition it would not be fighting for any power, but rather trying to learn, listening to the voice of that jungle to which I had inevitably returned. There must be a reason why I have repeated this trip, he thought, and that reason was not Ursua's eloquence. This jungle has something to tell me. I promised myself that I would survive, even if I had to suffer the meanness of others. It wasn't even worth rebelling, I had to save my freedom in the heart of a hell without light. And the sky was no longer an immensely distant thing but a foliage through which one could climb and learn. I applied myself to questioning the reason for that. Travel. While the tyrant was taking over the wills and sowing death, I learned to reject that impulse to dominate everything, to desecrate everything. And stripped of my hard conqueror's skin I was suddenly overwhelmed by the love of that Indian woman I left abandoned on the island, my dark-skinned mother, who undoubtedly died thinking of me, I recognized the lament of a postponed world, of a life that has not been said. That was the other half of the story, the source of sleep, the reason why living in the world requires loving it, protecting it, and curing it, preventing greed from profaning and destroying it, because the only thing that allows the jungle to understand is the language of respect and gratitude. So Amini, my lost Indian mother. He began to speak to me as he had never done before, and I felt that his lonely tomb, up there in the hills of Hispaniola, was also beginning to converse with the clouds and with the gannets. What the water said. That the dream is the sky inside, the door to the true world. That the trees are made of flesh and the rivers are of blood, that the birds are thoughts and the rains are memories and the sky is full of awakened ancestors. That the most powerful sounds are the ones that are stored, the quiet sound that protects you, like the flutes under the water, and that the body has to fight all night with the river. That there is a being of music made of thousands of wings, and there are stars that dig between the nests. That when the moon full of jungle spears passes, Everyone knows that the arrow is a deadly word, that sometimes comes painted with fever and sleep. That in reality no one dies, that no one knows. Away, that in the jungle there are all the voices, of the one who returns to being a fish and the one who returns to being a bird, and of the one who returns to being a jaguar, who has in his body the tree and the water, the wind, and the things of the darling. That the ants come out at sunset and they return at night. That all things are of the night, but that under the earth comes another sun feeding on the roots, and comes to fill the world with hunger and fatigue, and that we can only look at it when old and sick it leaves all its blood in the river. That nothing is as beautiful as the sunset. Because the tales of the night are already being prepared in the throat of the jungle. That while there are songs and stories the jungle does not move. 
that only with songs things are governed, that prayers make the jungle safe as a cave. That an order is never a shout, that every true order is silent. That the bird never breaks the silence, but always knows how to intermingle the song in the fabric of the jungle. That a bed is dead and a hammock is live. That the words have to weave the house of life every day, keep away the humidity, make the beams firm, maintain the fabric of the trees so that the sky does not fall. That the only thing that cannot be said is how words act, how they hold the sky in place, how they keep the fathers of long ago alive, and how they bring out the secrets of the tree, the salts of the earth, the evil hosts of the bodies, the poison of the blood. That one should not walk through fire at night, that one should let the light that is in things illuminate the path, that there is a clarity that comes from things, that the eyes drink darkness better than light. 33. Then the jungle told me. Otherwise the story. Then the jungle told me in another way the history of Ursua. A daring man with men but full of fear with the world, fragile like all those creatures that cannot walk on the ground without iron thorns, without armor and without tongues of fire. He was the truly dangerous thing, not the scorpion or the manta ray, not the sensitive worm or the innocent jaguar like an orchid. Who are we but those beings? Incapable of truly being in the world because we find danger in everything, because everything threatens, because in our suspicion rivers drown and snakes strangle, the wasp injects fire and the butterfly names death, the spider is its poison and the fish in the water a row of ravenous teeth. We go through the world desecrating everything hour after hour and always dreaming of a better world, more full of tributes and slaves. We do not understand the house they gave us, we believe that we came to rule, executors of a law as blind as ourselves. And what was Ursua then? Someone bent on. Feel more beautiful than the world, more valuable than the world, to whom the world should pay tribute night and day. The one who always ate wheat but never planted an ear, because the one who sows has to become a friend of the earth and an accomplice of the rain, make alliances with the fungi and with the ants. One to whom the rivers should give their fish without ever thanking them, to whom the tombs should deliver their treasures but throw the relics in the dump. And that sun began to experience its eclipse when the moon hung over it, because only with it did he know a bit of calm, the unexpected delight of living without anxiety, without suffering any other tyranny than naked flesh. Poor Ursua, how disconcerted he was when he learned in Trujillo to be the child he had never been, to suck milk from a loving breast, when he realized with horror that he did not want to talk about wars or expeditions because he had suddenly found his garden in the land. It would have stayed there forever. Sure of that river of legends, in the shadow of that bare land that scented like grass and tasted of cinnamon and fruit, that whispered secrets and laughed and gasped and moaned and laughed again, but forced by duty, he had to get up from the bed of love and take the war on his back again, carry an increasingly hateful army on his shoulders, drag through the jungles a heavy mantle of boats and navigations, mountains and slaves, of horses and betrayals. The only thing that had ever saved him was the surrounded by his grateful friends, those who were able to shed their blood for him and for whom he had shed his blood, and that friendly fence was disappearing as Ursua cloistered himself in his new madness, because he no longer wanted to save anyone but himself and his insatiable mestiza, he no longer wanted to die for anyone else, and that restless happiness was making him every time more and more fragile. This was what the others felt, that he had brought them to the frontier of the greatest risks and suddenly abandoned them aimlessly, the enthusiasm with which he dragged them into the adventure was no longer contagious, and he managed to promise them nothing, neither riches, nor exploits. Because he was becoming convinced that the country through which they entered would not give them one or the other, neither the laurel of fierce battles nor the gold of high empires, so that their deed and their prize were now only in the embrace of Enes, and that stormy love on the edge of an infinite question made the fence of hostile irons that would give them their only answer. If I get out of here, I said to myself, I'm going to tell the story of Ursua, how insistently I tried to dissuade him from the trip, how in the end I only traveled with him so as not to leave him alone with his destiny. I am going to recount the death of Ursua, 
assassinated ten times in the heart of the jungle, and the way in which something wilder than the jungle and the river was born in these confines. And I am going to talk about the secret treasure that is found at the bottom of the groves, in the studded skin of the river, in what the water endlessly tells the trees, that ancient mystery that the serpent whispers in the slime. And it is that as he traveled along the river he went. Talking to him in my mind, not measuring my force with its own as on the first trip, but by learning my strength and my measure, seeing in a ferocious mirror how the spider that intends to make itself more powerful than the world devours itself, and only what is saved is what accepts to pass as they pass the wind and the river. I know that if the blind river has saved me, it will only be for a few years. Ursua could not be saved, because the fate she invoked never took into account the will of the water, the beautiful Ines looked little at the world, she did not understand what the night and things teach us. And the deranged Aguirre, the cold tamer, believed that he could ride the water serpent, submit it to his command, as if the serpent did not know its way better than any man. When I finally got out of that vortex of cruelty and madness, I swear I did not recognize myself in the mirror, as if I were someone else, as if the features of someone very ancient had taken over my face. Now the river spoke in my memories, and with my voice weaved its own story. Because there is no great difference between a man and a river, both are born in the hidden and die in the immense, they follow a course hardly changed by accidents, each one is alone with their gods, and full of unknown beings. And it doesn't stop fleeing for an instant, and feeds on other people's lives, and barely stops being what flees to dissolve into what remains. The river will not feel on its back the weight of the tyrants, of the horsemen of war, it cannot wonder how long those who play at being masters of the world will navigate it. Because only they can believe that they own the world, the manatee yawns, the taper laughs, the boa contracts indifferently. The day the river understands that the matter has gone too far, it will stop showing its back of luminous scales, it will stop offering its whistle of water, it will stop attending to its palpitations and it will turn its angry jaws towards the world. It will not be like Pedro de Aranda snake, it will not die stung by arrows, nor slaughtered by the sword, nor mace raided by the sharp stone. Because this great serpent is the bed on which our lives depend, the life of warriors in their tents before the night fires, the life of cardinals in their solemn chambers, the poor life of kings on their thrones of blood, and even the life of the scrawny pope weighed down by his gold star-studded tiara. And when the day of the tearing arrives, we will all sink as the stain of ants picked up by the current sinks. It is the river that breathes in us, who. It throbs in the blood, which slips in time, which resonates in the storm, and is prior to the sap of the trunks and the blood of the veins, before men and gods, brother of the stone and the star. It is the music that declines endlessly towards its white death, the eyeless serpent, the fruit tree, the shape of destiny, the canoe that is sowing the shores with men, and on its slippery skin we will see again each night, until the end of life or the world, the unfolded map of the stars. Finish. The Snake Without Eyes. William Ospina